Here's your right. slides here. Oh, that's my slides. Okay. So I'm just going to, like, open up a new one that I just sent it to myself. I do not want it online. Oh, because people will see it? We, oh, it's not online. Doing... I see. What we're... I have to do is advance. I see. So we're going to have to come out and go back I see. I see. So you said you wanted to remove some slides? No, no. I just want to add some. Um, so can I just like go to internet? Like, is there internet connected? Yes. I'm just going to leave this here, is that okay? And then we'll use them to kind of wipe them down every once in a while. Is that okay? Very good. Thanks.
Okay, let, why don't we get started? Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research and to our Spring Policy Forum on Homelessness in California. I am Mark Duggan, the Trioni Director of CEPR, <clears throat> and the Wayne and Jody Cooperman Professor of Economics here at Stanford. Uh, this is our first very big event at CEPR since, you know, uh, you know <laughs> since March of 2020. Uh, so it's nice to be. <clears throat> so when the pandemic shut everything down, and I'm really thrilled that you're all joining us. And I know everyone in this room is super busy has a lot going on, so we sincerely appreciate your engagement with us today on obviously an important topic. One thing I just want to say at the outset is this issue about masks. So do whatever you feel you're comfortable with. You can do, you're not required to do anything, you, so it's up to you. <laughs> Make your own decisions. Um, I think someone said to me I should slightly encourage it. I'm probably not going to wear one, uh, so uh, anyway, just I, I let everyone, e each of you make your own call on that. For those of you who are new to our orbit, <clears throat> or maybe just uh, joining us for the first time, the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research is, I believe, the university's home for addressing the biggest economic policy challenges and opportunities of our time. We have more than 100 faculty affiliates including three Nobel laureates uh, who draw from each of Stanford's seven schools. And that means we have uh, scholars studying a broad set of issues, like healthcare, like energy and the environment, politics, education, taxes, and much, much more, all through, primarily through, the prism <clears throat> of economics. And today, we are turning our attention to the incredibly pressing issue of homelessness in California, which involves so many factors. And when I talked about sort of doing this event several months ago when, uh, with people here and others, a phrase that I would frequently hear is homelessness, that's really hard. Uh, and so why not, you know, I'm a glutton for punishment. So I think that uh, I, I just wanna uh, say that uh, we as a nonpartisan, academic research institution, I think we're well positioned to bring together a vast array of experts and ideas and hold everyone to the same sort of unbiased, rigorous level of examination to try to get to the heart of what might make for a sound and effective policy. Um, and we approach this with a lot of humility uh, and understand that no one is going to leave here with all the answers. No one here today has all the answers. Uh, but we would love it if uh, everyone from today gets new ideas, begins thinking about potential new approaches for policy or for the nonprofit or broader private sector, <clears throat> and understand how important it is to get our hands on data that can inform the path uh, forward. So <clears throat> CEPR has become increasingly involved in California-specific economic research. Uh, when I say economic, I take a broad perspective of what constitutes economic. Uh, and we've recently launched the California Policy Research Initiative, also known as CAPRI, to double down on issues that are specific to this state, <clears throat> which also happens to be, if it were a country, the world's fifth largest economy, measured in terms of GDP. So in addition to studying homelessness, we're taking on big issues like taxation and government spending, climate and energy, educational attainment, economic mobility, <clears throat> and much more. Uh, during the past year, we've had some really terrific speakers, all virtual. Uh, so, for example, last month, we had the chair of President Biden's Council of Economic Advisors, Cecilia Rouse. A month before that, we had the Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen. Uh, and we've had many other terrific people uh, in recent months, all virtual, though. <clears throat> so today, this is in person, and it's super exciting for us. We also, two, about two weeks from today, we're going to ho host another event that examines the future of governance in California. And all the research that we're uh, generating and the events that we're holding are meant to move the needle in Sacramento, 
the country's other 49 state capitals, and in Washington, D.C., hopefully in a better direction. Um, yeah, that would be good. We, we would like to do that. <laughs> I will say, I have had this phrase, for those of you who may remember that book, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. I feel a little bit like that with academia and policymakers. So if anyone has any great ideas of how to bridge that, I'd love to hear them. Um, but that's why many of you, we, we're reach, we reached out so much to many of you here today. We always welcome suggestions for how we can do better to get our research on the radar screen of people. But not like we have all the answers. We don't have a view like, oh, we're going to swoop in and tell you government how to do this. Someone's got a phone on, I think. I don't know. But anyway, uh, I, hear, I hear something. But it's fine. Uh, I'll work through it. Um, uh, <laughs> Just, you just never know what is going to come your way on any given day. Uh, <clears throat> we're not producing scholarship solely for the sake of creating knowledge. Creating knowledge is good, but our outreach and engagement efforts are meant to get this knowledge connected with policymakers, with journalists, with business leaders, and with others who can influence and create real change and improvements in the realm of economic policy. Um, I do believe that at Stanford University, I think we have a responsibility to sort of do our best to help on thorny issues like this one. Uh, and so it is uh, especially issues that differentially affect the most disadvantaged. Um, students also play a huge role here at CEPR. Uh, we support undergraduates, pre-docs, doctoral students who are interested in immersing themselves in economic policy research. We also host economists from other institutions who are early in their careers but are rising stars in the field. And a very, very important part of our mission is investing in the next generation of economic policymakers and scholars and making sure these up and comers are representing diverse perspectives, ideas, and experiences in order to shape policies that benefit everyone with an eye toward both equity and efficiency. <clears throat> and those are both a big part of the topic that we're delving into today. Homelessness is a nationwide problem, but one that I think is particularly severe here in California. On any given night, the best estimates suggest there are more than 160,000 people who are homeless in the state. And for a bit of context, that's about the size of nearby cities of Salinas or Hayward. Uh, the number homeless per capita in California is about three times the level in the rest of the US. Uh, during the last six years, it has increased. The data is not perfect. But the best available data suggests that during the past six years, it has increased by 42% in California, while it has fallen by 9% in the rest of the US. <clears throat> so we're going to be trying to look at the reasons for this and what can be done about it. Um, but again, today's discussion is definitely not meant to be an end-all, be-all <clears throat> examination of this issue. Uh, and one of the things that we, I believe, need to get our arms around here in order to really uh, study homelessness is the data problem. Uh, I, I do think that the private sector <clears throat> has in many realms mastered the use of data to greatly improve operations. Um, and I think we need to get better linkages between public agencies that touch homelessness so we can have more real-time, in-depth data about how various government services are assisting the homeless what effect they're having, and how we can tweak and improve and constantly try to get better. We've got city governments, county governments, state governments, the nonprofit sector, and many others. We've got different agencies within the same city or county or state government. And it's hard for anyone to have 20-20 vision on what's happening, how things are changing, and how we are doing with respect to our interventions. So anything that anyone can do to improve the data quality in this space, which I believe has been an impediment to my field of economics, working on this uh, topic, um, I would be very grateful. <clears throat> and when we have better insights, we can have a better understanding of which policy levers need to be pulled or pushed to make improvements and, and, uh, on this hard issue. And I think you know, one thing maybe we'll talk about today is what should be the objective of policy in the nonprofit sector here? Should it be to lower the number of homeless? Is that the one cause? Or are there other, what, what I think, Talking about those sorts of things, I, I think would be great today. <clears throat> with and I want to say with humility, I'm not I'm not an expert on homelessness by any means. So probably pretty much everyone in this room knows more about this issue than I did. So I'm looking forward to learning a lot in the next 10 hours and 45 minutes. Um, 
you uh, all received a survey that we sent a few days ago that was meant to gauge your thoughts on homelessness. 98% of respondents to that survey, and we had met quite a few respondents, say homelessness policies are on the wrong track in California. Two thirds say it is not a money issue, but that we need to examine better how money is spent. Now, surveys aren't necessarily correct, but that is, I think, we think pretty reflective, pretty informative. <clears throat> and when asked what you wanted to hear most about today, there was huge interest on basically all of the panels that we're going to hear about today. So I think it's gonna be a really terrific day. Um, one thing I wanna flag is if at some point you just get tired of being in this room, we have an overflow room next door where we are, what's it called, live streaming the event? Is that what it's called? Live, we're live streaming the event. So if you just need to get a little distance from everybody, your neighbor is kind of annoying you or what have you, <laughs> just go in there and all is good. We're not live streaming to the world, although we are recording things, and my understanding is our plan is to distribute this later. So to the extent that you think there are any sessions in here that are really good and you want to share with your friends or family or any colleagues or anyone else, feel free to do so. Um, and uh, before I turn things over to my colleague, Jalu Streeter, who has done an enormous amount of research on homelessness in California over the last few months, and a uh, even bigger amount of work organizing this policy forum. <clears throat> I also wanna thank every one of our speakers and panelists and moderators for taking time from their very busy schedules to be with us today. We have a wide range of experts, we have advocates, we have politicians, we have scholars, we have business people, nonprofit leaders and others to share their thoughts and perspectives and I'm very, very, very grateful. <clears throat> also a huge thanks to our supporters who are committed to CEPRA's work and our mission. What we wouldn't what we do would not be possible without their partnership and support. And as CEPRA's director, I'm very, very fortunate to work with such an amazingly dedicated and talented staff. They are the ones who are responsible <clears throat> for making this place run so beautifully, and I certainly couldn't do any of this. We, I, I couldn't be up here without, and without, without them, so I'm very grateful. Um, and now let me pass the baton to Jalu Streeter, our Director of Partnerships and a CEPR research scholar who is also the author of a just released policy brief. Has it been, is it out? It's out, okay, it's up. And it's, it's a, it is, would you call it a page turner, Jalu? <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think it is. Uh, and a CEPR research scholar, Jalu, thank you for all the hard work you've put into this issue and on today's event, and here we go. Thank you, Mark, so much for your leadership and support for this project. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. Great to see all of you. Um, and during the last several months when I was working on this project intensively, I was very, very fortunate to know many of you great folks who are working in this domain, um, pa compassionate people who are doing great work. And they're also very generous in sharing their time and expertise with me. So I'm just really grateful to all your support. Thank you. Um, and my job today here is to just give a status quo update. Um, okay, so can you see? Okay, go. All right, I'm too short. You can see how much shorter I am compared to Mark. All right, um, so Mark already mentioned the pre-conference survey, so I will just go, that, go through that really, very quickly. Uh, we know that majority of the people think uh, homelessness in California is not on the right track, for sure. Um, and this is up to yesterday's data, so we have 137 people who responded to the survey, and two-thirds of the respondents say uh, homelessness is not a money issue, and you all showed a wide range of support for an interest for all the topics, and then when I put answers to the open-ended question, the last question, when I ask you, what do you think are the top factors uh, to homelessness? So I put all of your answers in this word cloud, and not surprisingly, things like housing, mental health, drug addiction came up. Okay, so what are some of the top trends in homelessness in California? In my opinion, there are two things, magnitude and speed of growth. So we know that homelessness in California is not news, but in recent years, as it has severely worsened. Uh, in terms of the magnitude, the state has the largest homeless population in the U.S. California accounts for 12% of the U.S. population, but 28% of the U.S. homeless population. Speed of growth. So you can see from the top, this, this top graph, 
Uh, for many other states, homelessness is either declining or plateaued. But in California, it seems like it's rising faster and faster. And also, as Mark has already mentioned, California's homelessness rose by 42% between 2014 and 2020, while the rest of the country had a 9% decrease. Um, is homelessness an ever-rising issue? Maybe, because in LA County, every day, 227 became homeless. And every day, 207 people exit homeless. That means every day we have 20 more people become homeless in net. So that means we have an increase of 7,300 um, 7, people per year. So that seems like it's an ever rising issue. All right, so compared to other states, are there any specific features in California's homelessness? Um, I think number one is unsheltered homeless. So you can see compared with all other states, California has the highest percentage of unsheltered homeless. Uh, in comparison, New York also has a very large homelessness population, uh, but their unsheltered population is only 5%. And here, California is also very interesting in having a very high percent of single male homeless. Um, homeless population. So we compare to other states, we have 65% of our homeless are male and 84% of them are not with a family. So what are the key factors? So here I listed five key factors and obviously I'm missing some other major factors as well, uh, but these five are aligned with our five panels. Um, so in panel one, you will, you will hear about high, high, uh, high housing costs um, and the vulnerability, economic vulnerability. In the second panel, you will, talk, you will hear about housing shortage, and then we will hear about a sh uh, lack of shelters and mental health and drug addiction issues, as well as crime and public safety in the last panel. So at during my five to 10 minutes of time, I will just focus on a lack of shelters and a lack of treatment. So a lack of shelters, we all know that in California, unsheltered, homeless, um, unsheltered homelessness has risen by 59% between 2014 and 2020. And that's, that's true um, across different cities. For example, in San Francisco, unsheltered homeless doubled over 15 years. And in Oakland, Alameda, and Berkeley, it ha it's even worse, it tripled over 15 years. So the red bars are unsheltered population. And similarly, in the LA County, the red bars are un unsheltered homeless, and three in four homeless are unsheltered. So why? Why is the share of unsheltered homeless so high in California? Well, some people may say it's weather, maybe, um, but I think there are some other factors at play. Um, so in San Francisco, for example, um, we actually stopped building shelters for 10 years between 2004 and 2014. Many of you here probably know that. Um, so you can see it's literally flat. This is the shelter beds in San Francisco. And after 2014, um, San Francisco start, restarted building a shelter again, uh, but it was a little too late, too little. Um, and in comparison, we actually have built a lot of permanent supportive housing. So you can see the red lines, those are permanent supportive housing, and those are defined as an apartment unit and sometimes a studio unit uh, provided to chronically homeless individuals. And in comparison, the emergency shelters, transitional housing were flat. Um, so why we build so many permanent supportive housing? Well, I mean, there, there is a housing first movement many of you are familiar with. Uh, there are some kind of uh, a certain uh, wrap wraparound services are provided at the permanent supportive housing to the homeless individuals. Um, and then there are certain uh, benefits uh, associated with permanent supportive housing. But at the same time, uh, as we all know in California, it's just too difficult to build housing and it takes too long. So for example, in, uh, LA, in the LA County, the proposition Triple H cost about $1.2 billion. And then it cost about 600, 
600,000 to build one apartment unit. It's very expensive and it takes very long. Um, so that, as an economist, we also need to ask, where do we spend the marginal dollar? Um, so here, uh, this graph I just steal from the Bay Area Council Economic Institute. Um, you know, they compared, they did a fantastic comparison of the cost of different, uh, sh from shelters all the way to affordable housing. So you can see the cost of community, uh, cabin, com cabin community is about 10,000, uh, and all the way to affordable housing is about 500,000. Um, so should we spend, where should we spend the marginal dollar? That's a question. And next, I only have a little time, so I want to just quickly go over the difficulty in accessing mental health and drug, drug addiction treatment. So we all know that in California, compared to other states, California has a very high percent of chronically homeless in population. So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is among the chronically homeless population, so in California, we have one third of them, they have a, a high percentage of them have severe mental illness and or drug addiction. So about 80% of them have severe mental illness or, and or drug addiction. And actually many of the experts have told me that's an underestimate. So what has caused this? Um, actually, I was gonna say um, many of them actually are not receiving enough treatment as well. So why are we not treating our uh, mentally ill patients and uh, drug addiction patients? Well, there are many reasons, but I just want to go through some of the structural reasons. Uh, one is the institutionalization that started in the late 1950s in the US. Uh, so we all know in 1963, President John F. Kennedy signed the Community Mental Health Act into law. And after that, uh, a lot of the state public, uh, public mental, house, uh, house, mental hospitals closed down. So you can see the number of inpatient beds in public mental hospitals declined from 300, um, 330 per 100K population all the way down to 11. And at the same time, the hope at the time was to build community care in order to substitute the inhumane institutional care. Um, but that promise did not materialize. So even when we add all the community care, community beds together, today we have about 170,000. So compared to 1955, we had 550,000. So if mental illness did not go away, where did the mental, uh, mental health patients go? And I just wanna spend maybe just a few more minutes here. I interviewed some doctors uh, treating um, patients in LA and in the Bay Area. So these are their opinions about why we have barriers for homeless in accessing treatments. Uh, so those with uh, severely, severe mental illness, the super dupers who don't think anything is wrong, um, they don't want treatment because they don't think anything is wrong. And so, and then when they do want help, where do you go, the emergency room? What are they gonna do? They're going to start you in an antipsychotic? No, that's not, that's not what they do. Say there's a psychiatric emergency room. Are they going to start you on an antipsychotic? Probably not because they don't know you. You know, they don't know what's going on like a one-time visit. Are they going to refer you to the Department of Mental Health? Yeah. When is your, you know, what, how do you get there? Well, it's a walk-in visit. You go to Department of Mental Health Clinic, you do a walk-in visit and they do an intake. The intake takes three hours. No one has that. First of all, they're waiting three hours. So nobody, you know, if you're severely mentally ill, you don't have that patience. You don't have that ability to say, oh, this is going to be uh, good for me in the long run. And so, um, and then to get a psychiatrist takes another three months. Like kind of the biggest need is the need for same day access to treatment, so basically treatment available the day you need it at the time you need it. And Santa Clara County is um, home to millions of people, right? San Jose itself is about a million people and you think about all those other ones and you have one place. And when I say number of detox beds, I don't know the number of detox beds in there, but I wanna say it's around 10. Um, and I think um, the other place that you can go detox is for women, which is Mariposa. Uh, and I believe that the number of detox beds they have is under 10. Um, and so you think about the county our size, 
and you think about the number of detox beds we have, and it is just not enough. And my understanding that I've heard is that there are residential beds available, but not enough detox beds uh, to allow for folks to go into residential. So step one, so let's just look at that part. Step one, you call a 100 number. Okay, so uh, tell me, you know, what could be some problems for folks that are experiencing homelessness? Well, you may don't have a phone, right? So step two, say you have a phone. As soon as you get on the phone, you know, there are sometimes there's a hold time, there's wait time. And if there's not, you get somebody, then you start doing intake. Um, and I, I've actually, um, because my patients um, notoriously have historically had a super hard time getting into programs that they need to get into, I will often use my time as a doctor um, sitting there in the exam room. So instead of you know doing my regular doctorly stuff, I will sit in the exam room on the phone with them waiting. And so often I'll be privy to, to some of the information that I see happening. And so I mean, they get transferred or, you know, and so sometimes people get dropped in the middle of transfer. I've had that happen a few times where we've had to call back and then you've got to start right over again. Um, and, so the, and then you get transferred and then you give you all your information to the second person and then they transfer you again to the third person. Um, and so often there's a lot of transferring. And at the end of the day, um, you're then said, okay, you know, we are going to sign you up for this residential program. This is the phone number for this program. Go ahead and call. Um, and see if they have an availability. And so they go ahead and call. And of course, there is no availability at the day they ask. Um, and so they're told to call back. And my understanding is that you were supposed to call back uh, once a day uh, until you get in. And, you know, or sometimes people will call you. Um, they'll say, okay, or, you know, I've heard had situations where, um, you know, we've had people been told that, okay, you know, so-and-so will call you. And, you know, like, you know, you get a call on your phone and then, you know, they happen to miss it. You know, I, I miss a lot of calls sometimes. And then when they missed it, they're screwed because that, that's it. All right, I want to skip a lot of my slides to, um, <laughs> to stay on time. And I just want to skip the, to the end. Uh, here are the list of people over 30, so 33 um, stakeholders in homelessness uh, domain who I have interviewed. And uh, based on those interviews, I, we made uh, a documentary. And we also issued a policy brief. And also, we are going to record this policy, this policy uh, forum. And so all the outputs uh, will be online. Uh, you can use this scan code and we will email you afterwards and so you can stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thanks, Jalu. And sorry, I think we got off time a little bit because of me. Uh, but we are, I'm very excited to uh, introduce the moderator of our first panel. Uh, is my friend and colleague David Grusky. David Grusky is the Edward Ames Edmonds Professor in the School of Humanity and Sciences, Professor of Sociology, <clears throat> and a senior fellow here at CEPR, and the director of the Stanford Center on Poverty and Inequality. And he's also a co-editor of Pathways Magazine. Uh, he is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, co-recipient of the 2004 Max Weber Award, founder of the Cornell University Center for the Study of Inequality, and a former presidential young investigator. I could go on and on and on about Professor Grusky's many accomplishments. I'll just tell you a couple, one other thing. His recent books are Inequality in the 21st Century, uh, Social Stratification, Occupy the Future, The New Gilded Age, and The Great Recession. His research examines changes in the amount, type, and sources of inequality. So with that, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Grusky. Uh, Thanks, Mark. Way too generous. You're the engine of inflation. Uh, <laughs> so let's get down to, to, to business. I, I want to welcome everyone to this first panel, uh, uh, a panel on housing affordability and economic vulnerability. We have a superstar lineup. We have uh, Gary Painter, professor in the Sol Price School of Public Policy at the University of Southern California, also director of the Sol Price Center for Social Innova Innovation also director of the Homelessness Policy Research Institute, also chair of the Department of Public Policy. That's a lot of leadership for one person. That's like Deganian leadership, right? Uh, but there's more. He also leads in the world of scholarship, perhaps best known for his work on funding social innovation. He's one of the, the top provocateurs, for example, in in, in the world of social impact bonds and has just released a book on, on social impact bonds in the US and, and the UK. 
Uh, additionally, a leading scholar of housing, urban economics, and educational policy, and has published influential papers in, in all of those fields. The second speaker today, Regina Williams, is another superstar. Don't say CEPR doesn't give you the top talent. You do. Point of pride, I have to mention first off that she's originally from Stanford, having earned her bachelor's degree in urban studies here. Then she went off to Penn for an advanced degree. Happily, she came back and is making big things happen, and we'll learn more about that uh, soon. As executive director at SV at Home, she leads policy and advocacy for affordable housing in Silicon Valley. Prior to joining SV at Home, she served as director of housing development at First Community Housing, a leading affordable housing developer in, in San Jose. She earlier was a member of the National Development Council's EAST team, providing housing and economic development counseling uh, while leading also their, their green initiatives. And that's not all. She's also worked at the National Housing Trust, where she uh, structured financing for affordable green housing alternatives. A very warm welcome to, to, to Regina Williams. Our final panelist, Chris Coe, is our third leading light. He is the Vice President of Impact and Strategy for the United Way of Greater Los Angeles. It's a bit of a job. His charge is, is ensuring that everyone in LA County, that's that, that small county somewhere in the south, I don't know where, uh, that everyone in LA County has, has a quality education, a stable job, and, and safe housing, a bit of a charge. Uh, his accomplishments are, are, are legendary. He built the coalitions that, are, that were needed to pass historic ballot measures around housing, homelessness, and, and racial justice. He's been a leader in the homelessness count and the coordinated entry system, which became a model for the country. So that's our all-star panel. And, and so here's how it's going to come down. Each of our panelists are going to present a five-minute set piece. Then I'm going to fire questions at them. And after that, we're going to open up to questions from the floor. So let's get right to it. We'll begin, uh, as listed on the schedule, with, with Gary Painter. Welcome. We have Chris go up next. Oh, my apologies. <laughs> Chris is going first. <laughs> so I did an excellent moderating job so far. Gary's the main act, so you got to let me be the opener. Gary's here. We got Beyonce and Jay-Z coming up. I'll be. <laughs> I'll be the opener. Good morning, everyone. Um, pleasure and honor to be with you all this morning. Um, old friends, new friends, hopefully by the end of today. Um, I want to start off, kick off this morning with a, a cautionary tale of an oversight we made that I hope as we move forward that we don't collectively make together uh, as we move forward with this. And how does this work? Do I just click? One second. Slideshow, current slide, all right, no, I think those are the extra slides, great, okay. So 12 years ago, I accepted Christine Margiotta's offer to join Home for Good, which was the United Way and the LA Area of Chambers Regional Plan to End Homelessness. And our theory was pretty straightforward, it was simple. Um, we had ID two populations in homelessness, one which had economic challenges, another which had more structural barriers. You heard Jao Lu talk about that a little bit earlier. And even though the second group was the smaller group, and if there was a quarter, we identified that um, this group consumed three quarters of the resources. So the theory of change was if we solve this more structural problem, that we could redistribute some of those resources and that efficient uh, resource allocation back to the three quarters. And we had tremendous success. We uh, organized a movement. We became California's largest community-based response to homelessness, largest non-governmental response to homelessness. And we saw permanent housing rates more than double. So on the left side, we started in 2009, but over the first five years, you see permanent housing rates go from 4,000 to nearly 10,000. But even that for us, we realized was at a scale that we didn't think was enough, so we organized two of the first dedicated measures on homelessness in the country to try to increase that number even more. So this is how we got to that number that Jiao Lu talked about earlier. 207 
permanent exits per day. So every day in LA County, this is not just a shelter. These are over 200 people leaving homelessness permanently every day in LA County. So when we started, we started here. So we thought that would all equal this chart continuing to head down. And as you saw, this is what actually happened to the chart of the homeless count. Because even though we did that, this is far less dramatic now that Chao Lu did this <laughs> earlier. But even though this number is five times where we started, right? We started this and throughout our time, over 10 years, we more than quintupled the number of people permanently being housed. But the number that grew even more was the people who became homeless every day. Because in this span, what happened was the, in, counterintuitively, what happened was the economic recovery of California, LA County. We started during the recession, but as uh, California became a destination, as tech became a driver of economies, as things moved from finance in New York to California, West Coast, San Francisco to LA, the economic recovery meant that a lot of people got left behind. Most specifically, what that resulted were in rents rising. So this in one number is the story of homelessness in LA County, which was that we lost 300,000 affordable units in that same decade, right? A thousand, uh, over 100,000 that rent for 1,000 to 1499, 200,000 units lost that rent for less than $1,000 a month, right? So take that in for a second. The, seeing that, um, this is what this looks like in the life of a particularly vulnerable population, older adults. So the red line is the HUD fair market rate for a studio apartment, an efficiency. Um, and then the white, you can't actually see it here, but there is a white line here, which the combination of this blue and the white means the total amount of SSI that an older adult gets in the state of California. The blue is the federal amount, California has a supplement. So what you see is that around this time, that an older adult on a fixed income, right, an older adult past working age on fixed income, on a very black and white math equation, can no longer live in a place, right? Up until uh, less than 10 years ago, just with SSI, they could afford to at least live somewhere on their own even, but at least live in a shared apartment. So the blue line is what a shared apartment looks like. And then over the last five years, you see both of those things become out of reach. It's a very simple math problem for someone who, again, no longer can work at a, at a you know, sustainable income and who lives off fixed income. And that is the story of homelessness for a particularly vulnerable population. Polar ice caps have melted. What I mean by that is I think a lot of times when we, when we talk about solutions to homelessness, it reminds me of when we talk about global warming and we talk about turning down the heat and in installing some polar, you know, solar panels while the problem, the magnitude has substantially, substantially grown. I do, when I hear solutions to interim housing, I do hear some of that scale, right? When we talk about thousands of tiny homes, safe parking. I do hear that scale of an approach. I don't hear it on the issue of housing affordability. Um, and there are populations for whom this has always been true. Black people, people in foster involved systems, there are populations that this country has long disregarded and long not held ground for. But when you see it in populations like older adults or families, the Latinx populations, other groups that there have been more generous benefits for over time, and you see it structurally go out of reach, we're talking about a problem that is far different than the problem we were talking about even 10 years ago. And so that first population that we thought was fairly static for a time, that 75% that used to have economic challenges, is now a far different story. You see it even in here. When I started the work, you could reasonably expect someone to get out of shelter in 90 days to six months. Now, six months, if there's any service providers in the room, you are clapping your hands if someone makes it out of shelter in six months, you know, much less two years. 
So the story of economic homelessness is one in which that temporary solution on its own no longer is the final pathway out. What does that mean? While they're in the shelter, while they're still on the street, it means they're developing acuities they didn't have previously. And so when we don't talk about the fundamental economic challenge, we are also getting into all of the other issues that we'll be talking about later today. The one thing, we have gotta play this on both sides if we're talking about a polar ice cap situation. The one thing I don't hear enough about is the fundamental issue. Do people have enough money to put toward rent? Streamlining, regulatory issues, permitting, those are all really necessary but not sufficient for the problem today. Those are things that over a generation may result in filtering and lowered house prices. But for the population today, in that same time, how are we going to actually help them get the money they need to pay rent so that when those things are built, they can sustainably live there? I think we all agree that we are in an emergency. I don't think anyone has to be convinced that we're in an emergency. I don't know if we all agree what kind of emergency we're in, right? So we are, a lot of people think this is a cleanup job where if we declare a state of emergency to clean up the issues that have happened, we can move on with it. I would offer to you that uh, we are still in the storm and another storm is coming. So we can build all, we should, we need to build all of the temporary solutions that need to happen. But that number of 20 a day, that would mean we would need to build a high capacity shelter every month to just keep up with what's happening to come inside. So even as we do that, that's where I'm talking about, we need to figure out a fundamental fix to the income issue. And this is, a, and I think it's possible. It's possible. When you see it with vulnerable populations that have, we have historically been generous for, it is a call to reset the floor on what we're talking about. This is a picture of New Orleans after Hurricane Ida, where they, they face a moment after Katrina and the time that happened afterwards where they had to make a decision. Do we keep cleaning up? Do we keep relocating people? Do we keep offering that same temporary fix? Or do we look at a more fundamental solution? Do we do the cleanup or do we build the levy? The choice is ours. Well, thank you to the organizers for having me be part of this, and um, you know that Bilu and, and also Chris has really laid out the structural issues. I'm going to try to focus my attention and, and my conversation just on some of the other heterogeneity within the homeless population because I think it's important to kind of understand what that is. Chris alluded to it, and I'm just going to jump right in for sake of time. Chris alluded to the fact that the vulnerabilities are not the same across populations. And so when one actually looks at race and ethnicity, what we see is that if you are black, if you are an indigenous population in the US, that you're much more likely to be represented within the homeless population than you are within the general population. That's consequential and is due to all sorts of systemic issues, which we can return to in the panel if we would like to do so. Um, as, as Chris said, the Latino population weren't as represented among the homeless. And that's been rapidly increasing. So I just wanted that point to put in your mind. Um, another point Chris mentioned is this issue of people who are over 65 who are becoming homeless. Uh, it's rising. The cost to serve them um, is much higher than the cost to serve people under 55. And their health deteriorates even faster than someone else who's experiencing homelessness. And so that's something we have to keep front and center. Um, one of the things that has come up a couple times is this notion of chronic homeless versus non-chronic homeless. And I think it's important just to make sure everybody has that definition. So if you're chronically homeless, that means that you have been homeless more than a year and you have a disabling condition. I'm gonna use the term newly homeless, which means that, you've, that that one is easier to understand because it just means you've been homeless less than a year and give you some sense of how they differ across time. This is based on a demographic survey in Los Angeles, and you can see that the newly homeless in red have higher rates of citing economic issues as the reason they are homeless than people who are chronically homeless, but economics matters a great deal for both. Um, when you look at differences across disabling conditions, it should be the case because the definition of chronic that you face more disabling conditions, whether it's mental illness, physical illness, or disability. Among the newly homeless, though, 
we, we see that these rates are kind of are much smaller in terms of having these various disabilities. And so when you see the conversation about mental illness, you really do have to understand that the issue of mental illness is not among the newly homeless. The newly homeless are the majority of the homeless population. Among the people who become homeless in a given year, like for instance in Los Angeles, one third of the population is roughly chronically homeless. One third lives on the streets. One third live in their cars. The people that live in their cars, 80% are working. 20% are working full time. Like this is a population, you just, you need to kind of appreciate what that means. And as Chris had the great, just kind of simple illustration, you become homeless, then health and other conditions attenuate. You, you start to get worse. And people who are living on the streets actually acquire substance abuse disorder at very rapid rates and they had no issues before. We, we, we do have to think about what's happening among those people who are becoming newly homeless. And so when we think about drivers, again, well, it's important to kind of orient ourselves in this way. We cannot talk about drivers without talking about institutional and systemic racism. Um, that's why we see overrepresentation in the black and the indigenous population, and that may be able to be addressed in our panel or, or later here today. Uh, I know there's another whole panel on constrained housing supply. I'm not going to talk about that. What I'm going to focus my remarks on and kind of this question is, there are so many people, and, and the polar ice cap melting is a really good one because it kind of shows how hard it is for me as an economist to try to figure out what is the event that I can use in my analysis to say, if we just change this policy, we can get rid of homelessness because that's not how it's actually worked. What it's worked is, is, is that um, people who are experiencing rent burden, you know, the percentage of income is rent. So let me just say this, I'm gonna focus on severe rent burden. Here in California, there are 1.2 million households that pay more than half their income as rent. That represents roughly two and a half to three million people who are in those circumstances. Among that group, they have elevated risk of homelessness compared to any other population, right? But it's still rare. Right, how many people experience homelessness? 150, 160,000 people. So this is not a, a group that you can just simply kind of say, oh, you're about to become homeless, so we're gonna do that. Despite the work around big data techniques, predictive analytics, and so forth, that's not going to solve this problem of who actually becomes homeless among those people who are experiencing so much. So the one issue Chris brought up before, we, we don't have the wage job growth enough to match the rent. So that's something that's, that's real. And as, as those of us who are economists in the room should really think about how our economy is functioning for people who are low and moderate income. Um, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about the safety net because it may not come up again today. Like, do, is our safety net in California sufficient to support those people who are gonna fall into you know, uh, adverse conditions, lose their job, whatever the case might be? And so I'm, we, we did a report at the Price Center for Social Innovation where we did focus on kind of what does the safety net look like? We did it with a partner, Imagine LA, who works with a lot of uh, families who had experienced homelessness so that we could have kind of that, that kind of nuance and structure of, of people who have that lived experience, but also just to look at the, the data on, on how the safety net works. And so what I, I think most people know what the safety net is, it's a combination of cash, in-kind benefits. Some of the cash is in the form of tax credits. Some of it's in the form of actual payments given to people. Um, the idea of our safety net in the U.S. is to support work that's explicit in the legislation from the 1996 Welfare Reform Act. Um, and what we find is that the experiences of low and moderate income is that the safety net just simply has too many holes. Um, we don't have time to talk about all the programs that are involved, but we are looking at programs that are especially focused on supporting families, not individuals, people with disabling conditions like SSI or SSDI. Um, the safety net among all these 15 different programs in these different categories um, get deployed to folks in a variety of different ways. So this is like the, I don't even know what to call it, like the spider web graph, the, you know, like, so if you are receiving housing assistance, you know, at zero dollars earned, so this horizontal axis is how much you've earned, and this is the value of resources that come with your earnings plus your tax credits plus your you know, benefits, et cetera. Um, that's the largest benefit, is your housing assistance. And it kind of just tapers off, because if for those of us that know the structure of the voucher program, it covers 30% of your, it requires that you pay 30% of your net income as rent. So it just kind of tapers off as if you have it, right? The second largest is the CalWORKs child care subsidy. Um, and then there's just a combination of a lot of small benefits. You have the EITC for, for someone who uh, studied public finance at Berkeley, you know, I, I got used to seeing this graph as it became much more dominant compared to cash assistance, our CalWORKs here in, in California. And this is another way to kind of look at it. 
Um, this big green is like your net income going up in terms of your earned income and how everything else just kind of layers on top of it. Um, and you can see, I mean, it, it's just kind of, you can see that benefits and resources are relatively flat. Again, if you get most of them, um, this is a graph that shows the reality that only one in five people eligible for housing assistance actually get it, so they're not on here. This line here is the calculation of what is required to you know, living wage. This is from the MIT living wage calculator, so these are the resources needed to live in one of our coastal cities. And you can see that you know, basically families, even if they're getting everything other than housing, they, you know, the child care being the biggest one, they're not getting to that line. Right? So they're vulnerable consistently. They're severely rent burdened. And what does that mean? Well, it turns out that that's this blue line here. If you get housing, it does put you above. Right? And we can talk about work disincentives. That was my PhD dissertation at Berkeley 30 years ago. So I, I'm always happy to talk about that in a room with economists. Um, it's like, wow, that's flat. Why should I, should I work if it's going down? You know, all those kinds of things. And we can talk about the research on that. But the reality is, is that most families are this yellow line. Okay, and there's way below what's needed, the resources. And the reason it is, is that until you become incredibly poor with no assets and income, you don't actually qualify for CalWORKs. And without qualifying for CalWORKs, you don't get the CalWORKs child care subsidy, which is the, a third of the overall benefit package. And we know that only one in five people get the housing voucher that they're eligible for. And so you're actually down here, right? You're not up here. And so it's, it's kind of, there's good news and bad news, but it's mostly bad news, sadly. Um, and so these are the holes, as we just mentioned. And then the other thing that I haven't mentioned yet is that individuals um, are really not part of the safety net. Um, if you have mixed status families, immigrants, you may not, the parents might not be eligible for things. Um, there is an issue of people not necessarily taking up their benefits at the same rate that they could, but that, I think, is less of an issue than than what's going on. Um, you know, so single people, it's just not there. There's a whole other issue of navigation. Like how do you actually kind of navigate and move from social benefits to tax credits? You know, the group that we worked with on this project, Imagine LA, happened to have a tax lawyer as part of their board. And so when someone was like, I don't want to work anymore because I'm going to lose my benefits, um, they said, well, let's look at the tax system. And so they said, oh, you're going to get those benefits. You know, it's just going to switch to tax credits. It goes from child care benefit to child care tax credit. And people had no idea that was the case. But that's another issue for another time. I think for today, and again, I've kind of rushed through just for sake of time, and I probably still didn't keep it in five minutes. Sorry, David. Um, I think what Chris said is like most homelessness policy has focused on the chronically homeless. That's not a bad thing, because this is the population of people who are most at risk of dying on the streets. Like, that is a population that should get priority. Um, but what it hasn't done is focused on kind of how the dynamics of people moving into homelessness um, is addressed. And it doesn't address housing insecurity more generally. Um, it's very hard to target people who are becoming homeless. Um, and so what we probably need to do is to rethink here in California, where we just had the largest budget surplus we've ever had, to think about, well, what could it mean? And you know, I've written a couple of op-eds on the topic, but if we actually did rental tax credits or something for families who, while they wait for their voucher, do something to support them, um, I would recommend tying it to some sort of good behavior provision that people allow building in their in their places, but you know, and, and that gets complicated in the you know kind of political system and so forth. But um, I'm going to stop there. And again, I appreciate the time to to share. Um, I there's there's so much more to say, and I'd love to follow up with with you, Mark, um, specifically because I represent the Homelessness Policy Research Institute which is backbone at the Price Center for Social Innovation and the whole goal of its existence. And Chris in the United Way was a leader in kind of creating it and, and the Hilton Foundation was to bridge the Mars-Venus gap um, and to kind of put us in the center. So hopefully we've learned a few things in the last four years. So thank you and Regina, the floor is yours. Well, I don't know about you all, but I'm so grateful to be here today, to be taking in all of this information. And um, I'm actually very excited to get to the conversation piece. So 
I'm hopeful that I'll be able to share a few, a few um, tidbits um, from our research uh, about housing in the Bay Area that can uh, enlighten the conversation. Um, so I'm, I'm with SV at Home, and we're a nonprofit affordable housing advocacy and policy um, shop. And for us, we really use data to, um, to talk to folks all across the spectrum. Um, so we live at the intersection. All of the folks who work with community-based organizations, uh, directly serve, serving populations that may be low income or marginalized, um, to developers, to um, funders, to, to tech companies. We work at that intersection. And so I'm so very grateful for Mark and, and the Institute today to understand that we need to come together and talk about um, the issues of housing affordability. So um, what we really have seen is um, that there's a, a, a huge increase um, in the jobs housing imbalance. This is the, the foundation of the arguments that we make when we go to cities and their staff, when they're considering housing policy, when we go to advocate for more affordable housing and, and, and policies that support building um, at, greater, at greater densities, is that here in the Silicon Valley, in this economic engine, um, jobs are, are increasing tremendously. Um, there is wealth being built and created um, and accumulated. However, housing is not meeting the need. We are not building enough housing to keep up with that imbalance. And so there are policies that we advocate for, like commercial linkage fees, things that tie um, the, the, the growth in the economic engine to building more housing so that everyone can continue to live here and, 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 and thrive. Um, so here, this talks a little bit about how rents continue to go up. Um, we all recognize, and, and the data showed, as, as Chris shared, that in the last decade, even with the recession, um, there has been um, a tremendous increase in the inaffordability of being able to live here in Silicon Valley. So rents are going up and up and up. Um, and the, and, and um, the ability to access this housing um, is, is very challenging. And this is, again, because of the lack of affordable housing and housing in general being built. And so it's, it's clearly a supply and demand issue. Here we have um, the, the home prices for purchasing going up and up and up. So again, supporting the idea that um, affordability is just out of reach. For, for most people, and it continues to do so. Um, and so this is really the data point that I want to um, hammer on today, which is although um, we did see some flattening of rents uh, during the pandemic, a lot of that was at the high end. What we've seen is that the increase in housing um, production is happening at, at the luxury end, at the market rate, and those that are that can only afford, you know, um, the lower end of the spectrum are the ones who are falling out of being housed into being unhoused, um, and that is because when you have uh, housing aff affordability really drop the folks who may be able to um, afford the high end, they start to access maybe moderate um, markets, and then it all impacts the folks at the bottom who are the most vulnerable to falling into being unhoused in our community. So again, um, the rents at the bottom still continue to go up, even while there may be some flattening at the top. Here, I wanted to show a little bit about um, what people can afford. So here's some data that shows that um, in order to be able to afford um, a three bedroom, it's really out of reach for most folks who work in our, in our community. Um, a two bedroom, perhaps there are folks like a firefighter or a police officer, um, but you, you really see our everyday folks, elementary teachers, construction workers, people who work in retail, all of this housing, the, the average um, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, all tremendously out of reach for these folks. 
And so in Santa Clara County, we do have the, commu the community plan to end homelessness. Um, it's really grounded on um, understanding the breadth um, of the need and trying to um, pr provide assistance to families, to individuals at every end of the spectrum. So um, for example, we have here let's see, um, something that shows sort of the continuum of, of services being provided, all the way from permanent supportive housing, rapid rehousing, um, those who may be at risk of homelessness, to homelessness prevention services, things to help people stay in their, in their housing, in their units, and, and everything in between. And so um, the goal of the county is really to provide a comprehensive plan of helping folks stay housed or get housed and prevent um, homelessness. And then I just wanted to share a little bit about the success of this plan. At the, at the very top, in this chart, the goal to, was to build 20,000 units by 2025. We're already to a third of our goal since 2020. So the county is very aggressively working to create more units um, and house more folks and, and provide more housing placement. Um, and then the goal here was to reduce uh, the inflow of individuals into homelessness. And they met their goal. The baseline was to reduce it by 30%, and they surpassed that um, recently. They, they do believe, the folks at the county's Office of Supportive Housing do believe that um, some of the eviction moratoriums and things like that were a huge support in them reaching this goal so soon in their, in their um, plan. But there are very aggressive efforts to keep people housed. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to show was just here, right here. This chart that shows um, the program utilization, the fact that you know this whole continuum is highly being used by folks in our community. Um, and so I just wanna end with the fact that we know that the goal um, of ending homelessness is possible, but we need to build more housing. Um, and so SV at Home, we talk about protecting tenants to prevent displacement. Um, preserving existing affordable housing units. There was a chart shown on earlier about how many affordable units we're losing every year and to produce more housing because it really is um, a supply and demand issue, especially here in this tremendous um, economic engine that is Silicon Valley. Thank you. These are wonderful presentations. Um, I'm going to invite now our three speakers to come up to the stage. Uh, and we're now going to, to open up a conversation. I'm under strict orders to get us back on schedule. I have a boatload of questions. I'm not going to ask all of them. I'll select a few. I'll pose them. And then we'll open it up to the floor. Uh, we have till 10.35. I got five extra minutes because this is too important not to get at least five. Thanks, Mark. Um, but we're going to stop at 10.35. OK. I'll get right to it. Um, first question, and I want to begin with the observation. We're an impatient people because of election cycles, because of the press of immediate needs, for a host of other reasons. We want to get the job done now. We have no taste for institutional solutions, big to, 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 to systemic problems. Uh, we opt instead for, one might argue, the Band-Aid. So for the last 20 years, we've been trying to solve the homelessness crisis next year. Uh, and that's arguably a recipe for 20 years of failure. I'm being a provocateur here. I'm just setting you up. You can shoot me down. So what if 20 years ago, instead of going for the Band-Aid, we had said, this is a systemic institutional problem. We've got market failure. We've got institutional failure. That lies behind the problem. Let's take on those big ticket problems. Let's give us 20 years to solve those problems, because they're big institutional market failure problems. And then, at the end of the 20 years, let's get the job done. Instead of saying, let's do it next year. Would that work? Is that the right diagnosis? Or, and, or, is, or, or is that too simplistic? I'll throw it open to any of you who want to take, take that on. 
I, I'm happy to start, but I think I don't want to take too much of the thunder from the next panel, um, which is focused on housing supply. I think 20 years ago, we were already 20 years into a government failure to add to the market failure, but it's, it's, a tr it's an interactive failure. It's it's the fact that because of government's restriction of policy, because the courts have enforced our environmental legislation in a particular way, um, and we basically just made the decision that in the 1980s we had enough Californians. You know, it was good. People who were here, this was great, and we liked it how it was. Um, and so we've restricted zoning, I uh, sorry, restricted building, we've downzoned. Um, people in, in Los Angeles City might know that the city of Los Angeles in the 60s was zoned for over 10 million units. Um, by essentially 2005, it had been reduced to 4.4 million units in terms of what could be built. Um, the Senate Bill 9 and 10 and ADU legislation allows more building with duplexes and so forth, so that's increased. And I haven't gone through a report the Urban Institute just put out to figure out how much it's increased to. But, but given that we took 40 years, to your point, David, uh, to get to a restricted housing building supply, Regina had a great graph on the jobs and housing imbalance, then it's going to take 20 years once we undo some of the restrictions. But I hope I didn't uh, take any thunder away from the next panel. But I think that is also fundamental. And then the point that I made about the safety net, like if we're going to do that to us, then that is going to increase the number of people experiencing vulnerability. And if we don't actually address the holes in the safety net, then that vulnerability is going to lead to people experiencing homelessness. So, so those are the choices that we have in front of us in the short term and the long term. Normally, I lament the term limit short term crisis issued. But thinking about it right now with you asking it, um, it makes me think it's a complicating factor, but not fundamentally a bad one. Um, what I mean by that is that I do think it is as urgent as we make it to be. People are actually dying. Our communities are not what we want them to be, any of us, housed or unhoused. So I think that urgency is fair, but I think urgency comp makes us reach for uh, quick solutions, things that have been done, doesn't leave enough time for the political process to tackle more fundamental issues. And I think that's what results in the kind of um, narrow solutions that we often find ourselves. I'm glad, Regina, you mentioned I was, you know, the inflow data was really powerful because that's an example of we, we had an emergency, we reached for an immediate solution, which was we pumped more rental assistance into people's pockets than we have done in my lifetime. That was an immediate, quick, urgent solution that had the effect of stemming inflow in a substantial way, which results in certain homeless counts. Like San Francisco was basically flat, right? You saw inflow go up in the East Bay and other places where you saw gentrification having gone up. But you saw things become flat in a period of time where you would have thought homelessness would have continued to go up. So um, I don't think urgency is in and of itself a problem as long as we can reach for uh, more substantial solutions that tackle um, the root of the, of the issue that people just can't pay their rent. And I guess I'd just add that um, the recognition that it is a structural and systemic issue, mm -hmm. if we had recognized that, which means tying all of our individual responsibility to um, opening up um, our areas for more housing, I think that makes a huge difference. It's a, it's a framework shift that we need to do. And if we had done it 20 years ago, I, think, I do think that our communities will look a lot different. And um, I'm hopeful that they're going to look different moving forward, understanding, as, as Gary mentioned, what we've been doing. Thank you. And something we, can't, we didn't know 20 years ago, the impact of the open global market, right? And we, like, there are certain things we could not have known 20 years ago. <laughs> But we have to respond to them today, which is, you know, we're competing with buyers from outside. Outside, we're competing with institutional investors for housing in a way this country has never seen. Those are things that I don't know we could have 
I don't know many people were predicting the scale of that 20 years ago, but it has come to be today, and we have to respond to it. Thank you. So I'm going to turn now to kind of more of the short-term press of, of immediate needs and, and ask about getting money into the pockets of, of people, enough money to make it, make it possible for them to afford housing. And, and my question is a simple one. Is there any reason to care from the point of view of, of, of a homelessness expert about how that happens? So there's lots of ways to get money into the pockets of, 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 of people, into the pockets of the low-income population. We could run a hotter labor market. Uh, we could raise minimum wages even, even higher. We could turn to a guaranteed income. We could ramp up rent subsidies or Section 8 housing vouchers. So is there a reason, here's my question, is there a reason for a homelessness expert to, to have a dog in that fight? To, to, or, sh or, or should it be that other considerations, like, like as, as Gary noted, like effects on labor supply, should they govern the choice of how to get more money into, into low-income pockets? And you're kind of indifferent to it. So if we're talking about immediate needs, getting money into the pocket so people can, can afford the housing as it now stands, where do we go? How do we choose from among the array of options on the table? Tell us the answer, Gary. <laughs> I, thought, I was going to say I answered first last time. Someone else would begin the, the you conversation. still have the answer. <laughs> I, mean, I, I can say it, I don't think it's, um, we should care how that, how that um, money gets into folks' pockets because it's still a, a competition. One of the graphs that I showed, um, and I talked a little bit about it, but folks are competing for housing. Jobs are going up, folks are competing for housing, and some folks, a lot of folks, have much more money than others. Um, <clears throat> so, so what happens? The folks who have the, the lesser money, they use a higher percentage of what they have to afford housing, and the folks who have more money, maybe they don't use as much a percentage in that, than it's affordable to them, but they're still going to get that housing. And so if we don't have the homes for folks um, to live in, then you know, they're still going to be using more and more of a percentage of the funds that they're bringing in um, for that housing. And so we absolutely have to put more money into people's pockets. but but I don't care how we do it um, from my perspective. Yeah, I think that I mean, there's been you know, research study after research study that shows that the most effective way to stabilize families is to give them unrestricted cash. This should um, appeal to those of us as economists in the room because we like kind of the idea of consumer autonomy. It should also appeal to those who actually want to give people power over their circumstances. Um, and so what we, tend to do, on the other hand, with housing, is that we tend to kind of tie it with whether it's the housing choice voucher program to a set of like relationships between the federal government, the local landlord, the PHA, the Public Housing Authority. Um, rapid rehousing does this a little bit, but not as much, such that we make it even all the more hard for people to find units that might be available um, if, if there are a few. <laughs> As you said, Regina, there, you know, there aren't that many. It's because people who have higher incomes are competing for, for those units that used to be below median rent, and that me below median rent now is above median rent of five years ago. So I think that's we do know that cash in people's pockets does address short-term crises. Um, and and Chris gave the example of the pandemic. Um, don't restrict it, don't tie it to, don't give it to the landlord and so forth. The evidence suggests you give it to the person to address the immediate need, and then we can simultaneously address the structural issues. And then they can better compete. If they have less restrictions on right. the funds, they can better compete in the market. I think as a homelessness and housing stakeholder, I think a few things. One, I think we should be interested in things that are politically viable and feasible because time does matter, right? There may be a grand thing that is just politically impossible that we could debate for 10 years. So I do think it's incumbent on us to choose solutions and framings that can resonate with the public and political officials. I do think administrative pathways matter as a stakeholder in homelessness because we know certain things about how our unhoused neighbors can or can't receive benefits, right? If it requires addresses, if it requires other things. So I think we should, if that's what it's meant to address, we should choose administrative pathways. 
that are easier. As a homelessness stakeholder, I think if you work in the field, the, the job burnout retention turnover issue in the service sector is really a, a massive threat. And so things that administratively, not only for a person who is unhoused, but the other benefit of an administratively simple solution is that it will not tax an already exhausted workforce to try to do means testing in a way that, quite frankly, is uh, impossible right now with the current workforce. OK, I'm going to just do one more. Uh, I have to do this one, and then I'll turn it over to the open it up to the floor. In one of the slides, I can't remember which one, uh, institutional and systemic racism was listed as one of the key drivers. And so my question is simple, but, but I, th I, think, I think a crucial one. Uh, how can we develop solutions that recognize and take on the role of institutional and systemic racism? So there's, I'll begin, um, because you can talk about the pathways. You know, one particular pathway is just simply that um, black people are over-policed. They're more, more likely to be arrested. Data from Los Angeles that I've looked at with the LAPD is that they're three times more likely to be um, stopped than other populations. Uh, the Latino population is like 1.5 times more likely, but the black population in particular, what we know from that is that if you have an arrest or a conviction or you've actually been incarcerated, um, any of those three can show up on a criminal background check, even if they're not supposed to all the time. Um, expungement doesn't happen when it's supposed to routinely. And that leads to job instability and housing instability directly. And so that's just one example of a system that because of how it operates, it actually leads to labor market instability and housing market instability. Um, and we could certainly talk about many other systems um, that have led to kind of the outcomes that we observe today, but I'll just stop there as one. <laughs> so we look at a couple of different ways to address um, structural racism and how the legacy of it that's created the, the world we see today. One um, is dismantling um, that that structure of racism um, that exists in zoning and land use re regulation. Um, we really believe that policies that look to open up um, local control, open up um, the, the, those um, tools that were put in place to restrict access um, to folks who are of color um, from marginalized backgrounds, um, it's really important to attack those systems, because they're in place and we have to open them up and so that we can build more housing um, and create communities that are vibrant and everyone can, can live in them um, and live close to amenities and jobs and everything else. The other thing that we focus on in our coalition building is shifting power. Um, and we do that by working with uh, BIPOC communities, uh, community-based organizations that are BIPOC-led and talk a lot about um, community ownership we have uh, initiatives around Community Opportunity to Purchase Act in um, San Jose and other communities uh, in the South Bay. We're also working with uh, the South Bay Community Land Trust mm -hmm. around uh, the decommodification of, um, of housing. And so really working on a smaller scale, but a more meaningful scale um, about like who owns and controls land and therefore, like, where does the power lie? Because it really does need to shift um, away from where the power has been placed um, with wealthy individual landowners and placed to the broader community and people of color. Um, two things for me. One, I do think this issue of raising the floor on um, benefits or income that everyone has, I do think is a racial justice issue in and of itself. I think it's a form. Uh, a temporary small form of reparations um, because it is clear who has the money right now and who has doesn't have the money, which has all historically been true, but now it's even more visible and obvious because the the budget because we're not we're not in a situation where collectively economically we don't have enough. We had a hundred billion dollar surplus this year. The government doesn't have a surplus if companies and other people are not making money. That means we made a whole lot more money collectively, socially, than we expected to. 
So even in this situation with homelessness raging, we are, we are overall, people are, there are people who are doing incredibly well. And so this issue of like, can we afford, we, we avoid the income benefit increase solution because it feels expensive, but I would offer that it is uh, our collective energy, attention, the time of 150 people spending a day at a conference together. Like these are all the equivalent costs socially on us to avoid this solution. And if we were to attempt it or to look at it seriously, I think that in and of itself would be a massive form of racial equity shifting and racial justice. And I think as we think about those, the second thing it makes me think about is ownership. Beyond just uh, relief and service relief, as we build buildings, as we do these things, I think creating pathways for tenant ownership in these situations, uh, creating uh, opportunities for BIPOC developers and communities to own these things together so that it's not only a, a leaving of poverty, but that we can do it in a way that also uh, restores community control and ownership and profit sharing uh, to these ventures. And I'll just say one more thing, because as Chris brought up the, the budget surplus again, um, I alluded to the fact that there's 1.2 million households paying more than half their income as rent. It would cost about $9 billion to eliminate anyone paying more than half their income as rent. So if you think about is it worth kind of to reduce homelessness by 75%, um, is, is $9 billion, which is less than one-tenth of our surplus, worth it? I, I would argue yes. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I'm going to now throw it open to questions from, from, from the floor to, to any of our panelists. Yeah. Uh, I heard uh, um, San Diego has a whole city that has some increasing stuff. I don't know if that's true. I'm curious if there are other cities in California you would point to as doing something differently than LA or San Francisco that we could learn from. Yeah. Interesting question. Yeah. Yeah, the suggestion was to repeat the question before you answer it. Yeah, go so, ahead. Um, I believe I heard the question as. Um, Are there other cities in California that have done things that you could, uh, you might point to as a potential? Well, I mean, you, I mean, Regina, you yeah. presented a case, yeah, right, I, of I think Santa Clara other, County. I thought he was saying other oh. than the, what I presented. Right. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, Sorry, well, that's just okay. Yeah, okay. I'm just looking for, is, you is can, anyone you, else you doing well be, yeah. in California? Yeah, I mean, so I guess I'll just give a little context for what I presented, which is that um, in Santa Clara County, uh, the voters passed Measure A in 2016, which was um, a $950 million bond, um, really with the goal of uh, reducing and ending homelessness. And so um, a lot of the, the funding is, is geared towards um, extremely low income households, um, households who are chronically homeless, um, households who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness. And, um, and so that was sort of the context of where I shared like the, the work that has been done. Um, prior to that, in Santa Clara County, we had you know less than 100 units of permanent supportive housing. Um, you know, very few, um, um, very few uh, even rapid rehousing units. And so we really ramped up since 2016 in addressing um, you know the issue of displacement in our community and understanding that these were our community members that were being displaced due to economic factors. Um, and, and, and it's still ongoing, and um, I, I believe about um, 70, 75% 70, of the funds have been um, spent, and so it's just an effort to really address something that for, for too long was going unaddressed. I'll I just think, say something yeah. about San Diego and Long Beach, just as an example, but San Diego and Kevin Faulkner obviously is our keynote later, you, maybe you'll ask him again. Um, you know, even though the survey said most people thought it wasn't about money, um, we actually are in an extreme scarcity environment as it relates to um, providing housing to people who are currently unhoused. And so San Diego, what they did is they like reoriented their both health and housing resources in a particular way that prioritized people experiencing homelessness. They had to because of the hepatitis crisis. Um, and so because of all of that, those resources actually did reduce the number of people experiencing homelessness. And so at the, the point, the crisis is so large that 
it can't be not resources plus policy. It is a resources plus policy. And, and Long Beach has done some, some interesting things. And I was going to say, Mark, you, you had the next panel or the next conference on governance. You could have a third one on governance in homeless services that would also take up a day. <laughs> um, because there's, there's different ways that like Long Beach is its own continuum of care. And they, they orient their health and, and, and services in a way that, that you know, one might argue provides promising pathways. And even within cities, there are bright spots that you can look at, right? Even within LA, Santa Monica had a system for older adults that um, paid supplemental income to prevent their homelessness that resulted in those that population not becoming homelessness homeless. Veterans, even in the wake of things increasing gigantically, even in LA, has largely been flat and even you know, went 50% down and maintained largely. Those are both examples of situations where when we provide that floor, right? veterans have a VASH voucher and a level of entitlement that other populations don't have. You see the protection that exists even in this raging economy. Next question. Does someone have? Great. Go for it. Yes, I have a um, question that I'd like to ask in regards to the chronically homeless that uh, I know in Santa Clara County there's been a, a building that was developed for the homeless. And when you talk about the chronically homeless and you talk about drug addiction and mental health, and then you start reporting the increase in homelessness with people who cannot afford their housing, how do you plan to incorporate the two? Because I can see a problem with, with the newly homeless and the chronically homeless living in the same building, uh, you know, with, with, with means of survival and also with, with the newly, um, newly homeless, new, newly becoming homeless people. Did that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, you heard it on the mic. I'll just answer it quickly. We went on a trip to Trieste in Italy. It's a model that has been written up a bunch of times around how they got beyond a lockdown mental health care approach. What shocked me was that they, uh, we have like a 20 to 1 case manager ratio that we aim for here. They had a 1 to 5 ratio of one person being served by five people. That's how they did it. So the, they, they substituted care for control, and it worked. They were able to release people from prison to an apartment someone who had murdered someone violently and without restraint were able to care for them and have a collaborative living environment. So it is possible. Again, it's a matter of do we want to invest in that? They had a means of also um, stipending peers at a much higher level. So a lot of that case management ratio was made up of peers at a stipend basis. But that's how I think you have to wrap around to provide, not leave people to themselves, um, but provide the community of care. Uh, just two quick questions. One, I'm curious how much it costs per unit to add in, in San Jose. Um, and then, I guess, bigger picture, even if we distributed the $9 billion, mm -hmm. would that really solve the problem? There simply aren't units. Yeah. I mean, would it? Someone, it's not like we have 10% vacancy. I'm just curious how that really would do the trick. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can speak to the cost. Um, cost of construction are going up. Um, in the Bay Area, in, in San Jose in particular, um, it, it can easily cost, you know, $750,000 per unit of um, affordable housing. And so... Um, but but I think it's it the cost alone out of, you know seems tremendous. But then when you look at the cost of having folks who are unhoused um, on our human services systems, on our healthcare systems, on our um, public safety systems, um, it far outweighs the cost to build a unit. And then when we look at the tremendous wealth we're building, to Chris's point. Um, we know that um, we could certainly afford to build enough housing for everyone, and then um, to Gary's point, to help everyone stay housed and prevent displacement. So um, in context of all of the, the, the tremendous factors at play, um, 
you know, it really is something that, that we, we want to be committed to. And again, we see that, that, that it's, it's paying off in Santa Clara County. Yeah, I don't think just the benefit alone magically houses people, absolutely true. But without it, certain people will never be housed, regardless. So I would say, like, in the necessary but insufficient equations, we accept, you know, the other direction, but we almost never talk about the income benefit part. I, I also would say that there are a way to structure rental subsidies from the prior questions to package it, back it, which is what I meant by back, locally government backed, in a way to structure it to let people build off of it without additional construction subsidies. So I think there's a way to package, collateralize it, and securitize it to allow private development off those subsidies if you structure it appropriately. We're going to have to call it there. I want to thank our wonderful panelists. I think we're in contention for the best panel of the day. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to uh, all who participated in that panel. Great to see you. Uh, and we'll see you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we've got a uh, great second panel coming up. One thing that I wanted to mention, rumor has it that after the second panel, there will be box lunches available. We'll go out. We'll get our box lunches and probably come back in because next panel, let's say it ends 11.45, 11.48-ish. He did lunch keynote around 12, so anyway. And I should also mention, I'm not kind of probably supposed to say this, but there are restrooms on the second and third floor, so if after the next session you run to the restroom, there's a line, you go up, there's an elevator. Uh, so anyway, just mention that. might be helpful in an hour from now. Just trying to think ahead proactively. Our next session is going to be uh, equally interesting and informative, I think, and I'm pleased to moderate another one of my colleagues, uh, Rebecca Diamond. Uh, she will be moderating the session. Rebecca is the class of 1988 professor of economics at Stanford's Graduate School of Business, where she teaches data and decisions. Her current research studies the causes and consequences of segregation of households by income and education level across neighborhoods and labor markets. She was a postdoctoral fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, CEPR, right after she graduated from 2013 to 2014. So we at CEPR like to take credit for all of Rebecca's success. It's all because of her CEPR postdoc. Uh, she received her PhD in economics from Harvard in 2013 and her bachelor's in physics and economics and mathematics, physics and economics and mathematics from Yale in 2007. So smart uh, colleague that we're going to learn from. So Rebecca, I'm delighted to pass the baton to you. And I don't see, there she is. Okay, Rebecca, yeah. <laughs> You hear me? Yeah. So we're triple major. Economics and math is a hybrid single major, so a double major. But, uh, um, so yeah, I'm super excited to talk today um, with a number of experts on housing affordability and housing policy. Um, so we're going to have um, three amazing speakers. I'm going to introduce them now. They'll give you a brief spiel about um, some of their areas of expertise, and then we'll have some um, Q and A among us, and then Q and A amongst the audience. So um, first speaking, I'm going to go through everyone for the introductions first. We have Enrico Moretti. Um, he is the Michael uh, P.V. and Donald Vile Professor of Economics at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, his research covers the field of labor economics and urban economics. He has received several awards and honors, including the Society of Labor Economists Rosen Prize for Outstanding Contributions to Labor Economics. Um, his uh, new book, The Geography of Jobs, has been translated into eight languages and awarded the William Bowen Prize. Um, so he's one of my um, co-authors as well, so he has a lot of uh, uh, interesting things to say. We also have uh, Mia Kan, uh, Kang, uh, the Senior Vice President at Related Companies of California. Um, Mia is a leader in the complex fields of affordable housing, transit-oriented development, and smart growth. Uh, Kang has successfully developed multiple award-winning uh, TODs and infill developments that exemplify social responsibility and sustainable design. Um, her projects have been honored with national awards um, from the US EPA, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, the American Institute of Architects, uh, US Green Building Council, and the 2014 Governor's Environmental and Economic Leadership Award, um, California's highest environmental honor. Um, so she has a lot of perspective from the development side of, of building affordable housing. And we'll also have um, Jennifer Hernandez. Um, she has practiced land use and environmental law for more than 30 years and leads the Holland and Knight's 
West Coast Land Use and Environmental Group. Um, she was recognized as the top environmental litigator of the year in the San Francisco Bay Area um, by Best Lawyers and received a California Lawyer of the Year Award from the State Bar of California for her work on California's largest and most innovative land use conservation agreement between her private uh, landowner client and five major environmental organization. Uh, she graduated with honors from Harvard University and Stanford Law School, um, so Stanford can also take some credit there. Um, and they'll each have a very unique perspective. So we have the law perspective, the academic perspective, and the developer perspective, all of which we all want to figure out ways to get um, more affordable housing in California. So first up, we'll have um, Enrico. Thank you um, for having me. It's a great pleasure to be back at CEPR. I, I had two sabbatical years in my career and both at CEPR and they were tremendously productive and uh, stimulating, so I'm delighted to be back. Um, we live in a state and in a region that are very expensive in terms of housing. Uh, you can see here how expensive uh, we are relative to uh, the rest of the US. Uh, which, uh, so in, in, in gray, you see the median existing home price in, in the US uh, starting in the early 70s. Uh, in red, you see California. In yellow, the San Francisco condo. And in black, uh, San Francisco houses. And uh, it's truly remarkable how uh, distant we are from the rest of the country. Uh, the difference was not that large. Uh, relative to California, relative to the rest of the country. Yes, the region was more expensive, but the gap was not enormous. The gap has been growing ever since, and by the end of the period, which is before COVID, uh, the last year is 2017, but you know, before, uh, until 2020, the situation hasn't really changed very much. By the end of this period, um, you see a torrid growth in housing prices in uh, in San Francisco and in California, much faster than the rest of the country. This is probably not going to come as a shocking surprise to everybody. Um, the question is why? Fundamentally, mean price uh, increase in California and in the Bay Area because housing demand exceeds uh, housing supply. And this, is per this imbalance between demand and supply is particularly strong in the urban core, uh, for which I mean the built, uh, the built part of, of the region. So San Francisco, Oakland, but also the peninsula uh, all the way to, to San Jose. Um, the demand is strongest uh, in the urban core uh, because that's where the best jobs are located. Um, and so a lot of people uh, want to locate in, in this area. That's a good reason for having high housing prices is because there are, their labor demand is strong and the local economy has been growing um, uh, at a fast pace in the past decades. The bad reason is that supply is scarce and it's particularly scarce in the urban core. And it's scarce mostly due to self-imposed supply constraints that we as residents and as voters have decided to impose uh, on our community. Uh, the main constraints come from a slow and arbitrary entitlement process. It takes years for a developer to go from the phase where they buy a piece of land to the phase where they can pull a building permit. It takes, in some cases, decades, as my next two the next two speakers will attest with much more uh, direct knowledge uh, of the problem. Um, and it's not just that it takes a long time to get entitled, but there is, there is a huge amount of uncertainty on the length of this time. Uh, there is an endless appeal process that is particularly costly for developers because not only it takes long, but they don't know exactly how long it takes. Uh, and, and for them, there is a limited window of opportunity to build, which is the, the cycle. Uh, if, if there is uncertainty on when you can pull the trigger and you can start building, uh, that length of entitlement process becomes even more costly because it really reduces the supply of new housing units. The 
get built uh, in, in, in the long run. And there's a growing body of academic work that points to the cost, both the local cost and the aggregate cost that this process has for uh, uh, our region and our, and our state. Um, in, this, in this work, we uh, joined with a uh, colleague at Chicago, Chang Tai Shi. Uh, we study uh, both how these supply constraints raise rent and housing prices unnecessarily high in the Bay Area, uh, but also we also study the aggregate cost of, of these uh, of this supply constraints. And we estimate significant aggregate cost for the state uh, in reducing the supply of housing in the most productive part of the state, which would be the Bay Area, uh, uh, for example. So I think it's clear what the message that comes from the, uh, and this is just one of the many papers that has been written on, uh, on the subject. I think it's clear that uh, it would be in the interest of us as a region and us as a state to increase the supply of housing, especially uh, in where the demand of housing is strongest, meaning, uh, meaning the, the, the urban core. There are essentially two models of increasing the supply of housing. Uh, one, you might call it uh, the Austin model, um, which is essentially no constraint to supply. <laughs> in Austin, uh, which is a, another area where demand for labor has been increasing very fast, thanks to a, a, a high-tech boom similar to our. Um, in Austin, the, the, Austin has decided to impose very little constraints, both in the urban core and in the periphery of the region. And so essentially, houses get built uh, at a fast pace. Every time there is demand, they get built. Housing prices have increased in Austin, not as much as in the Bay Area. On the other hand, this unfeathered model has also generated a lot of congestion and a lot of consumption of, of, of environmental amenities. The other model, you can call it the Seattle model, is a model that tends to, that seeks to um, concentrate development in the urban core and associate development with increasing public transportation in order to mitigate the, the externalities. I think um, in the Bay Area, um, we have chosen neither model. We, we are really constraining the, the, the biggest battles for, for, for against, uh, against housing are in the urban core, where the demand is strongest, and where we build the least relative to, to demand. And so as a consequence, some of those units get built that should have gone in downtown San Francisco, should have gone in downtown Palo Alto, should have gone in downtown San Jose, should have gone in, in Oakland, that gets moved to the outskirts of the region, the, the exurbs, uh, the Central Valley, uh, and even further out. Uh, and I think this is costly in a different way. It's costly in terms of negative externality that this process is imposing. First, there is congestion and traffic. Uh, second, and equally dramatic, is the loss of green space. Every time we, we, we don't build a unit in downtown San Francisco, essentially that unit gets built on green, on, on green land. And I think that's that reduces the environmental amenities of our region. Uh, third, there is the carbon footprint, which is much larger uh, when you move a unit from downtown San Francisco to the outskirts. Let me give you the sense of the magnitude here. Here in this map, I'm plotting annual tons of CO2 uh, from residential energy use per household in different parts of the Bay Area. This is San Francisco, this is Oakland, this is the, the outer part of the, of, of, of the East Bay, and that up there is marine. This, this comes from a study uh, by a former uh, student at Berkeley named Eva Lubich, who uh, just received her PhD this year. Um, and what you can see are enormous differences in CO2 uh, 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 footprint, uh, depending on where you build. Uh, the, look at the scale of the differences. In downtown San Francisco, the dark blue, um, we're talking about annual tons, two annual tons of CO2 per household. Look at the outer part of the East Bay. We're talking about 16 tons of CO2, so eight times higher. What it means is that every time we fight housing units down here, we're essentially 
pushing those units out there, and we're essentially increasing not just traffic, not just congestion, not just uh, consumption of greenfield, but also CO we're increasing our CO2 impact. Um, and then for the units that get built even further out, uh, we're even talking about other uh, additional costs, like you know, for the units that get built uh, in, in, you know, close to the hills uh, or close to the mountains, there's also the additional wildfire risk. Um, so I, I think that in, in, in this region, we're facing a very uh, uh, ironic uh, uh, set of self-imposed political constraints. Uh, a lot of the uh, appeals that I was referring to are, uh, as, as Jennifer will, will illustrate much better and with much more uh, direct knowledge of the problem, are based on CEQA, uh, the California Environmental Quality Act, which was passed in order to maintain and preserve our environment, but is often abused by local uh, NIMBYs in the urban core to fight urban development in the urban core. Well, ironically, those actions, those politically motivated battles against development in the urban core end up hurting uh, both the, uh, our environment but also the global, the global environment. So I think in the Bay Area, we, we should be start looking at the experience of other cities. Um, and I'm not advocating for the Austin model, which is a model of unfettered development where essentially you build everywhere, both in the urban core and, and in the outskirts, because I think that model of development is too costly in terms of externalities. I'm advocating for the Seattle model, where you try to develop within the current envelope of uh, existing development. You densify areas that are near transit, uh, areas that are like this one right here, that still have plenty on, uh, of unused parking lots, undeveloped uh, lots or like one-story buildings that are zoned uh, not to grow. And uh, I, I think that's where we should be focusing our, our, uh, uh, our push for more supply. Because in, in that way, we could start reducing the housing costs without increasing the costly externalities. Thank you. Great. Next up, we have uh, Mia. If you just advance it forward one. Good morning. I'm going to bring us to a different perspective. Let's see. Are we? I keep going. Are we here? No. One more. All right. So I'm a housing developer. I've been developing affordable housing in California for the last 24 years. I've built about 2,500 units of affordable housing in this state, both new construction as well as acquisition rehab. Um, I currently work at Re uh, Related California, one of the largest private developers of affordable housing in the state. But prior to that, I started my own company called Domus Development, where I you know, battled it out in places like Lake Tahoe. And so Lake Tahoe was one of these pristine areas. Many of you, I'm sure, have a house up there, go up there regularly to ski or to bike. And it's one of these areas that also has a housing problem, partly because there is a service industry this is moving faster than I do this, uh, that, that, uh, that folks are earning minimum wages. And because they can't find housing in places like Lake Tahoe, because there's very constricted regulatory environments, they often commute to Reno. They, they, they can buy a home in Reno for a lot less than they can buy a home in Tahoe. They can rent a home. It's about 100 to 150 miles round trip to go to work. And oftentimes, people earn um, enough wages to live in, in, in Nevada if you have two or three jobs. Uh, so talk about CO2, and then oftentimes, too, you don't even have, uh, bus drivers cannot find housing in the area, and neither can snowplow drivers. So you can imagine the effect of your emergency service workers who are living in Reno when you've got catastrophes, like whether it's wildfires or you've got snow, and you know, so you can't function service-wise. So I was brought up to Tahoe, uh, a place called Kings Beach, which is uh, North Lake Tahoe. Many of you might know it. It's in the basin. Uh, this is Kings Beach in about 1997. Uh, and I was brought to this town because it was a redevelopment area when we had redevelopment back in the day. And zero affordable housing had ever been built in the basin in Lake Tahoe, zero. Partly because in 1989, 
uh, we had something called the Tahoe Regional Planning Authority, which sole purpose was to curb development and to create development commodities to make it vastly difficult to build anything but, frankly, beautiful single family cabins. So, but if you were in the workforce, you lived here. You lived this, but these are the sites I bought. I ended up buying six different sites. I showed them over there on the map. Uh, these were the sites. There were mobile homes and they were cabins. Cabins from the 1940s and 50s. And we had, as this cabin would show, five people living in 260 square feet. There were mattresses, two mattresses on every wall because you took turns sleeping on the floor at night. Uh, you see trash bags and, uh, and laundry baskets. There was no closets. There were no hamper spaces. There were no, so those are actually how people stored their food and their clothing. And oftentimes you had unrelated adults living together. In, in the trailers, they were there from the 1940s. HCD, our state, monitors all trailers in the state, not your local jurisdiction. So these buildings had often uh, tarps over them. So if it snowed too much, the tarps would actually shed some of the snow so the snow actually wouldn't collapse it like a tin can. And up to 35 people were once counted living in one of these trailers, in submarine style, and you took turns sleeping at night. So you were tapped out at three in the morning if your three hours in bed were up. That is how people got to live here. And no one actually knew about this. This is the immigrant population. So the vast majority of the folks living here, it's hot red. It is the lowest income, most poor area in all of Placer County. And it's right next to Incline. Do folks know Incline? <laughs> so ironies, right? So what we were going to do, we said, let's try to build infill affordable housing for the first time ever. But it was wrought with challenges. So we had to break every single rule in the book. When we started, you can only build seven units to the acre and two units per sub uh, per piece of land. And this whole area was a uh, designed as a trailer park. And, night, and so this was actually one of the oldest urbanized areas around the lake, but there was hunting and fishing camps. And so we took all these different parcels and we came up with a prototype that met every single constricted, hard design. We had two regulatory agencies. We had TRPA and Placer County. But we had to rewrite code. We had 12, we had six sites. I had to do 12 different entitlement processes for six sites for a total of 77 apartments. We interviewed people. No one had actually interviewed the folks who lived here. We found out that in some cases, people were spending 100% of their income on housing. We're like, how do people get by? Well, it turns out there was a whole shadow industry of a barter community in, in Kings Beach. And so if you were a fisherman and you can buy and you went and you had a, a 10 pound salmon, you slice that thing up and you got childcare, you got a haircut, and you were able to pay someone to share something, right? There was a whole system that people created because no one cared for the folks who actually served us in our hotels, who served us, who made Tahoe work as a resort destination. But it was death by 3,000 razor blade cuts. There was nothing, every single code didn't work. And I tell folks, I've never met a plan. I haven't had to change. Because we spent a lot of time planning, spot, spot a lot of money planning all these plans, and they sit on shelves. And so when it actually comes to building something, nothing can be done. So we went in there, it was, well, I had a machete in one hand and an attitude with the other, right? So we made it happen. So every single one of these was built, we broke every single rule, we had public hearings, I had someone who threatened to, to chain herself to a tree so we couldn't cut down the tree, uh, but we got it approved for the highest density ever approved in Lake Tahoe at 30 units to the acre. We also got the tallest buildings ever approved. At the, at the minimum, you could do two stories, not three. We not only did three stories, we also got the first four-story building legally ever approved in Lake Tahoe. So by breaking every single rule in the book, we won all the awards. <laughs> we won that GIA award. We won national recognition for doing the right thing. All these sites are next to transit. They're a five-minute walk to every bus. The bus only comes once an hour. But then we said, you know what, let's survey folks, because we had to ask for parking reductions. You know, parking's one of those damn things that actually prevents housing, because we care more about our cars, we care more about housing our cars for free than housing our people who work in our communities, right? And so it made me so mad that I decided to spend a lot of my time in the legislature. And I founded a group called the, Cal the Council of Infill Builders, and then we started advocating for infill housing and trying to show people why all these policies we have and all these regulations we have actually don't lead to the result that we want, which is housing. So that took me five years of rigorous entitlement process to get it through. We were able to get funding when the, the market collapsed, the redevelopment agencies were collapsing, and we got this built. But I said, never again. It is so hard to do.
So let's bring us to today. So this is 2000, so now I work for Related California and we won through my efforts and because of I did the work in, at uh, Kings Beach, the state executive order, 2019, Governor Newsom came into office and he said, okay, we're gonna take all of our state surplus land and let's build some housing, let's prioritize housing. And within two years, we wanna see some housing happen. So one of the very prime sites that the state had was 11 acres at the Y in South Lake Tahoe. Folks know the why, probably in South Lake Tahoe, right? So this was nothing but trees. It's only been ever logged. And it's 11 acres of prime development land. We got it approved using SB 35 in 90 days. It's the largest single development of any size in Lake Tahoe approved ever in the history of Tahoe. It, it was 248 units of affordable housing. We were also able to get a child care, which was lacking in the area, as well as social services, and the nonprofits are displaced because they can't afford any, to, to afford any rent. So we're able to, we designed the whole thing, and oh, by the way, all this was on Zoom. This is all during COVID. <laughs> so I had a series of meetings working with every single nonprofit group, every single business group, to get them to say yes to housing. We used SB 35 only because the city of South Lake Tahoe was an urbanized area. Outside of that, we could never use it. So the tools that are given to us as developers are so limited. It's like you have to pass through the eye of the needle to get the incentives to work because not every place is allowed, not every place in San Francisco where you can kind of, or LA where you can write all these rules and it all just works because we just decide that we're gonna put every single low income person in every single metro area period and forget about the problem. But guess what? We have low income people, we have workforce, we have existing communities all over the state and there's incredible infill opportunities all over the state and there's a lot of opportunities to do the right thing only if you can get your public, local officials aligned as well as resources, as well as removing the barriers. So I became a barrier buster because I'm just so damn angry. <laughs> so to be, we made heads turn to get a project of this scope and size approved in three months was nothing but a miracle. Uh, and because there was a will. So what we were able to do also is again, take that prototype. So each one of these sort of rectangular buildings are 30 units a piece. And we decided to, because it's Tahoe, Tahoe also has a challenge of snow, and we have a nine-month building cycle from May to October. That's it. You can't move Earth after that. Yes, if you've done your foundation, you can go up, but that's it. So what this does is it allows us to phase the project and allows us to build it in the factory. We're working with the Vallejo Factory OS to get our modules built, sent on trucks, so they're gonna be stacked in the seasons. And once completed, it will look something like this. They're three-story townhomes, they're walk-ups, no elevators. Um, we also have all these public trails that allow people to connect through the property. We have the social services, we have the childcare. All of this will start to come out of the ground if all goes well starting next month. This is our community building that's gonna host all kinds of activities, not only for the residents, but also for the community. It absolutely changes the character. And again, this was nothing but trees prior to the land. Um, and let me tell you about trees and how challenging it is to cut down a tree in Tahoe. <laughs> That's another thing I'll tell you about, but this also happened, and what's interesting too, we think about wildfire, and they're like, oh, you can't build where there are trees. Well, yes, you can, because people have been thinking about this. So Tahoe has had a number of fires over the years, and so I was working very closely with the city last year when we had our big fire in South Lake Tahoe that went up the hill, and there was a giant granite cap that no one thought any the fire would ever come up close to, but it did, but because the last 10 years, TRPA and all of their partners in the forestry, they had been trimming trees. They were able to create these lines to fight the fire, to divert the fire away from the city. It was almost like those old fortress days where you have people climbing over the wall and you're like dousing them with hot oil and water. I mean, that's kind of what they did. And they were able to move the fire to protect the city and to protect all the valuable assets of homes up there. So it can be done if we're strategic. It is also about making sure that we're building where there's existing infrastructure, where there is existing people, where there are existing communities so you can band together to protect your own communities. Let me take you to another example. Uh, related in, in my work up in Tahoe, we were selected in 2019 in Tahoe City. Very different area than South Lake Tahoe. This area is rural. Nothing could be used. Zero, no tools, no, no incentives, no SB 35, no sequest streamlining, nothing. We are still trying to work on a site plan. We have been threatened so many times by all of our neighbors that they're gonna sue us because they walk their dogs here. 
And these folks who are second homeowners who spend less than 15 days a year are telling us they don't know anyone who needs affordable housing. And I was, frankly, the darkest person in the room when everyone told me that. And, the, and, and these folks are all older, and they feel entitled. And they said, hey, I bought my own home. Why do government have to come in here and ruin our neighborhoods, right? So when you have uninformed folks who get the power of no, who get the power of a lawsuit, who, who are all lawyers themselves, because the median home price around us was $2 million at the time. And they're saying, hell no to housing, because it's going to ruin my property values. It's going to ruin my view. I had people exploding in tears because they thought their children would burn in the high school because our folks would be able to get out and clog up the roads before someone else would. And so these are the kinds of demons that we fight with. And these are the kinds of ideas, because change is scary. When you go to a community that hasn't seen change in a number of years, people don't want to change. They don't want to say yes to housing, because yes to housing means more different people will move into their communities. And that can get scary. So barriers to affordable housing, simply put, things like high land costs. We've got things like community resistance, AKA NIMBYs, right? We've got, lack, we've got political leaders that change every four years. They're gone. Someone who's going to champion your project, you hear it takes, it takes years and years and years to put these projects together. When a new person comes in, they can completely unwind every bit of progress that's been done in the administration before. We have entitlements. We've all been hearing about it. You know, we only have, we have limited tools and limited areas to be limited to certain projects that have every single stripe of every zebra that could be imaginable, can only get awarded projects. We have environmental challenges like CEQA, like dirty land, and we have things like very high cost of impact fees. And let me tell you, places like in Tahoe, it is so darn expensive to get what, what we call accommodations. It is cheaper and easier to build a house that is fifth, has 15 bedrooms than to build 15 units. It's a heck of a lot cheaper, and the system is set up for that. And that is what they're building up in Tahoe right now. Because those are all then rented out individually. Uh, by the time, so any one of these is going to kick you out. If you can't get over that hump, all that money, time, and investment, you are out. You are dead. Your project, there is risk, risk, risk. And then you've got things like financing. Talk about, so we look at, we look at our budgets, right? We've been talking about this $97 billion budget. We've got our state legislators who are going to just throw another billion dollars into the state program. Well, let me tell you how hard it is to get funding as an affordable housing project. It often takes you multiple cycles. It can take you 12 sources of financing, each one you're competing for. And, and then it becomes political. So the, the uncertainty of getting a project built that might have every great flavor of ice cream in it, you're never going to get it because somehow someone's going to tell you, well, why didn't you have pistachio? Sorry, no money for you. Um, anyway, by the time you can pass all that, you can get your project started. So good things come to those that wait. So a project last week, we just opened up. This was when I was with my company, Domus. A project in Pittsburgh, California, an area that I have spent a lot of my career building housing in. The tiny piece of land that I started with the city manager 13 years ago. That was three presidents ago. That was after redevelopment. That was after we had three city managers. It died so many deaths. We had to redesign it so many times. The first time we took this, it was always going to be veterans housing. We wanted to make it veterans housing. The neighbors came unglued. They imagined all kinds of things in their heads, what kinds of neighbors they would have, how many guns they would have. So they said, for veterans housing that was going to be supportive housing for formerly homeless, you have to have two parking spaces per unit. So that almost killed us. We ended up having to come up with very creative ways to park it and put the parking underneath it to the cost that was so expensive that you couldn't get it built. We couldn't attract the financing because we were just outside of the perfect circles of transit. You know, we have things like only housing can be, uh, can be uh, funded if you're within a half mile of perfect transit. So what happens if you're across the street from that half mile? You don't get anything. And I mean, how much of the real estate in this country, too, is, is, is round, right? So then that means sometimes you have a parcel in, and sometimes you have a parcel that's out, or portion in and out. Anyway, we have these crazy rules, but fortunately, we stuck with it, and we opened 30 units of 100% homeless housing. It had no place like home funding, VASH vouchers, and we moved individuals and their families off the streets and into this housing. So it can be done, but there's a long way to go. Thanks. Okay, next up, we have Jennifer Hernandez.
So you don't close with a lawyer and expect inspiration. I'm just starting with that. Um, also, I want to really take up, Mark, your challenge uh, to try to connect some dots here. You talked about policy and academic. Then there's practitioners. And we hate both of you, <laughs> actually, <laughs> for reasons uh, that uh, Mia went through in detail. Um, uh, and, and I'm going to be really super provocative in this commentary. Because right now, what was it, 1.3, 1.4 billion dollars that Door donated to sustainability? Who in this room is part of that? Because they have all kinds of fixed views about housing that are the perfection that makes sure we don't build anything. And the siloing of specialties and the siloing of policy making. I mean, even the Pentagon figured out that the more specialized people are, the more unable they are to predict with any level of accuracy what's happening in the real world. Because you stay in silos and you don't talk to people who are living in 35 person trailers. You don't talk to the million illegal immigrants, undocumented immigrants, who rushed to get driver's licenses so they could hold on to a job and get the kids to school on time because the bus took four hours if it came at all. You're not talking to people. You're certainly not in the trenches of trying to get anything done. And if we could talk a little bit more, and I really applaud you for bringing practitioners to this setting, but right now, our number one barrier from my perspective is a level of environmental and climate dogma that is just flat wrong. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. I spend uh, a tremendous amount of time and have made a tremendous amount of money, and my license plate in the Tesla outside is Sequa nerd. So I'm going to talk about Sequa, and then I'm going to talk about climate. Um, so Sequa, where is this? Am I one behind? I don't know. I'm a 62-year-old boomer. You should not trust me with technology. <laughs> All right. Um, this, these are the two things I'm most proud of right now. I'm actually teaching environmental justice at USC Law School, and we're teaching. I'm teaching it with a, a former state senator, Martha Escucha, and it's like EJ our way. Remember civil rights, right? It didn't used to be just environmental. It's obviously environment and civil rights. And the civil rights piece of the dialogue has fallen off. So another provocative, irritating thing that I will say. And I'll continue on this theme. So uh, California Environmental Quality Act, 1970, Reagan, Nixon, leaders. Um, unlike any other, quote, law in the country, uh, anyone can sue for any reason. Right now, I'm defending a pistachio processor from a lawsuit filed by his much bigger competitor who wants to stop this guy, a farmer, from building more silos and replacing an inefficient huller line for nuts with a more energy and water efficient huller line. It's been the fourth year now of litigation, and we're in appellate court. Anybody can sue for any reason. It's really cheap, less than 25K, sometimes less than 10, because there's a contingency field component in CEQA where if the opponent of the project wins, they get paid attorney's fees and a bonus. How exciting. How exciting. There are no clear rules. Imagine getting a 100-question essay exam and having to do 100% right answers. We have judges who have said, yeah, 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 but you know, you should have counted traffic at that intersection on a different day, four years after the fact, a judge will say that San Francisco case. So because you screwed up CEQA, and CEQA is so important to protect the environment, you start over. Wait a minute, we start over? Can't we just count it now? I mean, I'm sure it's going to be the same. No, no, no. Rescission of the project approval is the most common remedy under CEQA, even for minor I mean minor, second guessing, 
by typically a judge, right? A very overconfident lawyer, a little irritating, usually over 60, always a humanities major, who says, yeah, but couldn't you like have done this instead? And the answer is you could always do this instead, right? We're trained to ask questions that haven't been answered because that's how we can kind of maneuver. So judges can always find something. And they love these cases because otherwise they're dealing with like custody disputes or whatever. And it's, these are fun. They get to be like mini planning commissioners. All impacts are equal. Temporary construction noise, a change from the view from the sidewalk, are as important as climate change or tribal resources. 1970, a very flat world, apparently. I wasn't all that sentient. I think I was reading Whole Earth Access or something. Um, there's no project too small under CEQA. CEQA was supposed to be like the National Environmental Policy Act, which is the forerunner, 1969, applied to major federal actions. And when you think about the fact that the feds don't get involved in most land use decisions, and even when they do get involved, it's only if it's a, quote, major action, NEPA applied to a pretty small subset of stuff in this land use housing arena. In contrast, CEQA applies, I can tell you from personal experience, to the replacement of our windows with double-paned windows in Berkeley. Wait, why? That was a $600 fee for an initial study to replace windows. What was that about? And it turns out we couldn't replace the window in our son's bedroom because it was too close to the house next door. I'm like, what are you doing, you people? These are genius rules created by genius people. No, they're good, solid, best effort rules that then get implemented by lawyers looking to achieve an objective on behalf of a client, which is too often stopping housing. And so we have a very perverted enforcement system under CEQA where common sense is sometimes recognized. And if you want an inspirational case, I refer you to a case in Tiburon that was just decided by the first appellate district on Thursday, which quoted me extensively, so I'm quite fond of it. <laughs> um, because there's a risk that's not insignificant that a court decision will undo your project approval, what do I mean by that? A completed high-rise tower in LA lost a late-breaking CEQA lawsuit and was ordered evacuated because it lost its certificate of occupancy, because it lost its insurance, because it was in violation of every covenant known to man. And for years, it sat vacant while someone screwed around. I won't even tell you the details because it's ridiculous, but it's the old spaghetti factory site. And the only thing old about it was the name. Uh, so I've done a lot of now empirical research on CEQA because I realized I couldn't win these cases anymore defending project by project. I had to sort of, what is really going on here? What's really going on here is actually beyond shocking. It's actually more worthy of like deep Dixie 1963. And in fact, we are now residentially more segregated than we were in 1963, which is shocking. So this is a slide showing where CEQA, housing is the top target of CEQA lawsuits. Infill housing is the top target of CEQA lawsuits. Multifamily housing is the top target of CEQA lawsuits. And CEQA lawsuits are overwhelmingly filed in whiter, wealthier, and healthier neighborhoods. If there's a better construct for what constitutes housing discrimination, than CEQA lawsuits, I don't know what it is. This slide shows uh, heights uh, corresponding to the number of units, so anything that's not a flat square is uh, multifamily. And then uh, uh, the aqua color, or green, whatever it looks like now, is uh, transit proximate, the half mile between perfect transit. Perfect transit is transit at 15 minute intervals. So when we qualify with a project, for perfect transit, I have an associate who checks the monthly schedule of the bus line to make sure they don't cut back to one fewer bus in an era of COVID when no one is riding the bus. And in fact, even before COVID, bus ridership had dropped massively. 
this is not a housing policy. This is a climate policy. And I'll tell you why in a second. But the biggest challenges, you could see the west side had most of the challenges, CEQA housing, almost uh, over, over 10,000 units challenged over a three year period in the south coast region. Uh, and most of those were multifamily and virtually all of them were infill. The tan colored areas are disadvantaged communities where there's higher levels of poverty, ethnicity, uh, pollution. You can see that most of the lawsuits are filed in wider, wealthier areas. This is what we've done. And I have to blame my home city of San Francisco where I was born and immediately transported to Pittsburgh. Thanks very much for the housing project. I was allowed to, I think, go back to see Godspell when I was in Catholic school, maybe seven or eight or something. But I grew up in, in Pittsburgh. And we used to talk about, with total contempt, my working class family, the idiots from San Francisco. And it didn't really matter what the issue was, because they were uniformly idiots when it came to working class issues. They were. What we have done, per The Color of Law, Richard Rothstein's fabulous book, Good Guy, Good Friend, is displace communities of color, purple loss areas, to exurbs, including Pittsburgh, because that's where housing is affordable. This smart growth policy that our dainty San Franciscan and Berkeley and Stanford academics, planners, environmentalists, ooh, urban limit lines, ooh, neighborhood preservation, ooh, shade and shadow as impacts have created a racial exodus, have destroyed legacy communities with gentrification that managed to survive, improbably enough, redlining and uh, urban renewal, which has a different and less polite name. So that's CEQA. When you're that wrongheaded, one thing that specialists can be counted on doing is doubling down and making it worse. And so here we are now in a climate emergency. Got it. No dispute. Here's California, less than 1% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Governor Brown says, unless we do this in a reasonable enough way, our efforts are going to be futile because no one will follow our lead. So what is our climate focus? Well, first off, we got to really tackle housing. Californians have the lowest per capita greenhouse gas emissions in the state. We should be inviting people, if we cared about global warming, we should be inviting people from hotter states or colder states or cold-powered states to come here. Instead, we only count emissions Oh, sorry about that. What's missing is fraudulent climate math. The first slide, we've lost 7.5 million Californians overwhelmingly because of housing costs over the last few years. We've gained about 5 million and change. But those 7.5 million housing cost losses, 100% moved to states where their families' greenhouse gas emissions went up. By not solving California housing crisis, we are making more greenhouse gas emissions. We also don't count the California Air Resources Board imports. So when the, uh, what is it, Lehigh cement factory here, uh, when it supplies cement, everyone goes, oh, greenhouse gas cement, oh, huge source, oh, gotta retrofit, gotta do all kinds, oh, when we import cement from China, which is made on a coal grid and transported thousands of miles by bunker fuel, zero greenhouse gas. Zero. If there is a more perfect way to outsource what few jobs are still available to people who don't have fancy degrees, then California's climate math, I don't know what they are. Grow a tomato, fine. Make salsa, oh, natural gas. Take the tomatoes to Nevada, natural gas. Oh, thank God, 
GHG free salsa. Why have you let these people get away with this? They admitted years ago that this was a, quote, flawed methodology. Tuesday of last week, they said, yeah, but we're going to keep using it. Where are you? Housing policy people, academic people, economists, where are you on climate? You're missing. You're like, it's their issue. No, it's not. They have come in with climate. OK, so fine. I'm going to skip a little bit. Low, low VMT, let's put more housing in the urban core where there's transit. This is Long Beach. This is the map created by the South Coast Association of Government to lower greenhouse gas in Long Beach. We had to ferret it out with a Public Records Act request. The slides, is very hard to see, sorry. All those green dots there in the middle is where new housing should be. There's a train uh, uh, and a metro train and, and buses there. All the red areas are where there should be no housing. Because within this city, there are high VMT areas, people drive, and low VMT areas, people don't drive as much, especially on a per capita basis. This is the redlining map. The red areas are whites only. They have nicer homes, parks, little need for transit, lower density. Let's preserve their environment. The areas that SCAG wants no housing are 100 plus thousand dollar medium household incomes. The areas SCAG wants all housing, the poorest Hmong population outside of Fresno in California. Overwhelmingly brown poor areas are where there's low per capita VMT. Lots of reasons why. They didn't have the resources to fight transit. They're actually not using transit. Terrific work by both USC and UCLA on the drop in transit, especially among low-income commuters who pre-COVID could buy a $3,000 completely indestructible Toyota and get to where they need to go in half or one-eighth the time it would take to take the bus if there was a bus. But is anyone talking to them in this low VMT criteria? Is anyone looking at redlining maps from two years ago, created by the consulting firm run by the head of the regents until March of UC? We are creating today the template for more, not less, racial redlining, displacement, gentrification, and Last point, we, we don't know how to build housing that's more expensive than high density in urban cores. I mean, maybe like 15 room mansions, but on a per square foot basis, a steel tower with cement costs five to seven times more to build than a wood framed of any kind almost unit. Without the elevators, without all the fancy HVAC systems, are, are we paying attention to that? No. We're looking at residential use within the unit of energy. Does that study even include common area emissions? I don't think so. Did it include the building materials for that kind of structure on a per resident? No, of course not, because that's like cement from China. We don't care, as long as it's not made in California. We are prescribing a solution for housing that is completely unaffordable. Californians make more money than the rest of the country. But our annual median income, cowboy math, is about a tenth of our purchase price for a median income home. We just can't do that math anymore, guys. It's economics. Everyone, oh, wages are low. No, we get paid more than the rest of the country. We have policies, including putting 150 $1,000 fees on each unit and expect somehow to have, quote, affordable units. Come on. There is way too much brain power in this room for you to let this persist, but you've got to blow up more than your own little boxes. It's not a question of showering some people with more money and hoping for the best, right? Anybody have an addict in the family? What happens when you give them a room key? 
and hope for the best. How does that work for you? One thing we do know, when the state wants to get something done, like homeless shelters, first thing they need is a CEQA exemption. So we did that. Oh, thank God. Uh, we don't really want to get uh, housing built. Because actually, if only we can get rid of about 10 million people from California, we'd meet our climate goals. Yay! So come on. And I'll finish with transportation. The graph on the right is from the Obama administration in 2016 and shows a decrease, the solid line, in smog forming emissions from tailpipes from the nation's vehicles, cars and light duty trucks, pickup trucks. We got rid of 99% of the smog. We didn't know how we were going to do it. Who knew from catalytic converters? We didn't think you could even remove lead from gas. It took a lot of work. We screwed up sometimes. But we got rid of 98% of tailpipe emissions. We're going to electric vehicles. At the same time as population and economic success increased, our vehicle miles traveled increased. Those are the bars on, uh, on this chart. We can solve for greenhouse gas. We can solve for climate. But solving for climate on the backs of working people who will never be able to buy a home in California, where we actually still earn more than the rest of the country, is absolutely a nice continuum of eugenicism, forced racial segregation. Population bomb, oh, those teeming brown people in Bombay. Oh, if only they wouldn't be there. You guys, we're at a really, really, really dangerous time in the country. We got to make home ownership an achievable objective for Californians today at about a $400,000 price point. We can build it, build it all over the country. But in California, it's impossible based on Sorry, pointy-headed academics and policymakers. Pittsburgh, California. I'm very rough. Bye. <laughs>
development, right? So putting in new sewers, putting in new, um, you know, whatever needs to happen when you've got a parking lot and now you're going to put 100 units on it, right? So CEQA enables the jurisdictions to say, mitigation, you must provide this, you must upsize this, you must do all these things. So in many cases, the first person in an infill area, the first developer goes in, they have to fix 65 years worth of problems. Although cities do have the authority to impose those as conditions of approval yes. outside CEQA. But everybody's gotten lazy and put everything in CEQA. So it becomes a convenience. So not only is it, you know, it, CEQA is a trading tool. It makes everyone come to the table and it makes everyone cut a deal. By cutting a deal, you've just done what? You've made it more difficult, more expensive to get the housing. And then it's vastly much easier, especially in a commercial zone, to build a McDonald's with a drive through than it is to build like three, the three-story mixed-use development. Oh, big time. So it really, it's become a tool to say no. And so, you know, even if, a, you know, in the site I showed you that, that hasn't been built as a 15 units to the acre, you go through all the general plan zoning to get your zoning approved, but yet you still have to go through yet another series of project level CEQA. So if we, as, as, as uh, Jennifer talked about, if you just did it once and said, if your zoning is 15 units to the acre, let's say, or multifamily zoning, that's all you need. As long as you meet your similar to SB 35, you know, your, your local sort of, uh, uh, what is it, prescriptive zoning? No, what are they called? Objective standards. Thank you, objective standards, which means height and bulk of the buildings, et cetera. Then you're ready to go. Then we'll get more housing built because there's certainty. Because again, the McDonald's developer knows that certainly he can build that fast food restaurant and make so much money. It's the difference between housing based on the rule of law what are the laws? I have to color inside those lines versus the old obscenity standard under CEQA. I know an impact when I see it, and I don't like this one. Uh, so that's, you know, we're not going to negotiate our way to three, three million units, uh, unit by unit uh, under CEQA. Great. Um, maybe just to switch gears a bit and think about sort of COVID reshaping where labor is going and how that affects housing demand, how is work from home, or the shift toward increasing work from home, interacting with where people want to build and are able to build going forward? Let me just say, has anyone heard Zoom Towns? Tahoe was called a Zoom Town. Truckee's median home price is now a million dollars per unit. So what it's enabled people to do is, of course, remote work, but choose where they live and buy in places that were at the time, you know, from, from San Francisco, you can actually see trees, have an outdoor space, and, and, and afford a home. So, so it's changing um, the land use and costs. So Caltrans and SCAG um, formed a broadband transportation study group, which I'm part of. You know, like broadband transportation. Broadband avoids trips. And we now have data even from rural areas and from lower income workers who have to be physically present to be paid. So they don't have the keyboard economy option of uh, staying at home. They have to go in. But everyone, everyone, is using the internet when they have service to make fewer trips. Uh, so they're banking online or they're doing remote uh, 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 training uh, with you know, YouTube and getting the certificates and whatever. Um, they're doing telemed uh, and they've changed shifts so that no one's doing peak hour commute trips five days a week. Uh, uh, almost no one. Uh, um, and I asked the question, which was very politically inconvenient, which I love to do, which is, so what's the cost of bringing high quality broadband service to all of these households versus the cost of putting everyone on a grid of fixed route public transit systems using 100 plus year old technology at half mile interval, you know, 15 minute headways? And no one wanted to answer that question. Um, AI is going to further um, uh, change you know, um, commute patterns. Once you no longer have to pay attention on the road, then the commutes are likely to become longer. Um, Enrico and I have, I think, a, a healthy uh, area of agreement, which is it's cool to live in cities. And for a lot of us, it's the right thing to do for at least part of our life. Um, uh, where I come in as a strong disagreement is it doesn't work for everybody and it doesn't work, for example, for lots of families. And it is very disrespectful to impose that as a one-size-fits-all solution. High-density infill rentals 
are not, are not an acceptable path forward for many people in California. You go tell your cousins they'll never buy a house. Really, how's that gonna go? They're gonna move to Texas where their greenhouse gas will increase. Uh, in, in thinking about the question of remote work and work from home on the impact of housing demand in different parts of the state, I think it's important to distinguish between the immediate effect of COVID in the past two years, in particular during 2020 when everything was shut down and people were, 100% of office workers were remote and uh, some of the lucky were working in Tao from the future uh, uh, after the pandemic is over and after we feel safe around each other and after there's enough transition period. And I think in that respect, uh, it's not clear that the number of people working 100% remote is gonna be as high as a lot of the media accounts are describing. I've been doing some work looking at the number, looking at job openings, so new jobs that are created that are 100% remote, and seeing where they are, how many there are, and how they have changed. And what I'm finding is the numbers are much smaller than what you might expect from hearing anecdotes or reading the media. Before COVID, uh, for the past, you know, for the 10 years before COVID, essentially, 2% of all office jobs were under percent remote. Uh, with COVID, um, that share triples, essentially, in most cities, including the San Francisco Bay Area. But even, after, even now, we're talking about 6% of new jobs uh, being under percent remote. So 6% of new office jobs being under percent remote, which is more than before, but it's still a trivial number of office jobs. So I think that in thinking about the future and in thinking about how work from home might change the demand for housing and the cost of housing, it's, I think it's implausible to think that most people, most office workers will have the option of working somewhere else and reporting to an office that is, that is here. I think there will be, we remain the, the, the small exception. I have a very different perspective. Um, and the data I have is not the 100% remote, which I don't know too many people are trying to do. But if you go to the hybrid model, two or three days uh, in the office, or even a set, a set amount of time a month in the office just to get reconnected, now the numbers zoom up. Pre-COVID, more people were working from home in the SCAG region than taking public transit. Pre-COVID. So the work from home phenomenon is very real. And it has, by the way, a ton of benefits in terms of like more time with your family and ability to maybe get a workout in instead of spending three hours a day in, uh, uh, in a car. I mean, again, if we could build $400,000 for sale units in San Francisco, life would be interesting. But instead, those people are, are buying in the Central Valley and they're spending now four hours a day on commutes. They're not doing that, by the way. If you talk to them, they've figured out some workarounds, right? They're sleeping in a friend's couch. The construction workers, got, you know, those guys sleep in their pickup trucks a couple times a week. So we do not have an understanding that is accurate. We have a lot of academic um, views in support of urbanization, well, even wildfire. I mean... <laughs> We've been protecting Californians against wildfire for a long time. Santa Rosa caught fire, my God. The fire jumped the Sacramento River in, uh, in uh, Sassoon Bay, my God. But new homes, new communities, those are quite resilient. The former state fire marshal of California locates his command posts in new communities because they are fire resilient. When we have in mind that that's how we're gonna build, we're not putting wood shingles on roofs anymore. So the idea that we can only build in parking lots, in California is 6% built, 6%. In most other states, you know, we're cresting past 10%, that's the quote, built environment. 
We're way under that. And we also have the highest population density in the country. What is it, three of the five highest population density areas are here? It's not like we don't have density, we do. But the dense work product, or the dense product type for housing is simply unaffordable. And stop inventing money. Oh, we just need to give people more money. No, I mean, teachers and cops cannot afford a home. We're breaking society. Please, it's an and. We need all of it. So, and, so can oh, I, sorry. Can I was I, gonna, let me jump in. <laughs> <laughs> Couple things. The state, I was talking to the state director of housing and community development, 100% of all of their hires are 100% working from home. So that's already happening at the state level, and they're getting a lot more applicants to take these jobs. The other thing I want to talk about is adaptive reuse. We now have office buildings that are half empty. We now have businesses that are no longer viable. We have retail strips that have no customers. And so I had a bill this year with Senator Wachowski, SB 1369, that was going to take the LA Adaptive Reuse Bill, well, excuse me, the LA Adaptive Reuse Ordinance, if anyone knows that, it took downtown from what it was, decrepit, nothing happening at night, to a 24-hour city with baby strollers and people walking their pets at, at lunchtime. 30% of all the new housing production in downtown LA was because of adaptive reuse. Tried to bring that statewide. It got killed and not even introduced because it did not include union labor. And it, and it was CEQA exempt in LA, uh, which is how it, that all happened. So there is an opportunity around looking at our cities and taking, you know, essentially it's tenant improvements, right? You're gonna move walls, you're gonna add a couple plumbing fixtures, you can build housing. But now the state's telling us you can't do that without having to go through, a, you know, the CEQA process and hiring union labor. Okay, so, so on the, I think it's true that on um, the work from home, I think it's a very consequential question. It is true that um, hybrid work is diffused and is likely to be here to, to stay, but it's also it's, it's quite a different impact on housing demand than 100% remote. 100% remote allows you to live in anywhere you want in a very affordable part of the state or the country. Hybrid work doesn't. It still ties you to an office. Uh, yes you can probably uh, be a little bit farther away from the office, but ultimately, if you have a job in, say, one of the high tech firms in Palo Alto, you will need to be in the metro area, in the Bay Area. So I think, I think the two things are completely different in terms of the impact on affordability. On wildfire, I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, you know, one interesting thing that is happening, thanks, the, unfortunately, due to the wildfire, is that insurance company has started pricing in the risk of insurance homeowner in the most affected part of the state. To my, in my view, that's actually a good thing because it means that finally the market is internalizing this cost, is it making it more expensive to build in areas that are at risk? And a misguided state policy that we, the state of California, have adopted is essentially to subsidize homeowners who live in wildfire prone uh, area uh, by essentially providing a state option when there is no private insurer who is willing to, to insure them. I think it's misguided because it's essentially saying the market is not going to insure you because it's risky. We taxpayers are going to subsidize you to live in a wildfire prone area. I think it's misguided. It's an, one example of a policy that is diverting development in area where we shouldn't be building. So that would, that if, if adopted, that change would undo about 50 years worth of civil rights and housing law. Right now, under the Regional Housing Needs Assessment Program, every community is responsible for doing its fair share to accommodate housing demand. That means South Lake Tahoe. It means Chico. It means Fresno. It doesn't mean nowhere. And it means unincorporated county areas. That's how the law works. And then we just, two years ago, passed affirmatively furthering fair housing, which is don't create new ghettos. You have to spread low-income housing through a jurisdiction. That doesn't mean that they are going to burn in hell or in a forest fire. We know how to build. And if you look at the statistics that were developed for SB 12, which proposed virtual ban on uh, on uh, housing in, in high wildfire areas. And by the way, you get a high wildfire area ranking if you're more than a certain number of minutes from a fire station. 
it doesn't mean that you know, you're living in dead and dying brush. You could be in the middle of the desert with nothing around you and just be far enough away. Little distraction on like what it is to be high fire, because most people have most, mo everything on the other side of 280 is high fire, and a good bit of land this side of 280 is high fire. A lot of West LA is high fire. Again, they tend to be whiter and wealthier. I wonder what this theme is. All right, thank you very much. I, I think we're already five minutes over, um, so this is a great uh, debate. Okay, uh, as I said earlier, I have heard, I see boxes, people holding boxes. So it looks like there's box lunches, there's restrooms. Let's try to sort of start out around 12.05. So that means you grab your box lunch, you come back in here, eat it in here, see you shortly. Thanks for a great session to Rebecca and the team.
I don't know. my friend.
Okay, we should try to get started for our next session. I know everyone's having fun connecting and eating. Feel free to keep eating. Uh, that's why we put the tables out, so that everyone could eat during the session. No rush. We don't want anyone to get indigestion. Take your time. We're in for a real treat with our next session. Uh, no one's really listening to me, but I'm just going to keep talking. Uh, so, so I feel like I'm talking to my teenagers. Uh, so uh, our next session, our lunch session, I am very pleased, uh, we're in for a real treat, to introduce the moderator of the next session. Uh, the, next, the moderator of the next session is uh, my friend, good friend, Jeff Belisario, who is the executive director of the Bay Area Council Economic Institute. Uh, in that role, he supports a wide range of institute research through project management, research design, and analysis. His research interests lie at the intersection of community development and finance, and his past projects include analyses of Bay Area housing programs, public-private partnerships for infrastructure, and the economic impacts of transportation investments. Before joining the Bay Area Council Economic Institute, Jeff worked in Chicago in various portfolio management and investment analysis positions for John Hancock and State Farm. He holds a master's in public policy degree from the UC Berkeley Goldman School of Public Policy and a bachelor's in finance from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, so with that, please join me in welcoming the moderator of our next session, Jeff Belisario. Thanks so much, Mark. All right, you didn't come to hear me, though, so I'm going to be uh, pretty quick here. It's my honor today to introduce our lunchtime keynote speaker, uh, the mayor of Sacramento, Daryl Steinberg. Um, if my math is right, Mayor, you're at about 25 years of elected public service. I was on Wikipedia last night. Is that checks out? 19, yes. <laughs> Just kidding. No. <laughs> he was first elected to a seat on the Sacramento City Council, later held elected office in the State Assembly and the State Senate, becoming president of the Senate in 2008. Uh, during his tenure in the legislature, he championed economic development, education reform, building sustainable communities, and major investments in health care and education. Uh, he authored the Mental Health Services Act, the first of its kind in the nation that generates $2 billion per year for people in need. Uh, his commitment to improving mental health care has resulted in services that provide integrated health care to the homeless. Uh, in 2013, as a state senator, he authored SB 82, propelling a major statewide expansion of crisis beds and capacity. Uh, in 2015, he established a first-of-its-kind statewide organization, the Steinberg Institute, dedicated to raising the profile of quality mental health care as a critical public policy and civil rights issue. Uh, and in February of 2019, Governor Newsom appointed him to co-lead a new statewide commission on homelessness and supportive housing. Uh, as leader of California's big city mayor's coalition, he has successfully negotiated with both Governors Brown and Newsom to make unprecedented statewide commitments to addressing homelessness, commitments that have brought millions of dollars to Sacramento and other cities around the state. Uh, so with that, please welcome the mayor of Sacramento, Daryl Steinberg. Hi. Oh, oh I thought we were. All right. You, Are we? Am I getting this? I thought we we're doing question and answer. You want to do Q and A? Whatever you want. I'm easy. What do you, you guys decide? It's up to you. I don't want to let me uh, give. You, you can go for Give a mayor a microphone here. Okay. <laughs> uh, Jeff, thank you. Uh, um, I'm happy to take a few minutes and then be happy to turn this into a, a yeah, question. We'll, we'll come back to questions and answers. Um, thank you so much for uh, the kind introduction and thank you um, for inviting me to Stanford. Uh, you know, I, I have long forgotten now, uh, many decades after the fact, that I didn't get admitted to Stanford as an undergraduate. <laughs> and I'm not, no I've not I have forgotten it, I'm not bitter about it, and I, <laughs> I've moved on. Um, it's all true. I went to Cal, and, uh, but I always have loved Stanford, always. And uh, it's always a, a great honor uh, to be here and to be able to share a few uh, thoughts with you about this seemingly intractable problem known as homelessness in California, but throughout our country. I think it is important to note that while it's really bad and has gotten worse, the fact of the matter is that California through these various interventions and funding streams that Jeff has 
uh, mentioned a moment ago, has literally gotten tens of thousands of unsheltered people off the streets over the last five years. Homelessness is worse in my city of Sacramento. I face it every day. And yet, we now have 1,100 shelter beds a night. We, uh, from, a, from, from a low five years ago of 100, and we have gotten in our city and county over 14,000 people from unsheltered status to permanent housing. Oh my God, we should be having a parade. But of course we're not. Because the inflow and the numbers of people who become unsheltered and homeless far outnumber and outstrip the numbers of people that we are able to get off the streets. I just think it is important. I don't say that as an excuse or a look what we've done, but just to recognize that the problem is multifaceted, not just in terms of why people are homeless and the various interventions that are required to get them off the streets, but why people become homeless in the first place. And if we don't spend as much time, attention, resources, and f policy change on, the, on why people become homeless in the first place, as we do on getting them off the streets, we're going to be missing. We're, we're going to be missing what may be, if not more important, at least as important. And so why do people become homeless? Well, I know that drug addiction and mental health uh, crisis is a significant factor. But we must start, and frankly, we must finish with the central tenant of the increase in homelessness. And that is poverty. People are living on the economic edge. Housing is unaffordable. Middle class jobs don't pay enough. And whether it's the chicken or the egg, the economic circumstance and the fragile living cause people who are fragile to begin with to become sick, to abuse or use drugs. If we don't acknowledge that California is becoming um, a state of, of, as they used, you know, they used to say, the rich and the poor, people who cannot make it, then we are also missing a central tenant. And I know you heard, I saw Jennifer Hernandez out here, where is she, over there, who I worked with in the legislature, I know has made her, uh, a, a lot of her career as a very strong and effective advocate around reforming our California environmental quality law, and I want to talk about that for a moment, but maybe in a bit of a broader context, because I've come to some unorthodox conclusions about what it's going to take to make a demonstrable difference. I don't think that it is, I don't think we're going to cure this problem. That isn't usually what a politician would say. Uh, we're not going to cure it. The numbers are large, um, and some people are going to choose to live out of, out of sight in whatever way they choose. But I believe fundamentally that if we are going to make a visible and demonstrable difference for our communities, for the people who are suffering, but also for our business communities, our business corridors, and our neighborhoods, we have to recognize one fundamental missing piece, and that is the law is not on our side. What do I mean by that? Think about it for a moment. The law requires that our state and our local communities provide a free public education to every young person, and we require the state and our local communities to build, literally construct, public schools. It's so embedded in our culture, in our reality, and the way our society works that we don't even give it a second thought. Think about housing and mental health care for a moment. 
And I've experienced this now every single day as a local government official moving from the state level. Everything the state, everything the cities, everything that the counties are called upon to do to alleviate homelessness is voluntary and optional. It's voluntary and optional. There is no right to housing in California. There is no right to mental health care for the most uh, needy among us. And even if you don't like the idea of an individual right because you worry that it is going to lead to uh, a lot of unnecessary litigation from a business perspective, there is no legally enforceable obligation for government at any level to produce any amount of shelter, housing. There is no obligation to bring people indoors. There is no obligation to provide mental health care and treatment to the thousands of people who are talking to themselves living in squalor in various California cities. And so we say we care, and I believe that we do as, as good people, Californians care, but I wanna to say to you, I don't think we care enough because if we really cared, if we really cared, the law would reflect that caring and commitment. We would say that every individual has a legal right to housing that could be enforced by somebody to make the cities and the counties build faster, be more innovative when it comes to housing, why the only affordable housing finance structure we know requires six to seven to eight hundred thousand to a million dollars per unit to build a single unit of supportive housing when there are manufactured housing products that I have seen that are state of the art that people who aren't homeless would choose to live in because they're kind of cool, actually. But in the state that spawned the Silicon Valley, and we're right in the heart of it here now, we have not had a housing innovation revolution around the kind of housing that we could build much cheaper and much faster. And so we say we care, but when there's no legal obligation to actually produce any amount of housing, when there's no legal obligation to provide mental health care and treatment to people with the most severe disabilities, well then you're gonna get what you're gonna get, which is a lot, of, a lot of money, more money than we've ever had before. That's good. Um, a lot of urging, a lot of efforts and desires for governmental jurisdictions, which on the natural fight with one another, cities and counties mostly, to actually try to get together and, and figure out how to devise a system that, that is more effective and efficient. But it, that's all voluntary as well. I want to give you a, a historic contrast for a moment because it really is meaningful to me. I have been involved in the mental health movement for a long time. And the Mental Health Services Act, just one slight correction, people making a million dollars or more in California are doing really well because the millionaire's tax for mental health that I passed in 2004 is not generating two billion, it's generating $3.8 billion a year. It's a lot of money. It all goes to the counties. Now, if I knew that I was gonna run for mayor of Sacramento, but when I wrote it, I might've written it a little different, but that <laughs> is a whole nother speech. But I wanna give, give you a little bit of a historic contrast that is really meaningful to me. In 1977, a, a famous in his time legislator named Frank Lanterman wrote the act that began closing the state's developmental centers, the centers for people with de de developmental disabilities, because the belief then and the belief now is that people with developmental disabilities, it used to be known as mental retardation, that's not the politically correct or the correct term, now it's developmental disabilities. He wrote the law to say that when we shut those hospitals and when the people come into our communities that they have a lifetime entitlement and a right to whatever it takes, 
to whatever it takes so that they can live independently in the community. And we have these systems now of regional developmental centers that do just that. And the state hospitals continue to close and they will be a, 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 an advent of the past. 1977, 10 years earlier, the same Frank Lanterman wrote what is known as the Lanterman Petrus Short Act. You might know it as the 5150 Act. When they wrote that bill, they said two things. Well, they said one thing. They said that 90% of the savings from the closure of the state hospitals would flow to the communities to build a better system of community mental health care. Never happened. Now, Prop 63, $3.8 billion is, is a pretty good down payment, but it never happened. But there was one other fact, and if you remember nothing else about my speech today, please remember this. The legislature did not grant any kind of right or entitlement for people living with severe mental illness to get the care and treatment that they needed. They did it for the developmentally disabled, and rightfully so. They did not do it for the mentally ill. So you see somebody, try not to be graphic, unkempt, unclothed, talking to themselves, and ask yourself, is there any obligation for this society to provide care and treatment to that individual? And the answer is no. And that has to change. Now let me take it, I wanna go back to my friend Jennifer Hernandez here for a moment because uh, let's take this from a regulatory reform perspective for just a moment, okay? How do we, because you talk a lot about CEQA and you've talked a lot about, I want you to think about this for a moment. If there was a right to housing in California, a, a legal right to housing that could be enforceable, here's, in my view, what would change. Pretend that I have a piece of paper in front of me, eight and a half by 11, drawing a line down the middle of the paper. On the right-hand side are obstacles to building more housing. On the left-hand side are obligations to build housing. The right-hand side is a long, long list. Oh my God, it's CEQA, it's excessive regulation, it's high cost, it is um, lack of available resources, it's lack of housing innovation, as I spoke about earlier, why we don't have a manufactured housing revolution in this, in this state, uh, I don't know, but we must. That list is long. On the left-hand side, you have nothing. You have a housing element law, which to the governor's credit, He's trying to strengthen, which, yes, requires cities and counties to plan for housing, to plan for housing. And I believe in the planning process. That's really, really important. But it is different than a production standard. It is different from compelling the actual production and placement standards. Oh, by the way, on the right-hand side as well, I should say, God, I maybe left out a really important one, and that is NIMBY, not in my backyard. So here is my... Here's my belief after doing this work for a long time. If you had a legally enforceable right to housing, all of those obstacles on the right-hand side of the page would not be as strong as they are now today because the legislature, local governments would have to find a way to overcome the impediments. And right now they don't. The default is to say no. A neighborhood complains, uh, an interest group complains, um, it's too costly, you haven't figured out how to cut the cost, all of it. Where is the counterbalance? The law must be the counterbalance. And so where do we go from here? Governor Newsom, I think, has presented an opportunity that if it is not yet seen in this way, I hope it will be seen in this way soon. And that is this idea of care courts. And I don't know if you've talked about it here today. It's a bill that is authored by Senators Eggman and Umberg on the Senate side, administration-sponsored bill that would allow a wide variety of people, including family members, and we're talking about homelessness now, family members, to be able to file a petition saying that their loved one or a city so, social worker or a county social worker to say that the person on the street needs help. 
And it would allow that person to be brought before uh, a judge and for a judge to rely on the advice of what they call a, a care court's treatment team and to be able to define a treatment plan for the individual and then, key point, allow the court to order the treatment plan. It's controversial because everybody's focused on what they usually focus on, which is the obligation of the individual to participate in their treatment plan. That's the involuntary commitment piece. And that's a reasonable and important debate. And frankly, I believe that the 5150 law should be reformed and that if somebody is genuinely gravely disabled and can't care for themselves, and I'm sorry, it's not a civil right to be out on the street. And we, we, we need it, everyone needs to be indoors. That's my view. But the real import of that bill, if it's done right, is it will obligate the government to actually provide the care and the treatment and the housing, which they're currently not obligated to do. Now it's going through the legislature and I worked there for 14 years and let's just say, well, I'll put it without being snarky about it. Um, Sometimes the balancing of the interests, which is necessary, becomes the paramount goal to get the bill done that when the interests are balanced, in the end, the bill itself doesn't do anything that's very meaningful. And so I'm hopeful that that isn't the case because I know the governor is very committed to it, the legislature, you know, the lead legislators are committed to it, and that we get a tool which begins to open the window into a right to housing and a right to mental health treatment. I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you for having me. Grab a seat. Any you. Where am I? Whichever one you want. I'm, I'm right here. Feels the, good? the hot seat. OK. That was fantastic. I was going through my list of questions, and I think you've already answered all uh, of them. So I'm no. going to give you just one, and then we'll go to the audience. I'm sorry. OK. It was perfect. It's for me. Uh, you're having a conversation in Sacramento right now about shelters. Yes. I haven't talked a lot about shelter here today, but when we talk about homelessness, we often find there's a group that says we need to clean up the streets, build shelters. There's another group that says we need the permanent solution. We need housing. There, obviously, we need both. Um, but how do you think about shelters in Sacramento, and how do you think about that being a bridge to permanent housing as opposed to a New York model where you're in a shelter? Well, for so I do think we need, obviously, a variety of options depending on the person's needs and their acuity, whether or not they can want to and can live in a shelter, whether they need autonomy. And it's not exactly a false choice, but it's kind of a false choice. Um, and, and, if, and, when the, and your question is totally appropriate because it gets asked all the time. But when that's the question, we're already starting from you know, kind of a lose-lose. If there's an intersection, for me, it is this tiny home manufactured housing movement because that presents the opportunity for autonomy um, and can be transitional or temporary. Um, but could also serve as longer-term housing for people. But, you know, here's the problem. The federal tax credit, you know, the tax credits, state tax credits, the federal HUD regulations, they don't support this kind of, uh, in most instances, they don't support this kind of innovation, right? If it, it's got to have a 30-year useful life in order to qualify you know, for, for the various forms of state and federal financing. And I go, really? Uh, I, I would settle for 10 <laughs> if you could guarantee somebody 10 years of housing. Shelter, though, I think gets a little bit of a bad name here um, because the thing about shelter is that it does allow you to help larger numbers of people at one time at least begin the process of getting off the street. Um, friend here, Volunteers of America do a great job around um, using shelter, not just as a place for people to lie their head and get out of the elements, that's good enough, or well, maybe it's not good enough, but it's important. But they also use the shelter as triage to be able to begin um, to find out what the person needs and, and then to help navigate them as quickly as possible when it's available to other uh, more transitional or permanent housing. And I'll tell you this, I mean, this the thing that drives me crazy about this debate is this. We all agree you cannot help somebody who's living on the riverbank, period, end of story. We can't get to them as much. So you, you're, 
So if I say it's a right to shelter, and you say it's a right to housing, tomato, tomato, I don't care what we call it. I want a legal right and a legal obligation to get people indoors and in any way help them begin uh, their transition to uh, a better life. That's all that matters. Great, fantastic. Let's go to the audience. I've, I'm leaving plenty of time, so all right, we've got many right in front here. Hi. Hi. Um, I wonder if thought has been given to the issue. Of oh, we need a we need a mic there, I guess. I want to introduce my chief of staff here, by the way, is Mary Lynn Valinga. Please give her a welcome. She, she, she knows. She's also our housing, uh, our housing expert, so any tough questions she will take. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd wonder if thought was given to the problem that uh, these services could be very effective. And uh, the thing is, though, with uh, homelessness, uh, people have no fixed address. If you provide these wonderful services, you're kind of calling people to come to the city to take advantage of them, and there is not enough housing that we can put in any city to provide for all the homeless people who would come here from around the country, and is there any strategy in place to so try and offer it to Californians and not to make it a mecca for... So you're talking about the attractive nuisance theory, um, which, um, you know, I guess, I want to answer again respectfully, I think it's largely an urban legend with some truth to it. There's some truth to it. I think it's overstated. In our 2019 point in time count, we found that 90% of the unsheltered people had been living in the greater Sacramento area for at least a year. Um, and yet I do, I do understand the argument. Um, but you know, I always say, at least in California, so is it a California versus the rest of the country uh, contrast, or is it a, um, a, a, a San Francisco Oakland versus Sacramento contrast, because if I'm being aggressive about trying to get people indoors, which we are, then, uh, and people are moving up here, well, I know Oakland is being very aggressive about it too, as is, uh, as is San Francisco. So aren't as many people then being attracted from Sacramento to go there? So I, I like to think that it evens out in some ways. And then the other question is, what choice do we have? I mean, what choice do we have but to try to provide? I know so many people, we get this from some quarters of the business community, want it to be out of sight, out of mind. And I don't know how to achieve that for them or for anybody. Well, number one, these are human beings. They are human beings. And number two, it's not possible. There isn't an island. The, 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 so we've got to grapple with this and make sure that the, a fair share sort of policy within our communities and throughout the state is, is what we uh, insist upon and that the facilities are operated safely um, and, and, um, and clean and that um, they become a good part of the neighborhood because you're helping move people who are unsheltered from that neighborhood indoors. Is that answering? No? What, what, I mean, what, what, are you, what are you getting at? Uh, if you had some sort of requirement that someone be in the region, uh, let's say a decade, I mean, of course that's going to be problematic to, to, to not offer it to everybody who's there, but saying someone's, uh, if you could go to Sacramento and be homeless for a year and then get housing, it seems, I mean, just logically, you're offering something, you're going to create a magnet for... for well, what if every, but what if every city offered the same thing? What if it was a state great. law? So is there a coordination in the state so, and in so, the country? So that, it's, good, it's a good question. Um, there is no... We've tried the right to housing statewide, um, and it hasn't gotten a lot of momentum yet. Um, it, COVID sort of got in the way. Our, the governor's task force, which I co-chaired, recommended a legally enforceable obligation for all cities and counties to meet a specific percentage requirement in terms of shelter and housing. Then COVID hit and kind of lost a little momentum. So at the city, I proposed my own right to housing ordinance, and now a group of business leaders have engaged with me and the city, and we're going to have on the ballot in November on the city ballot a requirement if it passed that we build shelter equivalent to 60% of the point in time count, whatever that is, over the next couple of weeks. We're, we're, we're urging the county of Sacramento to do the same, which is another real fissure point here. And I just got to say this, because if you want to know the truth, cities 
are not homeless service agencies. We're not mental health agencies. We're not homeless agencies. We are in the game now. It's not a game. We are in the business out of uh, necessity and, and because it's the right thing to do. We don't do mental health. The counties are the Health and Human Services subdivision of this, the state. As I joked earlier, if I had written the Prop 63 differently, I might have, the cities might have gotten direct allocation, but the counties have all the money. And frankly, there's large surpluses sitting in a lot of county coffers, and we need their help because they're the ones with the expertise around mental health outreach, case management outreach. And so the, and the, and the cultural conflict is that everyone knows their mayor. They don't know their county supervisor. They know the city, right? So I'm the, uh, I'm the one they love and hate. I, I accept that. I think it's about you know, 55, 45, but who knows? I, I'm not, I, I haven't, uh, it, it, and the counties, though, are the ones that actually are legally responsible for helping people with the most severe health and human services conditions. And there is a contradiction. Now, if we had a right to mental health treatment, a legal right, that would be then enforceable, if you will, against the counties. And with care courts, there is a window here to obligate the counties to provide care and service to people that they currently are not serving. A lot of questions in the back there. Uh, right in the middle. Right there. Perfect. So I just had, um, I think the Lanterman Act is a really interesting example because you're right that they mandate services, but they don't pay for, nor do they mandate a right to housing. So you're right back where you started around this right to housing. And this back and forth between services and housing, I'm curious, when we think about service systems, we think about people. And when we think about housing systems, we think about like the technical. We just spent a couple hours in that. And so how would you say that the California sort of technical industrial complex of all these people who are invested in sort of the technical side of housing development, how would that need to change to actually then see your right to housing be made a reality? It's, it, that's really a great question. I, I will say that over the last five plus years that the relationship between the housers, as they call them, and the service providers is better than it was. There, there, there used to be, when I was in the legislature, no connection at all. Um, one of the things we did with Prop 63 was that I insisted that we bond against a small percentage of it and we create a housing bond, $2 billion, called No Place Like Home. It um, can only be used for people living with serious mental illnesses, which means that by definition they have to, the housers have to work with the service providers in order to build uh, a No Place Like Home project. And so, um, what is it going to take? Again, my belief in theory is, is if there was a right to housing and a right to mental health treatment, that by definition, they would have an incentive and in fact be required to work together because all the funding streams would be contingent upon that kind of, that kind of collaboration. But it takes both. That's another false debate, right? Housing versus services. Get that in my community. Really? First of all, you can't provide the services to people without the housing if you're seriously mentally ill. And if they're seriously mentally ill and all you're providing is housing and not services, they're going to fail in housing. So you need both. It's, it's a, I'm sorry, you're right. It's the government agencies. But yeah, the gov you know, government itself is still, is still too siloed. That's exactly right. Um, you know, I think, again, Governor Newsom is initiatives are attempting to sort of bridge a lot of those historic gaps between agencies. Um, and it's better, but there's a way to go. We did have a comment earlier that we could do a full day on governance in homelessness. So we can invite you back for that. Yeah. Yes. So maybe Thank stay you. at the same table there, a little bit to the left. Uh, looking into the future, homeless is likely to get worse, homelessness. The trends on AI and automation, the income equal inequality and poverty is going to get a lot worse than it is now. How are you factoring in this trend and getting ready for the emerging wave on this issue? And how do you develop sustainable solutions around it? Well, I mean, that's why we're here. 
I mean, that, that is the question. I mean, I go back to my initial comment about the state of society and the great economic divide. Because unless that is confronted in a more meaningful way, there's not a way to achieve what you just described. I mean, I think we can do much better at, at uh, producing housing and, and being more innovative around housing in the ways we've talked about. But what are we going to do to make sure that young people have career pathways towards higher wage jobs? Um, that's a public education conundrum uh, around whether or not uh, even getting a bachelor's degree these days <laughs> puts a, a young person in a position to be able to afford to live uh, in the Bay Area. And, and so it, it is going to require, I think, a focus on greater equity and how we build a, a, an, an economy, a modern economy. That's what it's going to take. And housing is a part of that. But housing is, to me, housing is a life essential. But it's also part of the overall, the overall ecosystem. So it's got to be everything. I don't have the magic answer. I, I, I mean, I know what I'm for. I, I'm, I, I, for the right to mental health treatment, right to housing. I also led in the legislature to create a $1.5 billion trust fund for a career education for high school students to be able to integrate academic rigor and career application. Um, I believe that uh, we ought to make it easier for people with kids to work by, uh, by subsidizing childcare. And this is all that goes into allowing people to, to have a decent life. Um, housing is an important piece of it, but it's one piece of it. It's essential, but it's one piece. We have time for one final question. We, got, over here. we have this uh, woman here, too. We have and two I, questions, then. We'll yeah, go here, yeah, and then sure. we'll, we'll do a lightning round with five minutes left. I saw your hand up there. You don't need me up here. What, the job I, of the moderator, I've completely failed I, at even finding the right people. I hope, it, here. I hope it's an easy question, OK? OK. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. So first of all, thank you for coming today. I'm over here. Oh, hi. Sorry. Hi, hi. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, you know, do you really think <clears throat> more laws and regulations are going to help? I mean, this is really the problem. You know, having some new regulation with a court and a judge, really? Have you ever been to court and a judge before? I mean, you know, do you really want them deciding this? Why don't we just, why don't you sponsor a bill getting rid of CEQA? I think that would do a lot more to ending homelessness. Well, first of all, I don't think getting rid of CEQA is a good idea. I think reforming CEQA, and I, I uh, participated and led uh, to make some, some changes, not, not enough during my tenure, but maybe I can reframe my point, and whether you agree or disagree with me, I, it's, that's fine too. Um, I believe that some way of forcing government to be accountable for more housing production and caring for the most vulnerable will actually force government to relax their regulations. Because right now, the regulations, regulations, nimbyism, cost, lack of innovation are winning the day. It's easier to say no. And so if there is a non-litigious way to hold government accountable to actually doing what we should be doing at a grander level, I think it'll weaken those regulations that currently stand in the way. That's a fantasy. Um, well, you disagree, but you know, what's your idea, sir? What's your great idea? I, I, my great idea is to have some kind of bill that will significantly change mental health. So something okay. addressing the underlying issue and a separate bill uh, really changing the ability to build in California. I okay. mean, I think well, everyone I'm, agrees that I'm we should that be able too. to. Yeah, so I, not, I mean, having a new regulation requiring the government to do something that they can't do according to the current rules and regulations, I mean, it's just more litigation. I, I respect your point of view. Let's go here for the final question. <laughs> there we go. Um, sorry, I'm a little sleep deprived because I work in mental health. Um, and I'm here from uh, Los Angeles. So born and raised in Sonoma, though. So 
Okay, so I'm, a, I'm just a little confused because I've been a lifelong Democrat and I love, love everything that you said. What can All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You're not gonna like the next part and that's why I said I should reframe my question after you're really nice. Um, I'm now an independent because here's why. The problem is, at least I only will stay in my lane, right? I'm in Los Angeles. I was a corporate business manager turned therapist turned group homeowner for adults with severe mental illness. Why did I have to change careers? Because there was no place for my brother who is paranoid schizophrenic with extreme learning disabilities. Literally had to change careers to create an affordable place for my brother to live. In America, that's the reality. So I am on the front lines of this shit and I'm pissed because you mentioned so many things and man, if they could be perfected, like I'm ready, we can solve this. 5150, do you know how hard it is to get someone 5150? I had to do it last week. Sorry, she doesn't have a gun. She's not threatening you. She's in psychosis. She is not with reality. These poor cops, the CARES team that came out, my group homes are in Santa Barbara and LA, they don't want to take them because here's why. We have this overcorrection, it seems like, in California after the closing of the institutions, right? So we've got this overcorrection to we don't want to take anybody's rights away, which is now morphed into neglect. Yes. And so my, here's, here's where I get confused. I, I think but, we agree. I, we, I'm with you. So here's where I get really confused. And I'm sleep deprived, so please remember that. It's OK. <laughs> Would you like some coffee? <laughs> I've already had three cups. <laughs> For the good of the community, I'm done. Um, where I get confused, where I get confused, and is it? It was my former party that put all these damn policies in place. I'm down there talking to the Ventura cops. They call that Bill 949. You know where someone can walk in and steal $949 worth of goods from CVS and then they just get released? That's not your fault. That's the people, the Democrats in Los Angeles County allowing this to happen. It's the mentally ill people running around in the streets naked yelling. It's me calling, because it's in my nice suburban neighborhood in Woodland Hills, Calabasas border, that there is a man screaming F U N word. It takes me 11 minutes to get a cop on the phone, guys. So I will wrap this up by saying, I know it's a very long question. There's too many cooks in the kitchen, right? We need some type of streamlined process, because I can tell you, you apply for SSI, and they send you the mail, and you don't respond within 10 days, you're done, right? They call my client, the person with mental illness, they don't answer the phone, they're done. They need the advocate. So it seems like these deeply rooted problems, but they're actually all these like little areas that if we all just came together and collaborated and were nice to each other, you know, I think that we could really like solve some really real stuff. And I'm not, you know, I'm staying in my lane with housing and, and mental health. And I really want to get on board with all this. I, I don't even know what CEQA is, but I'm here because I'm being open-minded and I want to learn about it. And I just feel like I'm genuinely confused why the Democratic Party, the, the party that was supposed to be of care, has allowed for this level of neglect. That's why I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm, I've supported Gavin this whole time, but no way, man. It's going to Schellenberger. He's got a good plan, and I actually believe that mm. he can solve it. I disagree. Sorry. I know, and no, I, no, I, no. I, I, I'm I, glad I, you still called on me, though. Thank you. Of course. No, no, no. I, I, well, let, let me. You want me to say or not? You've got, you got one, one minute. No, I, I, I think your expression of frustration is right, and it's widely held by so many Californians. Um, I disagree. I think Gavin has actually put more into this than any governor that I've ever worked with. He really has. Billions. And he's trying, through this care court proposal, to actually take on the, the lack of common sense, which says that it's OK for people to be living um, in, in squalor out on our streets. So, but in the, at the end of the day, if we don't, as a society, find a way to bring more people indoors and give them the help and the treatment that they need, 
in some compassionate but direct way, then um, the voters are going to go for something that is probably not wise and that will be way, way out there. So it's incumbent upon us, I think, to do uh, the right thing and to, make sh and to get more people inside and get them the help they need. And that's where I continue to focus. And I do believe that if the law required those who were in charge to do more of that, that we would get more people indoors and more people treated. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Mayor. We made it. Thanks so much for a great session. We have another great session coming up now with the uh, catchy title of, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great to see you. Uh, opportunities to reduce homelessness that will be moderated by my friend and colleague, Irina S. Munson. Irina is a research scholar at the Stanford, at, here at CEPR. She is the managing director and policy fellow of CEPR's California Policy Research Initiative as well. Before joining, I'm just going to keep talking, and hopefully some, you'll, some people will hear something I say. <laughs> I don't really <laughs> Before joining CEPR, Irina served as the chief economist and program budget manager of the forecasting unit of, uh, <laughs> at the California Department of Finance. She's done a lot of great things, and I, I, have, I have a lot to read here, but I'm, I'm losing some, so I'm just going to let, turn things over. She's a second generation California native with her PhD in economics right next door here at Stanford, and her undergraduate degree, double major also, like earlier, uh, in economics and math from MIT. So pretty smart person here. Arena, you're going to uh, moderate this next session, so take it away, Arena. Good luck. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, this has been an amazing day. Um, Mark neglected, by the way, to mention that CEPR supported me in my graduate studies. So if there are any donors in the audience, I highly encourage you to give money to support CEPR fellows because I think that it makes a difference. Um, we eventually come back and talk about these issues. Um, so because we are going into kind of a different set of panels this afternoon, I did want to recap a little bit about what we've heard this morning. One, supply is 100% an issue. Um, so when I was the chief economist for California, um, one of the things that we kept on talking about was if something is unsustainable, it's going to stop. The whole point of doing forecasting and of government accountability, of trying to plan for the future, is so that you don't have a hard stop. In homelessness right now, we are kind of coming up to a hard stop. This is a very unsustainable situation. There are people in crisis every single day on our streets. We see them. If you walk about two blocks that way, you will see all of the RVs along El Camino. This is not okay. And what we heard this morning, and I think what we're going to hear this afternoon, is this is a collective action problem. This is a self-imposed problem. California now is richer than we ever have been before. This is 100% a solvable problem that we are inflicting on ourselves. So, we know, let's build more housing. Let's reform CEQA. Let's make our governments more accountable. Let's focus on how we can do this. And that's why I'm so excited to be moderating the session this afternoon about um, how we can help with this. Um, so we have some great speakers. Um, first up, we're going to have Pastor Paul Baines, um, who uh, you know, works with the homeless population. Um, he is on the ground every single day. He is living his values. Um, as a Christian pastor, um, trying to help people every day. Um, we also have Brian Greenberg, who is with Life Moves. Um, I see a lot of Life Moves people here. Um, also on the ground, trying to make things better for everyone. We also have Roseanne Haggerty, who is with Community Solutions, who um, is applying this data-driven approach. We love data here at CEPR. Um, trying to make things better, trying to sort of like take that big picture view, trying to do the, how do we do this better? How do we solve these problems together? So we're going to have Pastor Baines up first, um, and I'm very excited. So thank you. Thank you very much, and I am very grateful for the invitation to come. Um, and hopefully I won't make you glad twice, glad to see me get up and glad to see me sit down. Um, but as a 
uh, faith leader, a community leader, particularly for East Palo Alto, which is one of the most underserved communities in California. Um, I have a reputation of speaking my mind, so I'll apologize if I offend anyone ahead of time uh, on my comments and my thoughts here. Um, so first I want to start off by saying um, that I truly believe this, that none of us here is as strong as all of us here. So I want you to remember that as part of the theme um, of what I believe humankind should be all about, okay? Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that the system is not broke. The system is designed to do exactly what it's doing. That is to keep certain people in and to keep certain people out. So we need to break the system. And I liked what uh, Steinberg said earlier um, about innovation, because that's right in enrollment. How much time do I have? I have five minutes. So I'm a Pentecostal preacher. Let me set my timer, because I will be led by the Spirit and keep on keeping on. OK, no, I'm a, I'm, I needed to make it go off myself. So five minutes, there it goes. All right, um, so I have slides. I'm just supposed to click this button, right? I'm like uh, Jennifer. Um, I'm, the, I'm 61 years old, so you know, technology I don't always get. Um, and so we're talking about affordable solutions. I truly believe that, yes, maybe there is no silver buck, no, no silver bullet here because you know, we, would, we wouldn't be talking about homelessness and affordability. Um, but I do believe there are silver buck shots. Um, and I believe that there's a variety of ways that we can approach homelessness that we have found to be successful in the little bit of area of influence that we use in this region. And so we, um, we Hope is an organization that I head up. Um, I have some of our staff here uh, with us on today. We Hope stands for We Help Other People Excel. And we deal in the space of homelessness. I also sit on the board of Life Moves, who is a great partner and is making great impacts of addressing homelessness. But we all know you can't solve homelessness without having the housing stock. Hello? So I'm a call and pre. I'm a call and response preacher. So I might want an amen out there. Or frozen, chosen here. Um, and so, in order to have uh, that housing stock, you know, my wife and I, we went out and we run a shelter, a hundred bed shelter in San Francisco, seventy five hundred beds in East Palo, and we have a variety of programs. Um, one of our programs is Daily to Own Wheels, which is a mobile hygiene uh, program that. Well, we, we're in Los Angeles and we're in five counties and 23 cities here in the Bay Area. We touch about 6,000 people. But the great job that our case managers do along with uh, many other organizations do is get people into housing, but we need more housing stock. Um, there we go, there we go. I want to, you guys already got some of this information. They already told them, you know, California has the highest amount of homeless. I'm going to skip past most of that because um, it doesn't really, you, you've already heard it. And so what my wife and I decided to do was um, in our 20 years of running We Hope, we decided to start another nonprofit called United Hope Builders. What that nonprofit will do, and it was encouraged by actually Priscilla Chan, um, she knew that we were traveling the country to look at housing manufacturers. And we went to eight of them throughout the country. And we landed on the one that they reckon, that they were considering supporting, which is called Andy Dwell. In this um, relationship, it was very much mission aligned that what Andy Dwell did. They're all about bringing quality, affordable housing to the marginalized communities. And so what that led us to do is to create a factory in East Palo Alto that we plan on opening up uh, in the fourth quarter of this year um, that will produce 400 steel 
manufactured homes for this Bay Area. And so that in itself was something that we feel that will make an impact. Now these homes that will be built will be built for specifically the 30% AMI folks, which is your working poor and that's your homeless. We feel that it's crucial to add the housing stock to this high price Bay Area specific for extremely low and very low income folks because you know, when we say affordable housing, I know that's the terminology that we use, that affordable is relative on who can afford it, right? So uh, if you live in Atherton, affordable housing may be 300,000, you know, uh, in East Palo Alto, it might be 250,000. So it's not that much difference now. But in our journey, we found that um, having quality homes is critically important, and, but we have to have partners. And because I am a person of faith, um, some of you may uh, have seen the Turner Center um, report where it says that the faith-based community actually in California controls roughly 38,000 acres of potential land that can be developed for affordable housing. And so we looked at our strategic plan and we have a network of faith, whether they're Buddhists, uh, um, it doesn't make a difference, a synagogue, whoever we're partnering with. And they don't have to be a faith, they just have to have site control. And so our plan is to use our UHB product and uh, partner with the faith-based communities throughout California uh, to produce this land so that we can address the systemic issue um, that faces particularly the marginalized communities on which we work in. Some of the projects too that we looked at, oh, oh it's going off, all right, so. Um, we partnered with um, uh, Life Moves, uh, who built a, a beautiful project, and Brian can elaborate on that a little bit further in Mountain View, where we're, we're housing 110 families, I believe it is, 110 people. Um, and it's a beautiful project. You can go see that in Lake Home. We partnered in with Sam Licardo, the mayor of city, and uh, did Evans Lane project where it's about 130 units out there. And so these are real live events. But the other way I think is another silver book buckshot is in partnering with the faith-based communities. These were with municipalities and things of that nature. But the faith-based community is that um, LISC, uh, who I sit on their board, um, has a program that works with the faith-based communities to help them develop their own land and giving them particularly um, the opportunity to who they may not have how to conceptualize to build, but bringing capacity building to the faith-based organizations. And that is crucial um, because if I look at myself as a black man, um, the church is probably the last institution that black people own. And, and so there's a lot of churches though uh, that can be developed out there. And so partnering with them, I, I, we felt that that was a crucial step and it's been extremely impactful. Through this capacity building program, one more minute, um, we'll be able to impact the Bay Area tremendously. And some of you know that in the county of Santa Clara alone, black people make up roughly 2.5% of the population but in the homeless, in the general population, but the homeless population, we make up roughly 17%. So disproportionately, you know, we want to go after those black churches and Latino churches and people of color um, to work with them to help them solve the problems because their consistency will probably mostly be people of color. Um, so that's how we want to try to level up uh, using these types of approaches to create more affordable housing stock for the entire Bay Area. Um, it's not going to be isolated to people of color, but uh, we know that people of color are last on the totem pole. Thank you. Brian? I'm Brian Greenberg from Life Moves. Uh, we have 27 sites. Uh, 14 large shelters, this is one of them, 88 singles, a dozen families, under 200,000 a unit. Once we solve homelessness, it can turn into permanent supportive housing. Um, we're 
it's going to be really difficult to build every homeless person a $650,000 apartment. Six months. Uh, it's not what I want to talk about today, though. Um, so about 85% of our families graduate to uh, permanent housing, about 45% of our singles. Why is that so challenging? First of all, the human condition cannot keep up with the technology of drugs. Alcohol's never changed. We're all, we've always had 10% of the population with an alcohol use disorder. Coca leaves people chewed for 10,000 years, went to cocaine, went to crack. Uh, poppy, opium, uh, po people smoked opium for, for 1,000 years, went to heroin, went to black tar heroin, went to synthetics like fentanyl. The marijuana, when I was at Ohio State, you could smoke it all day long. It was 0.5% uh, THC. Now it's 5 and 8%. If... If 80% of our unsheltered homeless had asthma, we'd have pulmonologists running around everywhere. But 80% of our unsheltered homeless have an addiction disorder, an untreated addiction disorder, and we pretend like it's not there. Again, the human, thank you, the human condition cannot keep up. You know, when you make drugs illegal, they get smaller and stronger and the science more addictive. And the human condition can't keep up and we haven't addressed that yet. All over Silicon Valley and the peninsula, there's outpatient recovery slots that are not being utilized. They're not being utilized because we haven't adapted our recovery system to serve. They're only treating the worried well. They're not treating our unsheltered homeless people. So number one, addiction disorders. Uh, number two, a lot of our clients didn't win the zip code lottery and they didn't win the parent lottery. And if you lose both of those lotteries and you have a little bit of depression or anxiety or addiction disorder or bipolar disorder or God forbid a schizophrenic disorder, you are lost. Right, all our services go to upper middle class people. And of course that's not true for everyone. We've had two young Stanford graduates in our shelter in the last year. One because of mental illness and one because of addiction. So it's not that everyone loses the zip code lottery and the parent lottery, but so many of our people do and that's where we have to drive the resources. Um, uh, our outreach team, we have people from our outreach team you know, in, our, in that shelter, 70% of the single adults report having an addiction disorder, report using illicit drugs and alcohol. And that's self-report. The real number is about 85%. So until we get a handle on that, we can build those $600,000 units, which we need, more housing, more permanent supportive housing. Um, but when, and uh, this uh, woman over here, we're losing the liberals. We are losing the liberals. When I go speak, what do people complain about? There's homeless people in our libraries. There's homeless people in our parks. Well, if we give them a place to live, they won't be in your parks and your libraries. I'm a Bernie supporter, right? I mean, I, I, I don't want you to stand there thinking, who is this redneck? Me and my wife <laughs> volunteered for Bernie. Right? But when we go to open up these places, all we hear about is homeless people in the parks and the library and in front of our schools. We need to build these things rapidly. People are dying on our streets every day. No one knows this is there. It, there have been no neighborhood complaints. We can scale these things in a cost-efficient manner. How many minutes I got? Okay. Um, you know, you know, Chase of Boudin's being recalled in San Francisco as the DA. Uh, George Gascon in LA is being, uh, is facing a recall election. They might gather enough signatures. Those things would not be happening if not for homelessness, right? When they do focus groups, that's what people bring up. They bring up homelessness. We have to, 
it, we, we have to do it for the community, and we have to do it for the homeless people themselves. They need a dignified place to sleep and eat and get services. So uh, the home that I grew up in in Cleveland on the Jewish East Side sold last year for 82000 Got a great school district. It's 1,200 square feet. Might be in need of a little bit of repair, uh, but it sold for 82000 um, it's so costly to build things here, and it's why Pastor Baines and his initiative around modular housing, things like this, are so important. Um, I'm just going to say one more thing, and then I'll finish. Uh, when my father, uh, my father was a World War II veteran, and his uh, brother Joe was, and when his brother Joe came home from Vietnam, I mean from uh, World War II, he, uh, he, it, it crushed him, it crushed him. Um, he couldn't function. There was a family argument whether he was, had serious melanoma before he went into the war or not. But he lived in a residential hotel in Cleveland, and my parents paid about $60 a week, went up to you know, $70 a week. Uh, but he lived there his whole life with serious melanoma. We don't have any housing for marginalized populations, right? Um, and you know, and he, you know, he, of all the indignities he suffered in his life, one of them, I mean, the bathroom was down the hall, but we never considered that an indignity, right? He had a lot of, Uncle Joe had a lot of indignities in his life, but we never considered the bathroom down the hall an indignity. We need to wrap our brains around how to develop quick, interim housing for unsheltered people, and we can do it. This is an example. Thank you very much. So this has been a great session already. I am just going to make one comment, which is oftentimes, and we're going to have an entire pa panel session about mental illness and treating mental illness after ours, but this is one of those um, issues where it's very easy to start thinking about us versus them. And one of the themes of this entire day, I think, has been collective action. This is a we problem. This is a our neighbors problem. Um, and so as we talk about this mental illness over um, the course of this afternoon, I just want to remind everyone, let's not turn this into an us versus them thing, please. Roseanne. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. And I have encouraging news to share. Uh, I lead an organization, Community Solutions, that leads a national movement called Built for Zero that involves now 98 uh, continuums of care, 98 communities, typically a COC for those of you in the homelessness world that's uh, often a county or a cluster of counties. Uh, in some cases, it's a city. But of the 98, and 11 of them are in California, we now see um, 44 that are steadily reducing homelessness and 14 that have gotten to an end state for one or more populations of functional zero, which means that homelessness is measurably rare overall and brief when it occurs, meaning that that community can rehouse a veteran or someone, uh, actually they're, they're sort of eliminating chronic homelessness because you can see that coming. And uh, we're likely to see the first community in the country get to zero for all this year with that measure a dynamic measure of what is a dynamic problem. You know, the end to homelessness looks like learning how to stay ahead of it and building systems that are accountable. And so I'll tell you a bit about what we've learned over the years and maybe uh, start by sharing that we started off as affordable housing developers, uh, one of the early groups, and this is in the New York City area, building permanent supportive housing. And after about 10 years of building at that point about 1,700 apartments in midtown Manhattan, we looked around and said, wasn't this supposed to end homelessness? Because we were building more, more and more money was going into building permanent supportive housing, and yet homelessness was increasing. And worst of all, the same individuals, many of whom had been on the streets in Midtown uh, for years, were still there even after we opened all these buildings. And so it was really on us, we realized, to figure out like what the heck is happening here, and why are our assumptions not working that you just build housing? And so we had to go to those individuals on the street and say, how is it that we have these buildings here and you're not actually you know, living in them? And what we learned, uh, incredibly humbling, and uh, what we are learning is that this is true everywhere, is that in that particular part of the city, uh, there were uh, 17 different organizations, all offering services, none of them coordinated, 
over, we tracked it, over $11 million being spent on basic uh, re emergency responses were not resulting in housing placements. No one was coordinating their work. Uh, everyone's intentions were good. The quality of what they offered was good, but it wasn't adding up. And so what Community Solutions realized, and it's taken us a long time with these amazing community learning partners, was that we really had to ask different questions, which is, it, is everything we're doing adding up to what we all want, which is fewer people experiencing homelessness? And the second part of that question, how, would, how quickly can we learn what's working and learn how to pivot and improve what we're doing? And so uh, from starting off as a, a housing developer, we've learned that these are actually the critical things that communities need if you're really gonna be serious in reducing homelessness. You need to start with a, an urgent, shared, and measurable aim. Everybody's gotta be working toward that same end state of fewer people experiencing homelessness. You need to be organizing your services on a team basis, different organizations, all really around the same, you know, look at the image of an emergency management command center. That's what we need to do in homelessness, we're finding, and communities that are doing this are the ones that are seeing reductions. And then this whole system really gets held together by by name real time data on who actually is experiencing homelessness. And then uh, the, the critical inputs are the right you know, kind range of housing, but communities we realize don't even know what kind of housing they need, the typologies of housing, how to, what the barriers to getting that housing built are if they don't have their arms around the full system. And, and also, uh, finally, uh, are they using ideas that are being proven out elsewhere and adapting them rather than reinventing the wheel all the time? And so just to really harp on the, the key piece of this all, you know, the insight ultimately that homelessness needs an operating system in order, in, in addition to good mental health uh, services and the right kind of housing, is that the right kind of data is the key to making this all work. The right data so that a community team can know where it stands at all time and how many people are coming into homelessness, how many people are moving out, and not just the, those raw numbers, but to be able to pick them apart, like what were the causes of people coming into homelessness for the first time? How do we shut that down? How, did, how many people return to homelessness after being assisted? How do we improve the placements and the supports afterwards? All of these different pieces of the puzzle can be pulled together, but it's the data and having that collective approach that really is the key. And um, to, to kind of uh, uh, nerd out on, on quality data, uh, you really, it's, it's not like you, you know, we, we started with this fantasy. What if we could get everybody to like just run that magic report, get all the agencies to do it? Well, what we found we had to do was get all the organizations who are providing the direct services that were operating the shelters, doing the street outreach, um, to actually uh, go through the painstaking task of building a common registry and to have to develop the capability to update that in, in close to real time, at least monthly. Most communities now do it d daily uh, or, or weekly. But it has to be comprehensive. You have, that means that you have to up your game on outreach, so you're covering everything. It needs to be um, current, and it needs to um, uh, be shared with the appropriate you know, uh, privacy protections. Uh, and it, you know, we now have 98 communities that have done it, so this, this, this default mechanism of you can't share data, there are ways around it. People release their data, pass, you know, they, they assign for uh, the, their permission, so it, it can be done. And then, so you not, not only need that quality data to tell you where, you know, where things you know, are and what, what the opportunities are for improvement, you need the data for equity. There is really no such thing as, as, as equity. If you can't pull your data apart, and see how it is, how different groups are being affected, and where there's bias at e each step of the process of, of getting back into housing, getting services, and, and being able to um, speak to individuals about whether the process is, is working for them and if they feel respected and treated with dignity throughout the process. But this is really, you know, like your, I think it's, you know, equity is just talk if you don't have good data. And I think that this actually is what we're seeing is gonna be the future of how we get homelessness really to the point where it's understood everywhere as a solvable problem, that we are so accountable to what's actually happening and can look at this data together, all of us who have a role to play, and that really is kind of everyone, 
and look at what isn't working and to be able to zoom in and see where the big opportunities for leverage, for improvement are, and to just not battle around ideology, but just say, okay, where are the gaps here? What can we try? What will, what, what will represent progress? You know, we're, we teach communities how to use data analytics, quality improvement, human-centered design, all of these tools that live in other sectors but are absolutely essential for a collective action problem like homelessness. So lots to be optimistic about. Thank you. My panelists. Yeah, please. Um, I am going to limit myself, I think, to one question. Um, and then we're going to open it up to questions from the audience because I know that this has been an awesome and engaged audience and you guys have lots of questions. Um, so this entire topic is sometimes a little bit heavy. Um, but here at CEPR, we really believe in sort of the power of ideas, the power of data, the power of like reframing things to help move the needle and help us move this forward. So can you tell me an example of where you were able to make a difference in like how people regarded this to help get something done by reframing it for someone? Like give us an example of like where people sort of saw the light if you, if you were. Any one of you. Well, I'll, I'll start with you know, just the uh, importance of framing this as a systems problem, okay. not as an individual behavior problem, but as you know, the, the reality that in every community, and I'm learning so much about California in the session today, but in every community, you know, so much work is going on, and people have stopped asking the question of like, maybe if we work differently, this could all be, you know, kind of more, more impactful. And I think we all in the field can do a lot to reframe the conversation by talking about the, the systemic factors and that you really can move the needle if you have the data that shows what's working and what isn't. That's great. Thank you. Brian. Oh, oh, Paul. I was just going to say it's, um, it's really about relationship, um, the old adage of saying, seek to understand, to be understood. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, preconceived ideas and misconceptions that are out there, um, misinformation, disinformation about, you know, what causes the mm -hmm. cause and effects of homelessness. And we have to dispel that. But it starts with having a conversation and having access um, to those power brokers um, those people who have influence um, over the policies, because it is a systems issue, um, and it, it, it has to, we have to address it from a systematic approach to it. Um, otherwise, we won't be able to really move the needle. Everything else will be window dressing. Yeah, thank you. Brian? Um, at the corner of 92 and 1 in Half Moon Bay, Half Moon Bay had a, a small town with a, with a, with a visible homeless uh, challenge. Um, the environmentalists complained, they were ruining the riverbanks that went into the ocean, the people, the merchants on Main Street were uncomfortable with the homeless situation. Right at the corner of 92 and 1, on the west side of 1, next to Tres Amigos, everyone's familiar with that restaurant, a, a 50 bed shelter, and immediate, visible, and positive impact on homelessness. Uh, people experiencing homelessness don't travel well, they don't want to, they, they're a part of a community, they don't want to move far away, so you need neighborhoods to say, we need solutions that will work. And that's an example of a solution that worked. It was open during COVID. It's been open a year now. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Hey, Brian, I have a question for you. It's kind of a softball for you. So keeping with Roseanne's, it re I really mean it, uh, keeping Roseanne's metrics, so what did it cost Life moves to buy the dirt in Mountain View, which are all in cost, right, uh, on a per square foot basis and also on a per person basis that you're housing there. And what's your yearly cost mm -hmm. to run it? 
Um, so it costs us about $100 a night a person for a little less than that for three meals, case management, mental health services. We train 40 graduate students a year. Uh, there's a full-time LVN, housing specialist, vocational specialist. It takes a village. We had to buy that land. It was $3.4 million for the acre. We'd much rather use publicly available land. Um, the big deal is whether you give everyone their own bathroom, right? It's that infrastructure that's costly. So it costs maybe 120000 if people have their own private bathroom, but down the hall, a lockable shower or a lockable toilet. Um, and it costs 50% uh, more than that if you give everyone a private bathroom. The average length of stay is about 120 days. So each unit turns over four times a year. So, um, so although it might be 36000 for the unit, people are only staying three, four, five months. So is that cost include the purchase price of the dirt? Yes, that price includes the purchase. Because it. modulars are cheap, right? Again, I don't believe we're ever going to be able to build a $650,000 studio for every person out there and keep up. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Um, life moves, and then the person in the back. Great. Hi, this, this is really um, Terrific. Um, so I do work at Life Moves, and I just so I have sort of a question for all three of you. So, you know, we're in a really interesting position right now in California with the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, and I have to imagine specifically local in Menlo Park, there are a number of sites that are properties that are owned by faith-based communities, and it seems to me this is a great opportunity to look at a case study that might say, let's put in the mobile, let's put in the the modular housing, let's get the wraparound services, let's collect all the data and look at it because those most of those properties are going to be, are all going to go through the secret process. It's going to take a long time for any permanent housing to be built. And we have a real opportunity to make some, some significant change locally so that folks don't say, oh, well, that happened in Sacramento, or that happened in Modesto, or it happened in LA. You can't do that here. What do we think? Well, I think that is, um, as my grandfather would say, a pregnant idea that we need to give birth to. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, we've partnered with the, for instance, the city of East Palo Alto. Um, we built a three bedroom, two bath, and a two bedroom, one bath. The cost to build both of those units on city owned land, now minus the land out, was $530,000. That's all in. That's the construction, that's to produce it. That's something that is doable. We just, you have to have the political will. And in East Palo Alto, we love on our own. Um, yes, we just had a murder two days ago from the son of one of our employees. Um, but we love our own, and we will. We we don't we don't believe in nibbyism. Um, we will fight that wherever community that we work within. But I think your idea is great, and it's very scalable. Anyone else? I'll just add um, another idea that hasn't been discussed today. I think the importance of, of adding to the housing stock is, is without uh, a doubt a, a priority here. But um, it's important to preserve affordable housing as well. And uh, um, if, if that's something that whether faith-based or business or community groups should be thinking of, one of the things that we're working on with you know, 16 of the cities and the Built for Zero network is uh, with social impact investment, just going out and buying hotels, buying existing multifamily rental properties, just making it permanently affordable. You know, and and we're, you know, we're we're kind of being elbowed and elbowing back with a lot of these, um, you know, the, these financial institutions and and you know, kind of um, investment firms that are buying these properties up. So that's something you should all keep an eye on too. Just preserve what you have and pledge those turnover units as, as units vacate to people experiencing homelessness, which is what we're doing. Thank you. Question in the back. Um, so, uh, Paul, this question is for you. So I know that you have had um, some uh, people living in some of the sample homes that you have built. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that experience, you know, of housing the people in those homes and a little bit about what it costs to uh, build those homes and, and house those people. Um, 
so what we've done um, we, through our safe parking, RV safe parking program, we got people out of our shelter and out of the safe parking program into these model homes that we created. And I'm a person that truly believes that your shelter should look like the Taj Mahal, um, that you should not lower the class, the look um, of anything that you're providing for the less fortunate. Um, so in doing that, these model homes are beautiful homes. You all are welcome to come and take a tour at them. But we put families in those. Um, families right off the street, families right out of their RVs. As far as the cost, um, typically what our cost is around $65 per person um, to have them housed within our shelter. We actually have not did the cost on how much it's costing them to stay in the model homes that they are staying in. Um, but we, we, our goal is to always turn those around with residents anywhere from three to six months so that we're continually getting people into permanent supportive housing. Um, that's the model that we've created. We do believe, and I, and I believe our city believes, that we can get to functional zero um, by the year 2025. Uh, within the city of East Palo Alto, it's only 2.5 square miles. And we've already reduced it from 400, according to the point in time count, down to what is? The, I think it's the, I think it's like 125, um, in the city of East Palo Alto. So it is doable, and that's through the relationships that we have with Life Moves and El Concilio and the County of San Mateo. It is, uh, again, none of us is as strong as all of us, and that's what it takes to address systemic issues. Is having, and I always, I will say this: What's the first three letters of? Unity, and this is a question. You and I. You and I are the ones that can make that difference, that can make that impact. Because again, none of us is as strong as all of us. Thank you. Um, Mark, I wasn't ignoring you. You were just hidden behind the podium. Yeah. Yes, go ahead and ask a question. Um, but wait for the microphone. It's coming over to you right now. So thank you so much, everyone, and for everyone who's spoken today and is going to speak. So our last policy forum did uh, a comparison of the states of California and Texas. We actually uh, did that event in collaboration with University of Texas at Austin. And the origin of that was that UT Austin beat Stanford in the Director's Cup athletics thing for the first time <laughs> in 20 years. Uh, and so they taunted us, my friends at UT Austin taunted me for that. So anyway, but along the way, uh, there was a little bit of taunting coming from people from Texas about how preposterously bad we were doing on this particular metric relative to Texas. And I guess one thing I'm just wondering, I'm a Democrat, I worked for Obama, I, you know, whatever. I, they have a completely different model in Texas. Minimum wage, less than half what it is in California. No income tax. They didn't expand Obamacare, the thing that I worked on for Obama, <laughs> right? Um, but no housing regulations. They just have a completely different model. I'm curious, three of you sitting up there, is there something that California, this is homelessness in California, can learn from other states? Because we saw at the beginning, Jalou's great presentation, up 42% in California, mm -hmm. down 9% in the rest of the country. I'm a proud Californian, I'm delighted to be here, but can, I mean, I, I just wonder, I, I, I'm just wondering if there's a, it, can, is it, does anyone in the state have an interest in learning from other, for the other 49 states, do you think? Uh, question. <laughs> yeah, please, that's my question. Do you question. guys have an answer? So if you, if you walk the Guadalupe River Trail in San Jose from downtown San Jose to San Jose Airport, it's six and a half miles, all encampments. It looks post-apocalyptic. It's as if Golden Gate Park or Central Park was only, only had homeless people, right? It should be a river walk like they have in certain cities in Texas. In Manhattan, there, in New York City, there's a bed for 85% of the people experiencing homelessness. Here, it's about 30%. We need to ramp up the supply quickly. Right? I mean, that's why we are in such a south of market, the Market Street Corridor, Guadalupe River Trail, under the 880 overpass, under the 880 in Alameda County. That's why it exists. There are cost efficient, effective solutions, but it's going to take will. And, I, and I'm in agreement that Gavin Newsom's doing a good job, but it's going to take a sustained effort. 
I say you don't have to leave California. Bakersfield is one of the communities that's ended chronic homelessness. They just like they just did it. You know, a real disciplined effort on the part of uh, the housing authority leading an effort with uh, the city of Bakersfield, with Kern County, you know, all of the providers. It takes um, a lot of uh, humility and will to just you know get everybody kind of changing the way they work, working toward a common aim, um, you know, solving problems as they are, are coming up, just being honest with the data. Um, so. You should look at what they're doing and look at how they've configured their team. Not me. I, I have nothing to do with all yeah. Yeah. Bakersfield. So and then my short answer, or no, short to long answer. Um, one is yes. Um, I've been to Texas. I have looked at their models that they have out there. We've traveled. Um, it really boils down to political will. That's really where the rubber is. We already have the resources. We already have the think power but it's the political will. Will we continue to bow down to those who have the influence over our politicians? That's where the rubber hits the road. Um, will you stand up in your council meetings and stand up for what is right even if you're standing alone? That's where getting into the trenches, that's where the dirty work has to be done. They need to hear your voice. I love what she said about Tahoe. I mean, she, she can come preach at my church on Sunday, <laughs> you know. And so with the political will, anything can be, can be done because we have the money. We have the resources. I, I don't, their, their dynamics is a little bit different, you know. Um, we, we have to have greater density product here because the cost of land is so much higher. And so that is a, a big huge factor when you talk about building. New York and California are the highest places to build any type of housing in the whole entire country. Texas, you can build a whole lot because there's a lot of land out there that people aren't using. It's underutilized land. Here, we're using up everything in New York as well. So a couple things have come up that are going to make me say something impolite. I think Jennifer left, but I will channel her spirit and say, <laughs> Prop 13 in California means that Californians care more about keeping wealthy people wealthy than any other policy priority in the state. Full stop. Um, that is, you know, we have said you, you have to have two thirds majority to raise taxes. Um, that means that um, your assessed value doesn't go up very much. That means that neighbors can say, I don't want the character of my neighborhood to change. Um, and that's not an impolite thing to say right now, even though it's probably kind of racist. Um, so, you know, when we talk about systemic issues, my background is in tax policy. Like, this is a big tax policy issue. Um, it also affects RENA, because uh, if regions have their, um, you know, they're supposed to be building this housing, but they face no penalties for doing this. And in fact, the state ends up subsidizing it because the state often pays for the transportation that substitutes for the housing being built there. And so they can continue adding jobs and don't necessarily have to add the housing. All right, I'm gonna stop my rant. We do have time for a couple more questions. Does anyone else have questions? Otherwise we could, take it. yeah, please. Oh, so um, you mentioned the project in Half Moon Bay, I believe it was. Was there political resistance? Um, we have people with short-term incentive not to lose their seat on the city council or, or the, mm -hmm. uh, whatnot. Um, and what did you, were there any insights into what you did to overcome it? I'm the chairman of the Republican Party, by the way, so I actually have a, a lot of things I find in common with your, with your presentation. Uh, just so you know, uh, this, uh, <coughs> this issue uh, broaches political uh, lines, traditional political lines. Well, it helps if the politicians are being termed out. So Don Horsley is the county supervisor there. Um, he's not running again. He's termed out. Um, so he was able to take a really strong stand. Um, and, but, but in reality, San Mateo County and the cities within San Mateo County are big advocates. It's, um, it's, uh, so, but, it, but it is true that Don Horsley, the county supervisor, was termed out. But we also had the city count. But the, once we go into a neighborhood, there's no 
complaints. That's what you have to understand. All the complaints are at the front end. I mean, a 50 or 100 bed facility or unit facility doesn't, if it's run right, it's, it's got the most curb appeal of any property on the block. Um, it's staffed 24 seven. If law enforcement have to get called, they're our biggest cheerleaders because they'd rather deal with people with our social workers next to them in a clean, well-lit place than on a street corner. So uh, law enforcement's behind us, city council's behind us. Uh, the opposition is from neighbors, which dissipates once it opens. Change can be good. Yeah. So, uh, um, I just, I'm sorry, it's a kind of narrow question, but uh, all communities have data systems, mandatory data systems. Are you working with the existing systems and trying to make them work better, or are you designing entirely new data systems? Yeah, that's a great question, sir. Um, every community that receives HUD funding is mandated to use this homeless management information system architecture. It's, it's, it's designed to be a billing system and a case management system. It's not designed for to give you management insights through data. And so we've worked with uh, Tableau, the data visualization company, to basically create this, um, uh, this visualization uh, platform that sits on top of, of the HMIS system so communities don't have to do double data entry. But it consistently pulls out these critical data points that show the dynamics of the problem. So communities can actually uh, understand what the effects of the actions of their policies are. In, in close to real time, and so they can continue to make dynamic choices. You know, that you know, homelessness is an issue that we found like the pit counts, these point in time counts that are mandated, totally inadequate to tell you if what you're doing is working. You, you, it's a, a one night a year estimate, you know, it's done a million different ways around the country, and it doesn't give you any kind of information that's actionable about who you know, needs assistance today and for what and what the possible housing solutions are or what interventions you know, taken together are working, which is why you know, we have just become complete disciples of just understanding in real time what the problem looks like, how it's moving and changing as the key to actually uh, getting reductions. Great question. I think that we are back on time. Thank you so much to our panel. This was fascinating. Thanks, Arena, and thanks to all three of our panelists. And thanks to all of you for sticking with us. We've got lots more excitement to come. This next session, the title of this next session is uh, Street Homelessness, Mental Illness, and Drug Addiction, and it is going to be moderated by the person who sort of start to finish organized brainstormed and is the locomotive behind today and for that I would like if we could all just join me giving a little shout out to my colleague Jalu who the streeter who uh, organized the whole day today so Jalu is going to be our moderator she worked incredibly hard these last several months to get up to speed on this very complicated issue and to reach out to some of the you know, just most knowledgeable and uh, effective people on the front lines of the sort of nonprofit, government, practitioner, academic, um, leaving some community out, journalism, the whole thing. So I'm super grateful. So Jalu uh, uh, is a, the director of partnerships here at CEPR uh, and is also a research scholar at CEPR. And her work, uh, she works with potential partners uh, to um, connect CEPR's community of scholars and faculty and others and supporters uh, to try to make progress on pressing economic policy issues. So to the extent that after today, you think that there may be some way, your organization or organization you know of or someone else to potentially partner with CEPR, feel free to reach out to me or especially uh, Jalou, who's uh, much more effective than me. Uh, uh, and, and we could, uh, we're you know, very open to collaborating. This is not an issue, homelessness, that CEPR has historically done a lot of work on. So I did get some reactions of, really, you're doing a policy forum on homelessness? But I think it's a super important issue, and I would like to energize somewhat my research community of economics to do, try to contribute more in this space. With humility, recognizing economists, we don't know everything, so uh, 
But her work has, Jalou's work has primarily focused on the economics of aging, retirement security, and financial security, and on the mental well-being of older adults. And she uh, received her PhD in economics at Indiana, Indiana University, Bloomington, and before coming to Stanford, well, here at Stanford before CEPR, she worked at the Stanford Center on Longevity, and before that, she was uh, an economics professor at Allegheny College in Pennsylvania. Yes. And uh, so with that, please uh, join me in welcoming my colleague and friend, Jalu Streeter. Come on. Thank you, Mark, so much for that kind words. Um, I have to say, without your encouragement and your support, I wouldn't have made it this far. And also, without the support of every one of you here, I also wouldn't have made it this far. But I think, at the end of the day, it's not my accomplishment or anything like that. I think we're facing a tremendously important issue together. Um, and we just have to work together to solve all the problems. Maybe not today, maybe not this year, but I think this is a good start. Um, so now, let me lower this because Mark is so much taller than me. Um, so now let's move on to the next panel uh, with a special focus on mental illness and drug addiction among the unsheltered homeless. Uh, we have a great panel, Dr. Anna Lamke <laughs> over there. Um, so she is a professor of psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. Uh, she's a professor, she's also a clinician, a speaker, and writer. Uh, her book in 2016, Drug Dealer MD, was highlighted in the New York Times as one of the top five books you must read in order to understand the opioid epidemic. Um, her new book, Dopamine Nation, this one, right here, I have read, um, and it's a great book, I love it so much. It's an instant New York Times bestseller. The book explores how um, to moderate compulsive con overconsumption in a dopamine overloaded world. Uh, indeed, we're all addicted to something, right? Drugs, food, smartphones, working, shopping, you name it. I don't have substance abuse water, disorder or anything like that, but reading this book really um, made me reflect on my own vulnerabilities, on my own dark sides, and my own chase of dopamine. Um, next up is Lisa Daly, she's right here. Uh, Lisa is the executive director of the Treatment Advocacy Center, uh, which is a nonprofit organization aiming to improve the lives of those suffering from mental illness. Um, Lisa joined the Treatment Advocacy Center in 2015, bringing many years of nonprofit policy and advocacy experience. Uh, her prior work includes the representation of refugees seeking asylum in the US and many years of experience as a litigator in the areas of human rights and civil liberties. Um, last but not least, uh, Michael Schallenberger. Where's Michael? Oh, there <laughs> Michael Schallenberger is the founder and the president of Environmental Progress. His new book, San Francisco, um, this one, which I also read and I also love, um, has brought national attention to the humanitarian crisis in Californian cities, uh, where homelessness, crime, addiction, and the mental illness are on the rise. Uh, Michael's book not only provides a large amount of data, uh, but it also tells vivid stories of real people. I want to mention that one of the real characters, uh, Thomas Wolf, is joining us in the last panel starting at 4.30. Uh, Thomas is right there at the, at the, in the back. Um, so I want to emphasize that Michael is here today to talk about policy issues. Um, he's also, many of you probably already know that he's also running for California governor. Um, Stanford University is a nonprofit educational and research institution. And therefore, at this policy forum, at least on stage, we will not discuss anything related to his political campaign. Um, so now I would like to invite each one of them to probably come on stage and give their five minute summary of uh, what they think are the problems related to mental illness and drug addiction. So um, I think first up is Lisa.
Hello, uh, I do not have slides. I figured five minutes is, is too short for slides. <laughs> Uh, so Treatment Adv Advocacy Center um, has the mission of eliminating barriers to the timely and effective treatment for people with severe mental illness, whatever they are. We focus on people that have diagnosis of schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, severe bipolar disorder, or really any kind of an illness that has psychosis as a component. And we focus on this population because their needs are really different than the needs of people that don't face that challenge. And those needs are often overlooked when we are putting together our policies. Neglect of this vulnerable population can and does lead to tragedy. And homelessness is just one of those tragedies. Um, but of course, that does encompass other kinds of tragedies like ramp the rampant victimization of people on the streets, death due to untreated health conditions or overdose, and of course the wholesale criminalization of psychiatric symptoms that we see every day. The LA Times recently reported that 51% of homeless population in the city reported mental illness, and a whopping 67% reported either mental illness or substance use disorder. That is probably an underestimate based on other data that's available. People in California seem to be reaching a kind of critical mass with the issue of street homelessness, and they want to see something happen that is going to fix the problem. I can't offer a solution that is going to fix homelessness, because homelessness is not a single problem. But I can give you a couple of policy changes and a couple of ideas about things that would actually help for the population that I know about, which is individuals that have severe mental illness. The main solution is at least pretty, at least partially pretty obvious, and that is treatment. But within the broad category of treatment, we need to understand that this really means two different things. It means treatment capacity, but it also means having the will to intervene if we have to do so. In 2016, which is before the recent jump um, of over a thousand percent uh, in the number of people who were found incompetent to stand trial, 75% of California state hospital beds were occupied by people who were in the criminal justice system. And they're generally there for really minor offenses, um, things that we call nuisance crimes. And they're related in a lot of ways to homelessness and, and to the, the parts of life that go along with being homeless and being able to maintain just a getting by existence. So like I said, these are very minor offenses, but these are people whose mental illness is so severe that they can't be adjudicated. So most of these people are in beds and they're either waiting evaluation or restoration for competency. So to be clear on what that means, it means we are trying to make them well enough to complete a criminal case, but we are not trying to make them well. If you don't treat people who are really sick a lot of them are gonna end up in jails and prisons, and a lot more of them are gonna end up homeless, or they're gonna go back and forth between the two. Severe mental illness is characterized by major cognitive functional impairments and emotional disturbance, sometimes both. So the fact that this often leads to people being criminalized or ending up homeless is not rocket science, and it really shouldn't surprise anyone. It doesn't always get expressly stated, so I will say that one of the solutions is adding additional hospitals and beds. That actually will help get some people off of the street if the reason that they are homeless is because of untreated mental illness. More beds do actually need to exist. But the second part of the equation is that we need to stop planning and operating our public mental health system in a way that we already know excludes the most severe cases. We do this as if they're not part of the equation and really should be somebody else's problem. And this is how we ended up with a situation where the LA County Jail and the Cook County Jail are the largest public mental health institutions. Research indicates that over time, people who are admitted to state hospitals in recent years have been much more likely to have had prior arrests than prior hospitalizations. That means that our system's response, our systemic response to mental illness has shifted away from what it used to be, because believe it or not, it actually did used to be a medical or social services response, to becoming what it is today, which is primarily a law enforcement response and a criminal justice response. 
Why are we okay with that? Because we are okay with that. Otherwise, uh, we would not have allowed this to continue for as long as we have. There's some advice that people often give to people who are earlier in their careers that I think is really relevant here. And this isn't the first time that I've brought this up. The advice is dress for the job you want, not the job you have. This is really good advice for like an ambitious young professional. This is terrible advice and a terrible strategy for building a public mental health system. But that's what we've done. Our system is, de is designed for the patients that we want to have and the clients that we want to treat. It's not designed for the ones that we actually have, or at least it's definitely not designed to be able to help all of the ones that we have. Access to treatment is limited and basically, especially intensive treatment is, is really skewed towards people who are doing well enough to recognize that they need that treatment and doing well enough to actually figure out how to find that treatment and ask for that treatment. That means that the people with the more complex needs and with the highest risk for death or decompensation on the streets are virtually invisible to the system. We step over very sick people who are sleeping in doorways in order to get inside and then we close the door. And we won't open that door unless they knock for it. That's what we need to change and until we do that, we're going to have an unmitigated human rights catastrophe on our streets. Nothing is gonna change until we can change that way of doing business. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Hi, everybody. It's uh, great to see folks. I was told I have five minutes. <laughs> And what I want to do in that time is talk about the ways in which I think an understanding of what's happening in the brain of people who become addicted and who have co-occurring mental illness can help inform our policies. So very briefly, I'm going to also talk about how understanding the brain, as well as how it interfaces with the world that we live in now, is also very important to consider. I base that on my a study of the brain, but also on many years of treating people with addiction and co-occurring severe mental health disorders. My disclosures, I have been retained as a medical expert witness in federal, state, and county opioid litigation. I do not receive any funding, fees, stock options, or other compensation from companies that make, market, or disseminate medical products. There are many risk factors for addiction that can broadly be categorized as nature, nurture, and neighborhood. Nature is the inherited piece, the co-occurring mental illnesses that put people at higher risk for becoming addicted. Nurture is the way that we are raised, including early childhood trauma. And neighborhood has to do largely with social deter what we often call now social determinants of health, very, very important, but also simple access. And one of the biggest risk factors for becoming addicted is whether or not you have easy access to a drug. It is very clear based on many studies that if you live in a neighborhood where there's easy access to addictive drugs, you're more likely to try them and you're more likely to get addicted to them. Furthermore, if you have decreased access, you are less likely to get addicted. And policy interventions, which either increase or decrease access have very real repercussions when it comes to the prevalence of certain addictive disorders. What we have here is a graph from the CDC showing the very clear correlation between an increase in sales of prescription opioids, increased treatment admissions for opioid addiction, and increased related uh, deaths due to opioids. What you see here is not just correlation, but causation. As doctors in the late 1990s started to prescribe more opioids to patients with minor and chronic pain conditions, there were more opioids available, not just to those individuals, but also to others through diversion, leading to the opioid crisis that we are in today, which has now transitioned from prescription opioids to illicit opioids, including fentanyl. It's also true from historical examples, if you decrease access to addictive substances, you decrease addiction. When we think about prohibition, which was the uh, making illegal the production and sale of alcohol between 1920 and 1933, most people don't know that actually from the perspective of addictive alcohol use, it was very effective. And what you see here is as uh, alcohol became illegal, 
with prohibition right here. Um, I don't know, maybe it's a, right around here. There was a massive decrease by half in alcohol-related liver disease called cirrhosis and alcoholism, also known as alcohol use disorder. So you decrease access and you decrease risk. So here is the central problem. We are living in a time of almost universal access to highly potent, highly reinforcing drugs. And when you combine that with what drugs do to the brain, as well as the inherent increased vulnerability in people who have a pre-existing psychiatric disorder, you come up with a very different policy conclusion, I believe, than you would if you had an environment where you had not easy access to those drugs or you were working with patients who didn't have the vulnerability due to severe mental illness. So I want to just talk very quickly here about what happens to the brain as people become addicted. One of the exciting findings in neuroscience is this specialized reward circuit in the brain mediated largely by dopamine released in this area and the communication with the prefrontal cortex. So this is the reward system. Things that are reinforcing re release a lot of dopamine. That gives us the pleasure. But the brain immediately adapts to increase dopamine by downregulating dopamine transmission and production, putting us in a dopamine deficit state. That dopamine deficit state is what then drives the craving and repeated reuse, not to get high, but just to feel normal. Furthermore, you've got the prefrontal cortex, which is a central part of this reward system. What is the prefrontal cortex? It's that large gray matter area right behind our brains, which is central to delayed gratification, appreciating future consequences, and autobiographical narratives. And what happens as people become addicted to drugs? The prefrontal cortex essentially goes offline, and they're no longer able to truly appreciate the consequences of immediate actions. And this has been shown again and again in numerous studies, both neuroimaging and psychological studies, experimental studies, that as people become addicted, they devalue long-term rewards, and they overemphasize or overvalue short-term rewards. All of this, of what happens in the brain, amounts to this part of the brain and the dopamine, especially that dopamine deficit state being the primary driver of decision making, and this prefrontal cortex taking a far back seat. You might think of the brain as a car. This area is the accelerator. This area, the prefrontal cortex, is the brakes. And as people become addicted, their brakes stop working, and the accelerator slams down. Why is this important? Because it acknowledges that the disease of addiction is a loss or a mitigation of personal agency. People lose their ability to choose. You may have heard of Pro Prochaska's stages of change, this idea that people are in pre-contemplation, contemplation, action, and you, know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. But the truth is that when people are deep in their addiction, they don't have access to the data to make informed choices. So for example, when we see patients in the hospital who come in intoxicated, we say, are you interested in rehab? They are not interested most of the time because they're in withdrawal and they want to get out of the ED so they can get out of that dopamine deficit state. If we hospitalize them, sometimes against their will, and wait three to five days until they're out of withdrawal, their prefrontal cortex gets on back online. Would you like to uh, go into treatment? A lot of times we will get a yes in that instance. So this, I think, is really, really important when we're thinking about whether or not we're mandating tr treatment, whether or not we're incentivizing treatment, and to appreciate that there's a diminished capacity to really understand long-term versus short-term gains. One of my favorite experiments, I'm going to hurry up here, is uh, an interesting study asking people when to complete the sentence, when you envision your future, you will do x. And most people who are not addicted, when you ask them this question, they will describe a future that's about, on average, seven years in the future. People who are in their addiction will typically describe a future that's about seven days in the future. Again, just another example. All right, this is from a very famous study by Nora Volkoff, who's the head of NIDA, which is essentially showing the brains of people and their dopamine transmission represented by red. And you can see in these healthy controls and in the nucleus accumbens, there's plenty of red, nice, healthy dopamine transmission. These are individuals who have been addicted to these substances, cocaine, meth, alcohol, heroin. And you'll see there's very little red. 
Importantly, these are individuals whose brains were scanned two weeks after stopping drug use. Two weeks after stopping drug use, they still not had, had not restored healthy dopamine levels. And this is really why, many times, why people will relapse, even if objectively you can see and they can see that their lives are better off. They're driven by this dopamine deficit state. Um, this is a very famous image illustrating what happens to our brain in development as we go from early childhood to about age 20. And in this image, um, red does not represent dopamine transmission. Red represents the number of neurons in the brain, which is the workhorse cell of the brain. And what you can see here is that in young children, there are lots and lots of neurons. We're sort of like totipotent cells. And as we mature, the number of neurons decreases all the way up until age 25. Why? Because our brain is an efficient organism. We're pruning back the neurons that we don't use and myelinating in blue, that's like greasing the wheels, the neurons that we do, so that by age 25, we end up with our adult neurologic infrastructure that will serve us for a lifetime. So you can certainly imagine that if in this vulnerable period, as we're pruning back those neurons, that individual is exposed to addictive drugs, that will change their architecture. But also importantly, I love that Lisa talked about schizophrenia, a severe mental illness characterized by uh, psychosis for one. We do believe that one of the things that goes awry in schizophrenia is that this pruning process doesn't occur appropriately so that people are left with significant frontal lobe or prefrontal cortex deficits. So if you think about a combination of a mental illness that interrupts healthy pruning and then exposure to addictive drugs that interrupts healthy pruning, you end up at age 20 or 25 with a very different and potentially unhealthy brain all of this is what I believe we need to take into account as we're considering the way, for example, that the criminal justice system should interface with people who have addiction and what kinds of places are healing places. And I will just leave as a little teaser that I have become convinced that we need to bring back mandatory locked facilities for people with severe mental illness and addiction who cannot thrive in a world of universal access to highly potent reinforcing drugs and behaviors. Thank you. On the podium, or can I just stand? Thank you very much. I'm so glad that Anna moved the Overton window so far towards reopening mental hospitals. Everything I say now is going to sound very moderate to all of you. So thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm a huge fan of what's happening at Stanford. One of the main characters, I have to say nonfiction characters, real people that's in San Francisco is Keith Humphreys. I'm also a huge fan of Andrew Huberman, who runs the Huberman Lab. He's completely changed my own daily routine. I now, I now run before I drink coffee in the morning, um, a big change. And when I'm experiencing total misery on my run and hating it, I'm training myself to enjoy it. It's like the weirdest experience, but it actually works. And I'm also taking cold showers, which helps to regulate me. So I did both of those things this morning, and I'm in a state of calm attentiveness, which is what Andrew Huberman has encouraged us to be. I'm also a huge fan of Anna's. Her book is absolutely outstanding. I was saying before I read her book that really there wasn't that much new in addiction science. I no longer say that, especially after reading the book, but also Andrew Huberman. And thank you, Jialu, for inviting me. Um, I don't always get invited to mainstream homelessness events, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to make an argument that we are failing to deal with this issue for institutional and structural reasons. We spend more money on mental health in California and on homelessness of any other state per capita and have the worst outcomes. So that's a mystery. Why would that be? Is it because we don't care enough? I don't think that's the case. I think that most of us do care. When voters are asked to vote on ballot initiatives, on homelessness or mental illness, we almost always pass them. We pass them, often we're just taxing millionaires, so it doesn't affect a lot of us. But we are often deciding to tax ourselves to pay for this problem. So I don't think it's the case that we don't care. Um, I want to argue that it actually has to do with several key policy choices that have been made that, we, that have become dogma in the state. And I come to this after the research for San Francisco, 
which came out of a visit to the Netherlands, in particular to Amsterdam, where I am friends with a member of parliament and her husband is a senior drug policy official who I asked about this question in, 19, in 2019 and I returned to Netherlands several times to shadow him to see his work with so-called homeless people that were on the street, addicts or people suffering mental illness. The first thing I wanna argue is that we need a statewide psychiatric and addiction care system, a single statewide addiction care system that I wanna call CalPsych. It would be a CEO best in class reporting to the governor with six regional directors and a cadre of assertive case managers who would be responsible to take care of difficult people uh, throughout their entire process of coming off the street through rehab or psych hospital, through shelters, to achieving their potential, whatever that might be. My aunt had schizophrenia, she lived in a group home, she drank coffee and smoked cigarettes all day long and flirted with the guys that worked there. Great outcome. Other people can be, great outcome. Other people, she never became homeless, she never became an addict, she never became a sex worker. Other people can become professors at USC, people with schizophrenia, that's amazing. Um, so whatever is their own personal potential. I estimate based on my own research and looking at a variety of other sources and interviewing people, I think probably somewhere like three quarters of the people on the street who we call homeless are just suffering addiction. They don't, I don't think they have serious mental illness as we might define it in terms of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Those folks just need rehab, they need to get reaffiliated with family and friends, they need to get a job, and they can achieve their full potential as human individuals. Um, there's other folks with some combination of those, it doesn't really matter, but I think what I wanna draw attention to is the need for the single statewide system. Why is that? Well, the first is that it's expensive, this kind of treatment is expensive, and we need to be able to move people into different parts of the state because our systems for dealing with this in San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, and other big cities, Oakland, the systems are overwhelmed, and they're not gonna stop being overwhelmed anytime soon. A single statewide psychiatric and addiction care system might mean that, let's say, somebody overdoses on the street for the third or sixth or ninth or twelfth time, a Cal Psych worker can be there, revive them, and say, Anna, we've revived you this many times. We can get you into rehab today and on a suboxone taper into rehab in some outside of the open drug scene because to Anna's point, of course, being around the drugs all the time is the worst thing for recovery. We can get you into 90-day, maybe 180-day, because we know meth addiction is very serious and difficult, inpatient rehab center outside of the open drug scene, and we can get you there now, immediate care. And we know that's such an important existential moment for people when they're deciding to get into recovery. I think the other thing I learned from the Netherlands, I think so often, we demonize the police, we say we don't want the police to be involved with this. That's not really fair to the police or to the reality of the situation. Many people hit bottom in an interaction with law enforcement. So I think rather than seeing the police as the enemy, we should see them as part of the system. So the CalPsych worker who's reviving Anna could say, Anna, we can get you into, into treatment right now, but it's not mandatory. You don't have to accept treatment. I, people misunderstand my own view on this. I don't think treatment should be mandatory. But we should enforce laws, because if you don't enforce laws, people don't follow them. And if people don't follow laws, then you don't have a civilization. You don't have cities. And so that means that the person would have a choice. You can come with us into rehab. Right now, we get you on a suboxone taper. Or my colleague, Officer Garcia, right here with the San Francisco Police Department, is going to arrest you because you've broken, we can see here, many laws open air drug use, public defecation, public camping, which by the way is illegal in San Francisco. People forget this. Public camping is actually illegal. It's only because the Board of Supervisors chooses not to enforce that law that it's not being enforced. And then the choice is up for that person. They can go to rehab or they can go to jail where there may or may not be a suboxone taper. So it would say we need statewide psychiatric addiction care system. We need to enforce laws. Do we also need, as, as Anna and Lisa and others have argued, an expansion of conservatorship, a change to the Landerman Petrus uh, rules, something more than 72 hours, something longer for people? Probably, but to start, we can just enforce existing laws and get a lot of people into rehab right now with this broader care system. In fact, we think a disaster response to this could become the embryo of CalPsych. What do I mean by that? 
If we had 150,000 people on the streets of California, across California, living in tents, being sexually assaulted repeatedly, and by the way, in our research, the numbers of women that are sexually assaulted approaches 100%. A number of, a number of men are being sexually assaulted on the streets, 100%. Okay, if they were overdosing and dying and killing each other or being stabbed with machetes, we would say that's a humanitarian disaster. If it was happening because of an earthquake, we would respond within hours, not days. So if we responded to this in the proper way as a humanitarian disaster, that response, which could include a statewide psychiatric and addiction care system, triage tents to get people the care they need, shelter, that would then become the embryo of the statewide psychiatric addiction care system, CalPsych. And it's just by creating a statewide system and, and enforcing local laws against the, the crimes that are being broken, the laws that are being broken. I think there's a third part to it that gets to this question of why is it that this disaster has gotten worse and worse, not better. We need to move away from a housing first policy. Housing first is failed. Those of you that advocate housing first, please explain to me how is it if housing first has been the policy for 17 years in California, beginning in San Francisco since 2004, how is it that the situation has only gotten worse, not better? The traditional answer is we haven't spent enough money on it, but we keep spending more and more money and the problem gets worse and worse. In the Netherlands, that, they don't have housing first. They say they have some housing first programs, but that's not what it is. It's contingency management. One of maybe the best proven treatment of addiction using housing and other rewards. It was started in Birmingham, Alabama. It's very simple. You're in congregant shelter. You would like your own room like everybody else. Pass the drug test and you get your own room. Fail the drug test. You don't go back out onto the street, but you go back to congregate shelter. It works. Is it perfect? No. Does it work better than the current policy? Absolutely. And I saw it in place in, the, in Amsterdam with the social workers. Everybody wants their own room, a private room. Are you taking your psych meds? If not, we're not going to get you a private room. Are you passing your drug test? If not, you're, gonna get, you're not going to get your own private room. We arranged a job for you. You haven't been going. We're not going to give you a private room. It's contingency management, and we know that addicts, many addicts need that reward in order for their own recovery. But, it, but setting that aside, I believe that taxpayers also have some, are also involved in this. Taxpayers are actually really tired of what's going on. They're sick of the chaos, and they are a factor in this. And if we don't take taxpayers and our fellow citizens seriously and are just completely client-focused, then we're going to, this issue is, we're headed for some real trouble. So this needs to take into effect that cities are not just for addicts and drug dealers. They need to be for all citizens. You know, it was just, when I moved here in the 1990s, there were so many smug conferences held at Stanford and Berkeley and San Francisco describing how we are a model for the world with our livable, walkable cities. Green, livable, walkable cities. Well, there's two parts of downtown San Francisco that are not livable or walkable right now, south of Market and the Tenderloin. I was seven minutes into a walk through the Tenderloin with a reporter from the Times of London, and we see a guy overdosing, face turning blue, roll, being rolled out of a tent. Yeah, we got Narcan to him, and we called 911, but this is unacceptable. My 16-year-old daughter can't walk from a, safely from a BART stop in downtown San Francisco. That should be our criteria. Can teenagers walk safely in your downtown? They can do that in Amsterdam. They can do that in Amsterdam, Frankfurt, Lisbon, Vienna, Zurich. Don't take my word for it. Look up open drug scenes on Google Scholar, and you'll see that every one of those cities shut down the open drug scenes, and they did it the same way with social workers and police officers, shelter first, housing earned, universal psychiatric and addiction care. We can do the same thing in California. We are all so much better than the humanitarian disaster taking place on the streets. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to take the first one. So you can sit yeah. maybe here. Ah, sit here. You want me here? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's good. And then it's maybe Alyssa. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much. That's wonderful. Um, so I will just try to keep the conversation short because I know there are probably a lot of questions from the audience. Um, and maybe I will just start by asking, um, since we already talked about mental illness and drug addiction, can we rely on self-reported data to get an accurate sense of how many people, what percentage of people 
unsheltered homeless are suffering from mental illness and or drug addiction? You want to go first? Yeah, sure. <laughs> the first answer is no. Of course you can't because there's a social stigma and it's often illegal to be using drugs on the street. That being said, I have found, it, I have found people, particularly in San Francisco, but really across California, to be pretty open these days about their drug use. And you can go on to my Twitter page or my YouTube page and you can see my interviews with people. Even the ones that sort of deny drug use will then acknowledge it within about five or 10 minutes of us sitting down and talking with them about it. I would also just wanna say, I'm not sure it matters. In other words, these are the, we need to do Cal Psych, shelter first housing earned and enforce laws. Whether there's, whether 25% of the people on the streets are addicts or 95%, it doesn't matter. We need the systems in place, we need the institutions in place to solve this problem, regardless over who's right or wrong in this particularly academic debate about how many people on the streets are addicts or mentally ill. Thank you. So I'll just add that with the, the, the question of whether or not you can trust self-reporting when it comes to severe mental illness, you definitely can't because about 40% of people suffer from a condition called anosognosia, so they don't actually recognize their own illness. They have a neurological difference that makes it impossible for them to perceive the symptoms of their illness. So obviously, if you were to ask somebody and they said they did not have mental illness, 40% of the time they could be completely wrong, and if you just took their word for it, you would also be wrong. Anything? I don't have much to add, just it's all context dependent. You know, if they're in a situation where they feel safe, then they'll disclose, and if they don't and there are negative consequences, they might, may not. I feel a lot of times um, we don't feel comfortable of talking about mental illness and, drug, and or drug addiction because we don't want to stigmatize this specific subset of the population. So what shall we do? We should talk about it. <laughs> the fear of not talking about it, the fear of the stigma reinforces the stigma. We should talk about it. When I interview people on the street, I ask them, I just go, so what's your drug of choice? N super normal, super matter of factly. I similarly ask women, I ask men too, have you been assaulted? Have you been assaulted more than once? What was the situation like that? You know, this, we're in a, in a state and in a community and in a moment where people are obsessed with being trauma informed but the people that are going on and on all the time about being trauma-informed want to remain trauma-disinformed, I find. They don't want to talk about it. I mean, I'm being, every time I talk about it, and I mentioned that I described this in San Francisco, there's usually somebody that's out there accusing me of stigmatizing people for wanting to talk about it. So yeah, we absolutely have to talk. We have to talk about it openly. We need stories. We need people to tell their stories. We need recovering addicts in particular to tell their stories. Victimization is not the end of the story. Being a victim, being an addict is not the end of the story. It's a moment in a process of becoming a hero. Yeah. And so there's a heroism of recovery. We need to elevate those stories, the stories of recovery, not just the stories of addiction and of mental illness. I don't really like to, um, I don't really like to emphasize stigma as a major cause of why people don't get treatment. It's not that it isn't real. Stigma is a real thing. Uh, but I also think that you know the part of stigma that people kind of don't talk about, um, which to me is a much bigger driver, is the systemic stigmatization of mental illness. And what I mean by that is our decision that we aren't going to address mental illness by not requiring companies to pay yeah. for their care, uh, by allowing um, awareness campaigns to replace outreach campaigns, you know, I think stigma is something that gets trotted out all the time, is, is something that we should focus on first. And as soon as we uh, eliminate stigma, then we'll uh, worry about treating illnesses. And I, you know, we're never going to get there. So um, I, I, I think it's, I would much rather focus on the discrimination factor that is systemic in nature, because the responsibility, I, I can't control what individuals think, but we should have an expectation from our systems that they won't treat this kind of illness and only this kind of illness differently. Anna? Yeah, yeah, I really like that. And I would add that the disease model of addiction, I think, has really helped us not just reduce stigma, but advocate for the building of an infrastructure to actually treat people with the disease of addiction and support research to study addiction. Um, so I think that's really key, the systemic piece. You know, I 
get paid by relative value units, um, as most doctors do at Stanford. And I make in 10 minutes the same amount of relative value units that an ophthalmologist. I know I make in an hour what an ophthalmologist makes in 10 minutes. Um, so our whole healthcare system is, uh, does not incentivize or reimburse uh, you know, mental health treatment, and that, that's really the biggest crime of all because people won't do that work if you don't uh, pay them to do it. Thank you. Um, I guess my next question is for Lisa, uh, in particular, uh, because you are an expert on uh, mental illness. Uh, so we know that a lot of people now are not receiving proper and adequate treatment for their mental illness. So how do we get here? Could you walk us through some historical background? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, the way we ended up here, where uh, the primary places where you find people receiving any kind of treatment, or at least um, you know where you find the largest populations of people who are mentally ill, either would be you know within homeless populations, but probably more importantly in jails and prisons, is because uh, you know as we decreased our um, hospital pop our hospital bed census. We did absolutely nothing to replace it with anything else, which I know we've talked about a little bit in earlier sessions today, but I can't really overemphasize the impact that that has had. And because you can actually see there's a direct relationship between as hospital beds began to taper and disappear, the population that used to be in those beds began to be in jails and prisons. It's an exact replica. So that is how we ended up there. It's not the only factor, but it's certainly a big one because uh, not having treatment beds available for people basically led to a situation where individuals didn't really have an alternative. And the longer that they remained in the community untreated, the more likely they were to run into law enforcement, end up in the criminal justice system, and find themselves criminalized. Uh, that is really where we are. We, we do not actually treat mental illness. We punish symptoms of mental illness. Thank you. So um, besides the shortage in mental health treatment, what about drug treatment? Do we also have a shortage? I guess Anna and Michael, do you guys know anything about that? So I guess I'm going to piggyback a little bit on what Lisa was saying. First of all, I think an important message out there is that we have effective treatments for addiction, and that treatment works, and we can be very hopeful about that. And it's often a myth that people think that People with addiction will always be addicted, won't get into recovery, and that's absolutely not true. Um, but it's also true that you need a functioning prefrontal cortex for addiction to treatment to work because it really relies on the, the ability of that person to engage in the biopsychosocial kinds of interventions that we know work. Um, so who are the people in the population, as I alluded to, who don't have a fully functioning prefrontal cortex? Teenagers. Right, which is why they're difficult to treat. Um, older people who are demented, and then people with certain types of severe mental illness. So although I would want you to leave here um, knowing that we have a lot of good and effective evidence-based treatments for addiction, I don't want you to be naive about the fact that there are people for whom our addiction treatments don't work. And for those individuals, access is not going to make a difference, which is, again, why I emphasize for a subset of the severely mentally ill and addicted individuals, we really need to create a therapeutic and probably locked environment for them to live. I have treated many, many young people, especially with schizophrenia and severe methamphetamine addiction, from wonderful families who will not be able to not use drugs as long as they have access to those drugs. And it's just absolutely devastating for these families. And there really is no solution except for a locked facility. Michael, you have anything I to add? I just admire your bravery. <laughs> I do. I mean, wow. Um, I mean, I just, I think there's, I think I'm going to make a couple of points. I mean, I think the first is that for me, before I got into this research, Treatment meant something that was done to you. Mm -hmm. And I like the word, I like the use of the word recovery. The, and I think you said it really well, Anna, in your talk, which is mm -hmm. it's about reestablishing the agency of the person. Mm -hmm. People, I mean, there's a, there, one of the responses that we hear a lot is people say, well, people have to hit bottom. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think that we're lowering the bottom in California. We're lowering the, we're reducing the consequences for people's own behaviors. 
We need to raise the bottom. So I think that's a, that is a helpful metaphor. But I do think we sometimes go, and I agree with you also that I do think that the, the, the medical model is helpful here. But I do think it has this implication. I think people hear it as though we just go bring an addict to a rehab center and then something is given to them. And then we, people, this is the, a suboxone illusion. We give them suboxone and they'll be fine. Right. You know, there's a very famous harm reduction advocate who was a huge advocate of suboxone who just OD'd a few weeks ago. We can't quite figure out exactly what's going on, but we see this quite a bit. We know that it has to come from within, and so I think that that's part of the challenge here. I think the other thing is that we're still, there's still this huge overhang of one flew over the cuckoo's nest. You know, it's just, it's an old movie that's not psychiatry anymore. It probably really wasn't psychiatry back then either, um, but that's just such a huge overhang. Like when you read Sheila Kuehl, describing why she, you know, she's a LA City Council member, why she's opposed to expanding conservatorship. Look at the response to Britney, Britney Spears. You know, the first, we don't know what the deal is with Britney Spears and her dad. We just don't know, like nobody knows. But if you look at the response to that, I watched the HBO documentary, the New York Times documentary with my wife, and it was instantly that she was being victimized by the medical system. So I do think, one of the realities is that a lot of people, that because we, and we're just, America also is just obsessed with freedom in ways that the Netherlands isn't. In the Netherlands, the social workers, they can put some pressure on you, you know, in ways that are a little off the books to get you into the help you need. We would have ACLU lawsuits like that if they did the kind of things here that they do in the Netherlands. So the consequence of that, unfortunately, is a lot of people are going to get an interaction with law enforcement before they get the help they need. I agree with you, that's not the way I would want it. That's not the way I would want it for myself or for my kids, but I think that is part of the reality here. We were talking before the talk about insight and this issue of people not having insight, and I kind of left some of that stuff out of the book, in part because it just really freaks out Americans that you would have a doctor deciding whether or not you're mentally ill before you've committed any crime or done anything. So I think this is a really tricky area and it is one of the reasons I want to sort of defend the role of police in helping people to get that care they need, because I think in some ways that's easier for Americans to get their heads around than allowing a bunch of psychiatrists to decide who's mentally ill and who's not, and who should get treatment and conservatorship and who shouldn't. Um, sorry. Uh, should, we, should we open up to the floor? I'm not, yeah. I forgot. I've Her hand went up right so quick. You must have something five interesting. Minutes. Yeah. yeah, let's open up to the floor then. <laughs> I'm going to abuse this. Um, so, you know, like, you guys have provided this great lens into, you know, like, how to think about addiction and all of this. One of the ways in which the U.S. is very different than the Netherlands is that we have a real history of racism. We talked this morning about how racism shows up in systemic ways, in terms of our employment system, in terms of our housing system, um, in terms of our policing, and so... Do you guys want to talk a little bit about how, you know, what you're recommending intersects with that? Well, I, I'll jump in there. You know, I think we can look to other countries for models, but we have to be really careful about assuming that importing that model will work in our countries. In our country. So, for example, drug courts. Um, HOPE is an example of a drug court system in Hawaii, which was very effective using contingency management to shape behavior of people with addiction in the criminal justice system to get them into recovery. What is contingency management? It's the use of punishment and reward commensurate with the transgression in real time in order to shape behavior. A wonderful example of contingency management in this country is South Dakota's 24-7 sobriety, where they have an active recidivism problem with DUI offenders. And typically what they would do for a DUI offender was say, well, you're now going to have to go back into the court system and possibly two years from now go to prison. And that had zero impact on the people who were relapsing and getting more DUIs. Then they changed it to contingency management, and they made the punishment swift and immediate. They said you have to wear a bracelet if you consume alcohol while you're supposed to be you know, uh, on probation, you have to spend the night that night in jail and then you're released. And they saw a 10 to 20% reduction in their DUI recidivism rate. So there's a good example of the criminal justice system interfacing uh, with people with addiction uh, to use contingency management in order to shape behavior in a positive direction. So getting back to your question, 
uh, the drug court, the Hope uh, drug system, was imported to a place like Oregon, and it failed miserably. And we're not really sure why, but it just didn't work. Also, same thing with um, you know, a safe injection sites, which seem to work in some communities, but are an unmitigated disaster in others. Mm -hmm. It's just a way to speak more broadly to this issue that we can look for models in other contexts, but we have to be really respectful of the impact of that context, including issues of you know, racism and our historical legacy for whether or not that system will work. I guess before I open up to the floor, I do have one remaining question for Lisa. Um, I, I do really want to ask you about care court oh. and how is that going to be different from Laura's Law, for example? Okay, so care courts are still in the process of um, being made into sausage, so we don't really know exactly what they're going to be. So, I mean, it, there's still a lot up in the air. You know, prior, op, prior attempts to kind of get at the issue of what do we mean when we say gravely disabled have like definitely in committee really been changed a lot from how it was introduced. So we don't know what this is gonna end up looking like. Um, but I will say that there are three things about care courts that I really like. And I really hope that whatever ends up coming out contains these three things because they'd be a big improvement one way or the other. One of them is the fact that they are meant to prioritize this population. So they really specifically do, you know, this is meant for individuals that have psychosis as part of their illness. It's really one of the first times that any attempt has been made to prioritize this extraordinarily overlooked population. That's a big deal. The other thing is that it does open up the ability to initiate the process. So it gives direct access to the courts to people other than law enforcement and other than hospitals. That actually doesn't exist in California, which I think a lot of people don't maybe know. But if you actually wanted to initiate a 5150 in California, you really only have a couple of options and individuals don't have the ability to petition the courts and start a process. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not always the way that these things get started, but it's like not having that as a safety valve means that the decision about whether or not somebody is really doing poorly enough that they need help is in the hands of people who have like a 15 second interaction with that person. You really don't get a full picture. You're not, you know, a lot of times they don't even, you know, like have, there's not an opportunity for people who see somebody every day to say, Here's, here's what I've noticed. Here's a pattern that I know that this person follows. This is what happened the last three times that this person was in this cycle. So that's a really big deal. And it's something that, you know, Laura's Law has, it adds a little bit so that you can actually petition the system, but you're still petitioning the system to see if somebody can get into Laura's Law. They're required to do an investigation, but you really can't have access to the courts. So that's so a big just, deal. Sorry, just to clarify, so a family member could initiate a 5150 on a, on a, on a some, someone in their family or someone they were worried about? Is that what, is that what uh, care courts? No, they can't. What they can do is they can call 911. But I mean, with care courts, that would change, right? Oh, they, well, they can't. It, it's not a 5150, mm -hmm. but they, they can initiate. The, they are designed so that the individual can be petition to start the process of care courts. A that family is, member. A, a family, family member. member. Actually, yeah. it's, it's set up so any individual mm -hmm that has the requisite knowledge to file that petition can start the process. It doesn't mean that it's granted, but it means you can start the process. You have access to the courts. So that's, that's one thing. And then the thing that I like the best about care courts, which has come up a little bit um, so far today, is that it has a mechanism to actually hold counties to task if they don't willingly treat this population. You're ordering individuals um, to be a part of this process, but you're actually also able to penalize the counties if they don't follow through and make those services available. And I think a lot of people who work in this system are aware of the fact that this is really where things are falling down in California, is that if people don't want to, to have as clients really difficult patients who really don't want to be part of it, they can just ignore them. They can just, they, and, they, and they do, they're invisible to the system. If they're not actually actively seeking care, they're not gonna get care, and nobody's going to bother anybody about that. And it, it's, it works great for people who are trying to avoid care only in that they're not receiving care. Everything else is terrible. Uh, but it also basically lets the counties off the hook for providing the, the, the care that is needed for like the really tough end of the spectrum. 
And Care Courts actually does have a mechanism that would prevent that, which I hope that stays in there because that's new. That would be a really big deal for California. And what is that mechanism? It's, a, it's actually, it's a financial mechanism where they can fine like $1,000 a day for counties that are not providing services when the, if, if the person has been identified as being eligible for care court and the, the county is, is ordered to provide those services, if they don't, then they are going to lose money. And that's one of the only things I can think of that might actually get action. It's, I don't think it's going to work. I'll tell you right now, because it's the same thing that he's trying to do with the building more housing. You know, the governor says, we're going to find the counties. They're going to sue Huntington Beach if they don't build more housing. Um, in that case, I'm not sure that, that there's an alternative. But the other alternative is you have a single statewide system a single agency that is responsible for it. Otherwise, th that care courts, I mean, I'm glad you've articulated it. It depends on our existing county-based care system, which is fundamentally broken. It can't, I don't think it can work. 58 counties offering duplicative services, overlapping services, so you get these redundancy, I mean, redundancies and gaps in the system. They're saying we're gonna overlay to this broken system yet another court system and then we're going to punish counties $1,000 a day. I, I got to say, color me very skeptical of that. I think you need a proper care system where there's hierarchies, where there's people who are in trouble, like not a fine down the road, but like you have to take care of that person now. Or if you're not, then you're fired or somebody else will get in there and do it. Well, I will say that. You know, I mean, I think that that's fair, but I also think that setting up a statewide system takes a long time, and we need to do something now. I don't think it has to take a long time. I mean, why would it? Because it doesn't. I mean... I, I guess I see so Mark on. has a yeah. question over there for a long time. <clears throat> okay, so I, I'm just going to shift things a little bit. Um, so in 2009 and 2010, I was very proud to work on uh, President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. And what I worked on was Obamacare. And as a result of Obamacare, 100 months ago in California, the state initiated the biggest ever expansion of a program called Medi-Cal. And beginning January 2014, if you look a couple months before January 2014, there were eight and a half million Californians on Medi-Cal. Six months after January 2014, there were 13 million Californians on Medi-Cal. Four and a half million increment to the number of people getting health insurance in California, differentially males, differentially young adult males, tens of billions of, money, of dollars from the federal government has poured into California's healthcare system as a result of this. I worked very, like this is something I'm super proud of, but I'm just, it's kind of a mystery to me when I think of, and I didn't think of this until today, Jalou, when you presented and hearing the conversations today, things went off the rails for some reason in California in 2014. The trend, you see the trend break, right? 24, from 2014 to 2020, the number of people who are homeless in California went up 42% in per capita terms. Texas, for example, no expansion of Medi-Cal, Medicaid there, declined during this time period. I guess I'm just, then you add to this, this 1% tax, that brings the California top marginal rate to 13.3% on millionaires, which we heard from the mayor of Sacramento, $3.8 billion this year flowing into the healthcare system. I'm just kind of confused. How is that all of that additional money not helping the very people we are talking about here? It is kind of a mystery to me. Like, I worked on Obamacare. I'm super proud of it. I have papers saying it did some great things. <laughs> but I'm just kind of baffled. Like, it was the biggest, it was billed as the biggest change in domestic public policy since the introduction of Medicare and Medicaid in 1965. It coincides with exactly where things, I, can, do any of you have any idea? Like, I, I'm a health economist. I like to see what's the bang for the buck of incremental spending. Do, do you just know, didn't have, didn't matter? Did it not help Well, I mean, I can, talk, I can talk a little bit about Prop 63 and part of what the issue is there is that, like, the counties are sitting a lot, on a lot of that money instead of spending it. That's a problem. There's also the fact that the Little Hoover Commission over and over again has come up with the same idea that basically, like, we don't have enough top-down oversight of this fund to make sure that this fund is actually going to who it's intended for. Now, that fund was very specifically passed to target people with severe mental illness. Over and over again, we're finding that, you know, the, that 
the oversight isn't adequate to make sure that the money is actually going where it's supposed to be going. Um, and as a result, um, you know, like we're not seeing the impacts that we might, but we don't really seem to have the ability to change that. So, I mean, I, I, I do agree that like part of this is that we need, think, we need a little bit less of like a local variant that can kind of do whatever it wants. And like, we do need some more top-down oversight to make sure that funds are actually used the way that they're supposed to be. I, th I think the problem is that we do not have a robust infrastructure inside the House of Medicine to treat mental health and addictive disorders. We have centers of excellence for cancer. We do a great job for you know uh, all kinds of chronic illnesses, uh, diabetes, heart disease. We do not have the workforce, and we do not have the infrastructure to, to treat mental health disorders and addiction. Those are often siloed, often separate entities. Even mental health and addiction are siloed and separate. Um, so I think that's the huge problem, and we're trying now to build up that workforce with you know, various incentives, but also I can tell you as a mental health care specialist, you're going to make a fraction of what a surgeon is going to make. So after all that time and all that debt, you don't have a lot of people who are super eager to go into mental health care treatment. A little bit of a silver lining, though, I can tell you that the biggest change in my professional career when it comes to insurance coverage was Obamacare, when for the very first time, because of the parity laws, and the open exchange, people had at least insurance coverage to pay for mental health and addiction treatment, which they did not have in the first half of my career. Okay, so I would just so thank issue you. a challenge, though, to you. <laughs> Anna, I issue a challenge to you. If okay. you can tell me what data set to look at oh, no, I to can't show <laughs> that the $3.8 billion, <laughs> I, I and just, you know what I mean, improved mental yeah. health and health, I would just love to see it. Because like, I, yeah. I want it to be true. I want it to have benefited. Yeah. Mental no, I, I didn't say that. I, I'm, 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 I'm validating that on a large scale, we don't have good access to those treatments because we don't have the infrastructure. Okay, so it just didn't improve things. We don't okay. have the workforce. We don't have the infrastructure. But for people who had the wherewithal, for whatever reason, to use insurance to get the treatment, those people at least get it paid for now. That's okay. my point. Okay, so, so yes, right? And remember, in my, I did address this. Huge amounts of money has gone into this space, and yet... We don't have the beds. We don't have the psychiatric beds in the hospitals. We don't have the shelters. I was just in Fresno, and they were, the shelters were full. The women were, you know, these people were outside because they couldn't get in the shelters. We don't have the rehab. We don't have the detox. We don't have the detox. No we detox. don't have the group homes. So you're asking, where did the money go instead? Am I right? Sure. Yeah. The money went into housing first. So it goes into $750,000 per unit housing complexes. Very expensive housing. Um, it goes into nonprofits that do not implement these, uh, that does not do this work. Um, I mean, that explains it. Yeah, There's I just not... have to, I need an answer when my friends at UT Austin and Texas A&M yeah. taunt me and say, Mark, you guys expanded Obamacare. We didn't. And it actually looks like things have gotten worse in California. Anyway, so I just, I want it, I want them to, I want to come back and, anyway, thank you, thank you. But I so maybe this that. gentleman here, he's, yeah, the nearest husband. <laughs> <laughs> Proud to finally be identified as Danea's husband. <laughs> I've been waiting for that. All right. Um, this might be a question for you, Michael. I've read your book, found it incredibly fascinating. And... To, to your question, Mark, around timing, 2014, 2015, <clears throat> Prop 47 and decriminalization, um, you know, several folks have talked about law enforcement's inability to actually do anything about this on the streets right now. And a lot of what you talked about says that they will be able to going forward. What happens to Prop 47 in your proposal? It almost certainly needs to be reformed. Can you go into a little more depth on that? Well, that's a policy question, right? I mean, I'm not... Policy questions are allowed, but not campaign questions. We're not allowed to say, if he becomes yeah. the governor, what's no. he going to do? I was do? just going to say, what should happen? No, I'm, right? I'm talking about specifically to, you know, an idea like CalPsych or something like this. Like, yeah. whatever you want to call it, whoever does it, yeah. when you're just talking policy, about it's fine. law enforcement on the streets being able to help yeah. that situation, they're there with a mental health professional, they're law enforcement what can actually be done yeah. because all of these drug enforcements have been declassified to misdemeanors. I've spoken with a lot of law enforcement in Sacramento where we're from. The best they can do is give somebody a citation 
but nothing's actually happening. And, and then, to your point, Anna, it's access, right? <clears throat> so it doesn't just start in the city, it's, it's happening in the suburbs. The access is in the suburbs. These people, like you wrote in your book, are then ending up in the city, and that's where we're seeing the problem. The unseen problem is actually happening in the suburbs because of the access to, to these illicit drugs. So the short answer is we don't know how many people we can get off the street into rehab, psych beds, shelters, group homes, under existing laws. I think a lot, I don't, I mean, quantifying it is impossible without changing those laws. How many would we, then we would need to change Prop 47. I give that example where somebody ODs on the street and you're like, you can come into rehab or you can go to jail by the office. That assumes that, that if they have under three grams of drugs under Prop 47, that's a misdemeanor. Now, if it's a misdemeanor, you can still arrest them or cite them. If there's public camping, if there's other things going on, if it's a chop shop and there's obviously goods there, I mean, one bite can be worth more than $950. So, um, so we don't know how many people we get off the street if we had a proper care system. So you basically have an argument here where there's lip progressives who are like, we don't have a proper psychiatric addiction care system. They're right, we don't. That's why we need CalPsych. You have conservatives who say, we don't have the law enforcement tools to get people into rehab. They're also right. So my argument is, let's start with the care system. We've got the money. You've got the goodwill for it in a state that's pretty darn liberal. And let's see how much of this problem we can address without adding criminal penalties, which Californians have been pretty reluctant to do. I do think we're going to need to bring back some of them, but we just don't know. I mean, in terms of the money, just so you know, I mean, David Chu, Tom Insull, the LAO, they can't figure out where the money's going. So, I mean, it's not like it's been looked at. At a certain point, I was just kind of like, with the book, you're like, Housing, very expensive housing, a lot of nonprofits, a lot of service providers, but it, and yet we still don't have the facilities. So now you can spend a lot. I've had various people be like, we need to do an audit. Great, but at the end of the day, you still need the psychiatric and addiction care system, and you still need the services working with law enforcement to get people into care. At the end of the day, you still have to take action. Okay, we probably have like three questions. So here we have yeah. one, and then one in the back, and then the lady could, in black. Could, could you just tell us a what you're thinking about the numbers and types of professionals required to staff this statewide system? Yeah, I mean, I would say the most expensive part of the system is the psychiatrists, yeah. folks like Anna. The good news is that most people don't need, I mean, they don't need a psychiatrist for many hours. They need uh, some sort of a diagnosis. Um, physician's assistants, nurse practitioners can prescribe Suboxone or Methadone. Like, if you have a CalPsych van, or CalPsych vans up and down California, they don't need to have MDs in them. They don't need to have psychiatrists in them. They, need, they could be EMTs. So there's a lot of that. There's also, we just need a lot of rehab facilities. I mean, it's, it is daunting, the amount of facilities we would need. On the other hand, we have the, and this is one of the craziest things. We have I just, so I just much money and we don't have the workforce. Sorry, I just want to jump in. What we really, the, I, the, we don't need vans with buprenorphine. We need hospital beds for people to detox. Yep. We need sober living environments. We need res, long-term residential facilities and we need locked facilities. We need beds. We need treatment, housing, those things combined. Yep. Amen. You Amen. need some vans too. That's very good. Thank you. I really appreciate your knowledge, um, but I think it's a panel up there, and it's not just you. You're pretty much, in my opinion, taking over, and that's okay for Sorry. them, but I'll not talk for less. me. I'm a licensed alcohol and drug counselor, and I'm retired. I worked in the Santa Clara County with Drug Treatment Court. Very successful. This is where they had um, people with addictions under the jurisdiction of the judge and the, and the criminal justice. They walked them through. They engaged them in mental health through Dr. Fu and other doctors. It's a, a wraparound service provider, and I've seen a lot of success. Now I'm currently an outreach case manager for We Hope, dealing with substance use, dealing with homelessness, dealing with mental health on a daily basis. What I've noticed a lot we haven't discussed was sleep deprivation. Now, I know mental health is definitely a medical issue, but because of substance use and also not being able to get sleep, we get a lot of sleep deprivation, which, which 
looks like mental health because they're not seriously getting enough rest for them to act functionally. Uh, my concern right now is we need to work more together to deal with wraparound services that will deal with the substance use, that will deal with the THUs, the sobriety living, that will deal with the mental health. It will deal with all these components that are keeping our unhoused people unhoused. I would like for us to spend a little bit more time listening to all of us instead of one or two people where really one person taking over the whole panel. And that's just my opinion. Appreciate that. I was being asked questions directly, but okay. And I guess the lady in black. Thank you. Oh, that's all right. Thank you. So, uh, oh, who's oh, next? You're both wearing Go right black. Ahead. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. All right. Go ahead. Okay. Well, you might you might wish it was the other way around, but that's okay. Um, I um, my name's Helene Schneider. I'm with the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness. I'm a former elected official in the state of California in local office. I just bring that up as context. Um, to respectfully but very strongly disagree with your assessment of Housing First. Uh, housing First is not housing only. It's wraparound services dedicated to the person involved in whatever is necessary. It is not being scaled up the way it should be. I think everyone, uh, earlier today we talked about veteran homelessness. From 2010 to 2020, veteran homelessness went down by over 50%. Uh, including California where, as we heard earlier, it almost flatlined when other areas was going up. That is the combination of housing with needed supportive services around it. Um, I think one of the things to get to the question of what happened in 2014 and the number of uh, units or number of people experiencing homelessness going up in California in particular, we have to remember there was a thing called the Redevelopment Agency, which was not perfect at all, but did provide a billion dollars every year directly to capital of affordable housing. Over time, we've lost that money. We've lost um, one billion a year now for over a decade. So finding that new source of funding is really something of a policy issue we need to address. Um, it's almost three, it's almost the time we can you know, talk more and debate more about that, but I do think in terms of Housing First, the $750,000 per unit, whole lot of other issues we talked about today. My question, just to get to the other side, is what would a housing and surrounded services look like in your mind that would work in terms of the collaborative nature that would have to require between your housing authorities, your mental, self, your mental health services, your counties, um, and other agencies involved to make that work to scale in California. Thank you. Well, I mean, I am not an expert on housing policy, but I will tell you that um, for a population that it has psychosis at sort of the root of the issue. Um, I think treatment needs to be a prioritized before housing, um, and that's based somewhat on personal experience with you know a relative that I have, who um, you know like there were her reasons for being homeless. Really, she had a place to go. She thought it was haunted, uh, and so like her being there um, without being treated would have not solved the issue. So I just always think of her. And I think of people who are in that situation and I think, would it work? And for her, that wouldn't work. So I need, I need a system that would actually be able to help her. I'll jump in there and just venture to say that I think it needs to start with a detox bed and then treatment for addiction, which begins after detox is over. So a safe, and I will call it restricted environment where the individual doesn't have access to drugs, can get their limbic system and their prefrontal cortex reconnected, can get any additional uh, psychiatric medications or treatment that they need, can get a good outpatient plan, and then can go into either a sober living environment. These are communities that we really know make a difference. The evidence is very strong, so that they can at least have a fighting chance to manage their dual diagnosis going forward. That's not housing first, but it's a kind of housing. It can it's, it's, a, it's a recognition that shelter matters. So shelter, so, so I'm sorry, because so we're, we're all here for the same reason, so yes. to fix the damn problem, and we're getting divisive. That's I okay. I just want to make sure I understand, because everyone remembers I'm sleep deprived. So what you just said, what you both experts just said, was you have to treat stuff first, not give them a house first. Is that, that's what I heard, right? It is my belief, based okay. on my experience, treating people with addiction and co-occurring mental health disorders, that, that you have to mandate treatment in many of those individuals, and you have to restrict their access long enough 
for them to get their prefrontal cortex functioning so that they can make informed choices. So if you want to say that that's not housing first, then I, then I agree with you. It's not housing first. But to me, it's a type of housing. What we're saying is you can't get somebody well who's living on the street. Right. Well, I would just I would just say that they, like there is an option that we're not really talking about, and it's like you could actually stabilize people before you discharge them, and then maybe housing first would work. But we're like nowhere near that. You know, people are in the hospital for like maybe two days. Yeah. Michael, last words, and I see Mark is right there, so we're gonna. Sorry, there was still a question there. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, uh, last question, maybe last question. Uh, yes. So. Um, my question is kind of twofold. So one thing that you mentioned was um, getting the police involved in um, uh, handling the mentally ill. Well, I don't know how that works outside of the people of color community, but I've personally witnessed um, uh, the police being called in on a person of color who was mentally ill. They were told in advance that the person was mentally ill and to um, apprehend them, they dislocated their shoulder, they slammed their foot in the door. And so for me, without them being professionally trained on how to deal with people with mental illness, I wouldn't want them involved at all. And I'd like to hear um, your response on that. And then the other part is that, um, I'm sorry, I can't even mention the other part right now, I'm a little emotional, but if you could at least speak on that. I think she was asking me, and I just want to say I was asked directly, I believe, and I can hear the emotion in your voice on that. My aunt suffered schizophrenia. She was badly treated at the beginning. I totally understand, and obviously that's the problem we don't want to have. We need people to get the care they need before law enforcement gets involved. My point is that I find that in my conversations and my research, there are very many people in our state that are not comfortable imposing mandatory treatment on people who have not broken any rules. They're comfortable with voluntary treatment. And so that leads to a problem when somebody with mental illness or in a psychotic state for whatever reason, whether from underlying mental illness or from meth or whatever, is engaging in illegal behavior or threatening behavior, violent behavior, that often is a moment that law enforcement does get involved. Should the law enforcement be better trained? Absolutely. Do we want to get people the care they need? Absolutely. It's clearly not happening now, which is why I agree we need a statewide psychiatric addiction care system. We need the facilities that we've all been talking about here. And I think we need to have a good relationship between social services and police rather than excluding police because they're going to be involved no matter what. Well, I just want to say that I actually agree with you uh, that um, I, this, and we diverge on this, I basically, I, I don't think that you want to have any more interactions between individuals with mental illness, particularly men mental illness and people of color and law enforcement than you absolutely need. Now, there are going to be interactions between people uh, who are in crisis and law enforcement where like law enforcement has to be there because maybe there's a weapon or what have you. But generally speaking, it's just a bad matchup. People who are in law enforcement have a limited number of moves that they can make. Uh, and people who have severe mental illness and have cognitive dysfunction, especially if they're in psychosis, do not behave in predictable ways. So the way that you avoid that interaction, because you can't always, but the way that you avoid it is you have to be willing to intervene earlier before a person is in a flat out emergency, before you have to call 911. And you know, I hate to say this because I know it's it's not super popular, but this is kind of the problem that we have: is that you know people really want to think of involuntary treatment as being the absolute last thing that you should be willing to do. But if you do that, if you have the belief that you have to wait until you have no other options, you will be calling 911. Okay, I see Mark is standing there, so we probably should get out of here. But let's thank all the great panelists. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. And let's, uh, let's reconvene at 322. We've got a great uh, session that I'll be moderating with Senator Scott Wiener. And please uh, make sure to come back. I'm moderating. And I'm insecure, so I want to have a lot of people here. So anyway. <laughs>
grab uh, Tom Wolf to get him over here to get the uh, video. Okay, and we've determined Vern. Vern has that. No slides. Yeah. Moderator. Yeah. We'll probably have no slides for that. Falcon, we'll just keep Falcon this up. does, actually. Okay. Um, so, but we can do that during dinner and reception. So. Sure. Yes, that was pretty easy. Sure. I'll try not to swear too much. <laughs> Thank you. Our, our, our video guys like to keep it on, so that way people on the web know that they're still getting something. I'm going to go find Tom. Thank you so much. Boy, she's me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah. If I could meet up with uh, Tom. Yes, yeah, I'm going to go. Okay, cool. Okay, here we go. This one right here. Okay. It's a it's a minute and sixteen seconds. And, and we want to show the entire video. Yeah, one, it's one minute and sixteen seconds. So okay. this one right here. Right. That's all. I just want to show that as part of like my speech. So I'll talk for a minute, then I'll play the video, sure. and then I'll keep talking. And that's it. Instead of showing uh, slides. No slides, video. Okay. Yeah, no slides, cool. man. Just that. Is that so cool? what, I'll, what I'll do is uh, when you come up to talk, I'll come over and, and we'll switch to this because I'll have to go. Um, yeah, because if I take this full screen, yeah. this is full screen here but not there. Got it. So I'll have to drag it over. Okay. Or let me try one thing real quick. No, darn it. There's a black to this screen out, though. Oh. Okay. So, oh, how are you going to be able to play it? Yeah. Yeah. So, 
We'll get it to go. Okay. I'll just have to slide it over when the time comes. Okay. Let's make sure I can. I mean, I could even leave it there for now. Okay. And. Tell me more about the hearing it and seeing it. Sure. So, I mean, I could press play right there too. It's up to you. No, I'll, I'll, I'll get you squared away. Okay. Cool. All right. All right, thanks, Sean. Anything else? We're good? No, I think we're good. Yeah, sure. Make sure you get, go in the back and get your microphone. Yeah. What, uh, It'll be better to do that before we end the break. Yeah. Just to kind of keep the traffic down back there. Okay. While we're uh, trying to move stuff. Sure. Thanks, Sean.
Okay, T minus two minutes, I'm gonna start. So please return to your seats. Okay, let's get started. Yeah, why don't you, yeah, you can sit down, yeah, right, and then you can come up, or why don't you sit in that chair right there? Um, yeah, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll get back to you, yeah. Uh, so, uh, thanks everyone for coming back, and let's see, so I think we're in, we've got another great session here, our second keynote of the day uh, is gonna feature uh, Senator Scott Wiener who was elected, and, and feel free to correct me on anything, I, I think I've got this all right, but interrupt me at any time, who was elected in November uh, 2016, and he represents uh, District 11 in the California State Senate. District 11 includes all of San Francisco, Broadmoor, Colma, and Daly City, as well as portions of South San Francisco. Uh, in the Senate, Senator Wiener works to make housing more affordable, to invest in our transportation systems, increase access to healthcare, support working families, meaningfully address climate change uh, and the impacts of wildfires, reform our criminal justice system, reduce gun violence, reduce California's high poverty rate, and safeguard and expand the rights of all communities, including immigrants and the LGBTQ community. Um, I could go on and on and on about many of the bills that Senator Wiener has authored. I'll just give you a couple. Among them are SB 35, a landmark law to streamline housing approvals in cities that are not meeting their housing goals. SB 855, which makes California the national leader in mental health and addiction care access by requiring insurance companies to cover all medically necessary mental health and substance use disorder treatments. Uh, let's see, and many others. There's many others that I can read here. Uh, Larkin Street Youth Services honored Senator Wiener with the Ann B. Stanton Award for his work to combat youth homelessness in California. Senator Wiener was named Legislator of the Year by the California Sexual Assault Investigators Association and by California Attorneys for Criminal Justice for his work reforming California's criminal justice system and by the San Francisco Housing Action Coalition and California Building Industry Association for his work addressing California's housing shortage. He was also named Legislator of the Year by the California Solar and Storage Association for his work to expand clean energy. Before his election to the Senate, Senator Wiener served on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, representing the district previously represented by Supervisor Harvey Milk. Uh, during his time uh, on the board, he focused extensively on housing and public transportation, authoring line, uh, laws to streamline approvals of affordable housing, to legalize new in-law units, and to tie public transportation funding to population growth. 
He received his bachelor's degree from Duke University and his law degree from Harvard Law School. And I just learned that, well, I just learned from his uh, doing a little research on the web that last week was his birthday. So happy belated birthday, <laughs> Senator Weiner. And we're delighted to have you here. And he's going to share some remarks. Then I'll ask some questions, and then we'll open it up. And I just want to ask all of you, I'm going to ask all of you for more help than the typical moderator. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask the audience for more, because I'm not an expert in this arena. And I think there are many experts in the room, so I'm going to hang back a little bit. I'll ask a couple of questions, but then we'll open it up. So with that, please join me in welcoming Senator Weiner. And I'm going to adjust the microphone. I think I'm just. There are a lot of us needing to adjust it down. We're going to uh -huh. adjust it up. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh -huh. Yeah, they don't make these <clears throat> microphones for tall people, for sure. But I have a little one here, so hopefully that'll, uh, that'll do the trick. So good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you for having me uh, here today. Um, so uh, in this policy forum about homelessness, I'm here to talk about housing specifically. And I think it's so important to always remember that uh, the root cause of homelessness is a lack of housing. Uh, and I, I think for a lot of people, I know we have a lot of experts here in the room, but I think for a lot of people, because the most visible homelessness that people see are, are people who are in some, at some degree of crisis around mental health or, or substance use, um, people, even if it's un, um, subliminally, um, sort of form this impression that homelessness is really about get uh, mental health treatment and, and drug use. And then we have all the debates about how do you address um, severe mental health and drug use um, problems, which is really important. And as you heard, I do a lot of work around expanding access to mental health treatment and drug use um, addiction uh, and making sure that we are using a science-based approach and giving people access to all of the treatments that we know work. And that's very important, both for the people on our streets and for the even dramatically larger number of people who are housed and suffering from mental health and addiction problems, because the vast majority of people who have mental health challenges are not homeless. Um, and a huge number of people who are homeless do not have any mental health or drug use problems. They're just poor, uh, and they cannot afford housing. And so when we look at California, California is approximately 15% of the US population. And these numbers are a few years old, so the pandemic probably changed things a little bit. We have the new point in time count, so we're gonna get new data. But as of at least a few years ago, we're 15% of the population of the country, 25% of the homeless population of the country, and I'm slightly over 50%, 5-0% of the unsheltered homeless population. So we're only 15% population, 25% of the total homeless population of the country, and 52%, I think it is, of the unsheltered homeless population. That's not because California has more mental health issues than the rest of the country, or it's not because California, people use more drugs than the rest of the country. People are using drugs everywhere. People have mental health challenges everywhere. It's because housing is too damn expensive in a dramatic, dramatic way. Uh, and you know, the, the visible homelessness that we see in terms of people on the streets who are clearly in some sort of mental health crisis, that's like the tip of the iceberg. Most homeless people that we see, you don't know they're homeless. Right? You either don't see them at all, or you see them, they look just like you or me. They're go often going to work, or they are uh, bringing their kids to school. Um, we have school districts where a very high percentage of those kids are living and are homeless with their families. Uh, and, but at night, they are going to a shelter, or they are living in a car, um, or they're just couch surfing, or just finding temporary places to live with friends or family. Uh, and they, I mean, if they're homeless long enough, they may, you know, that, that tends to probably put a lot of stress on people and they may develop <laughs> some mental health issues, but that's not the reason that they are homeless. They're homeless because there's nowhere that they can afford. And one of the, when people say, what keeps you up at night? One of the things that perpetually keeps me up, but I usually sleep pretty well, but proverbially keeps me up at night is that we have huge, in the Bay Area, 
a huge number of low-income renters who are like the next wave of people who are homeless. Because if they lose their apartments, there's literally nowhere they can afford to go. And so they either leave the state entirely, and some people do, but that's not really a solution because people don't want to leave their communities, right? That's, this is their community, and they shouldn't have to leave their community. Uh, and so when we talk about actually solving homelessness, yes, of course we need a lot more mental health and addiction treatment. That's not going to solve homelessness, right? That solving homelessness means a place for people to live. I, sometimes people say to me, uh, well, uh, you know, Utah did this whole thing on homelessness and really dramatically reduced their homeless population. That's great. The reason they were able to do that is because housing and land costs so much less. Right? When you're able to have abundant housing and just build housing for people and create housing for people, that, that it's a lot easier to solve homelessness. So that's why when we have all these fights around housing policy in California, and you have all these people saying, it's about local control. We don't want the state involved. We want it to be local control. And I say, you know what? Fr frankly, who cares who's making the decision? Most people, if you say, do you want city council to make a decision about housing or the state legislature or this or that? Most people are like, I don't care. I just want to make sure people have a place to live. And so we get into all these ridiculous arguments about who should be making the decision, and meanwhile, Rome is burning, right? The temporary lull we had in rents during the pandemic and all the NIMBYs ran around, who, the ones who were saying our problem was we have, before the pandemic, we had too many jobs. Let's ship the jobs elsewhere. Can you imagine? Let's collapse our economy so that I don't have to have you know, an apartment building in my neighborhood. Um, uh, the, the, you know, or that, oh, the pandemic is here. The housing crisis is solved. Well, it's back. And the rents are just as high or even higher as they were before. And we're never going to solve it until we acknowledge that we have to build an enormous amount of additional housing enormous. We didn't just develop a multi-million home shortage in California overnight. It was based on 50 years of anti-housing policy, where we made it illegal to build anything other than a single family home in 70% of California. It didn't used to be that way. Back in the old days, we would just build, build single family homes, you build apartment buildings, you build taller buildings, shorter buildings, you just build everything. And we used to build a lot of housing, and that was what some people, when people look at the quote unquote golden years, California was golden in some ways, not golden in other ways. But that was an era where working class people, people like from Oklahoma, could come here in the 30s and 40s and afford a home, where people could you know, come here and just have a middle class life, and they could afford it. It might be a little, it was more expensive than the rest of the country, but they could afford it. And then we decided no more apartment buildings in the vast majority of the, of the state, that we were going to make it take three, four, five, ten years to get any projects approved, even if you're building to the zoning. We're going to put you through all sorts of appeals and hearings and conditional use, and we're going to layer CEQA on top of it. We're going to give every tool to people to be able to slow down, obstruct, maim, or kill housing projects, whether it is a low-income housing project, whether it is a market rate project, mixed income, student housing on a UC campus, senior housing, we saw here in Palo Alto. We allowed the city of Palo Alto to kill a, a low-income senior housing project right here in Palo Alto, the kind of housing that most people would say should be a priority. And we let the voters of Palo Alto kill that. That should have been illegal under state law, but we allowed that to happen. And that's just a, one little example of what we were allowed to happen in this state for 50 years. And then you wonder why the average apartment in so many parts of the state might be $2,500, $3,000, $4,000 a month. You wonder why a teardown, quote unquote, teardown home in where we are right now will, will sell for two, two and a half million dollars. That's not normal, but we've allowed it to be that way. 
And so when we have all of these fights, I don't like that kind of housing. I want it to be a little taller. I want it to be or a little shorter. I want it to be, you know, I don't want it to block my view. I, I, I'm worried about street parking. I'm worried about, you know, that it's a little too close to the lot line. People need to like focus on the big picture that people are living in their cars. Children are living in cars. There are children that show up to school every day from a shelter or a car and then we expect them to learn. And so we need to stop being so absorbed in how is this going to impact my day-to-day -day life? Are we going to build housing? And so we're working very hard to change zoning, to say we should allow apartment buildings, small ones, duplex, fourplexes, and some taller ones throughout the state. No more banning everything other than a single family home. Single family homes are great. I grew up in one. We should have them. We should also have apartment buildings. We need both. They're both important. We need to streamline everything. We need to set what the rules are. This is the height you're allowed. This is the density you're allowed. Here are the objective design standards. And then you check all the boxes. Here's your permit within a matter of months, not years. We need to help cities fund basic services without forcing cities to constantly tax new housing through development fees because that's the only way that cities can actually raise revenue. Right now, we are forcing housing to pay for sidewalks, to pay for public transportation, to pay for sewer lines, all sorts of things that tax dollars should be paying for, but we're putting the cost on new housing, which makes housing more expensive. We need to stop forcing uh, housing to have excessive amounts of parking, which makes housing dramatically more expensive. And then we need to invest massively in subsidized housing. Um, we, we, to solve our middle class housing problem, we need dramatically more housing. Market rate housing, a ton of it, private sector. For our lowest income residents, the market is not going to serve them, perhaps not ever, and certainly not for a long time. And that's where we have to ramp up our housing subsidies, which we pulled away from. We used to build a lot of what we called public housing. We now call it social housing. There's public investment in housing as a safety net to make sure that everyone, if you're low income, working class, that you can have a place to live. And we need to make it mixed income and not totally segregated by income, because that leads to the healthiest kinds of neighborhoods, where everyone is like together, and your neighbor isn't necessarily the same as you. Uh, and then we have to make sure that people are stable in their homes, and, uh, and making sure that people who are renting um, who are not just arbitrarily thrown out on the streets. So there's a lot that we have to do. We're doing a lot of that work in the legislature. Um, we're working hard to hold our cities accountable to make sure the cities are doing the right thing, and that is really hard. It's like what they could call it, like trying to grab a whatever a fish in your hand or something like that, and it just slips right out. That was totally the wrong metaphor, but <laughs> something like that. Um, and uh, you know, I'm optimistic that we're moving in a be in a better direction. Um, and the politics have completely shifted around housing. The polling for a while now has been off the charts everywhere everywhere that people want more housing and are willing to accept more housing in their neighborhood. It's finally trickling up to the politicians. We're seeing more city council members who are willing to be out there you know, vocally pro-housing. Uh, we are seeing uh, uh, people, NIMBYs who run for office who pretend that they're pro-housing, which I don't like when people pretend, but at least they, they feel the need to try to pretend that they're pro-housing, that's a start, that you'll feel that need. Now it's up to the voters and advocacy groups to tell voters who are the ones who are really pro-housing and who aren't. Um, we're seeing a much easier time in the legislature uh, passing aggressive housing policies than we used to just a few years ago. So the politics are shifting, and we just need to keep up the momentum because that's how we're going to solve this. So thank you. And I probably went over the 10 minutes, but. Uh, Happy to take some questions. So you can say, yeah, great. Can I have that water? What's that? Water. Oh, is this yours? Yeah. OK, great. Thank you. Of course. Thanks for those remarks. Uh, so before I start, a few questions, and then I'll open it up.
for everyone else. I want to encourage everyone who's here. I, I kind of don't want this day to be just like going to the movies. Like you went to the movies, it was like a good show, cause you to think a little bit, and then you just go back about your daily business. So to the extent that any of you can think of ways that this can serve as a springboard to something after today, I welcome your suggestions. Jalu welcomes your suggestions. All of us, is, we're doing this because we want to help on this. Um, and bringing together leaders who have very different views, which is good, I think, helpful, constructive to have people come together. So, Senator Weiner, I'm going to ask you some slightly outside the box questions, um, and, but, and then you'll get more policy-ish. But one question I just want to ask you about is, so I'm an economist, academic. I teach undergrads here at Stanford, grad students, try to do research that's going to lead to better economic policy. We're at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. So we're trying to do research that is going to lead to better economic policy at the local level, the state level, the federal level, in the US and around the world. Aspirational, big. <clears throat> and one of the challenges as I look at the landscape of these topics that, we are going to be, that we've been talking about all day today is data. It is partly a function of the fragmentation of government, state agencies, county agencies, city agencies, different agencies within a city or within a county or within the state. And then there's this general like, oh, I'm an academic. I'd like to do research in this arena. And it's not like the people who are on the front lines of these agencies greet you with open arms, like, wonderful. Stanford, you're here to help us figure out what's happening and to come in humbly and understand things, it just isn't happening. And so we've reached out to lots of people on the front lines of policy. I really want to do research in this area. Before six months ago, I'd never used the word homeless in a paper that I'd written. So I'm like, this is an important area I'd like to, but it is just, I cannot tell you, it is like a brick wall. I can get point in time count data Right? But suppose I just want to know something as mundane as how in real time are the characteristics of people who are homeless changing? How are the kids who are homeless right now doing in school and how's that changing over time? How about their health care? What about crime? Anything. Yeah. Sisyphean task to do it in any one city. Okay, in LA County, which is more complicated than here, I guess, there are 88 cities in LA County. It's just like, it, so I talk with other economists. I, I, I've asked the question of a lot of economists, why don't economists do research on homelessness data? So I'm just asking you, you're here, you're an important person in the California state government. What can be done? Or is that just, it just is what it is and we're just, we can't really be brought into the mix here. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think government outside of a few areas has never been awesome at data um, right. and, and systems. And so you have, even within cities, like the different systems, everything's very fragmented. And so you don't have the sort of seamless, unified um, databases. And so that creates some real huge problems. And so I think the answer is to force everything onto more, more unified platform within cities, but also you know, across the state. And we can mandate, things through legislation, but then it's the implementation that sometimes can be a complete train wreck. And you know, you see sometimes some of these situations where like the courts, I think it was the court system was transitioning to a whole new, a whole new uh, system and it, and it just, it's been just a mess. Um, San Francisco Unified School District just transitioned to a new payroll system and literally teachers like haven't been getting paid, literally like not getting their paychecks. Um, like a principal, there was somebody seen the article in the paper, principal that was loaning money to a teacher so she wouldn't get evicted. So I, I think go government needs to do better with technology and, and that's as a platform to actually you know, get that data. In the meantime, it, it is, you have to be resourceful in, in doing you know, public records requests to different agencies and you have to know what to ask for and how to ask for it. And it's really painful and, and bad. Um, but that's, I think, the reason. I mean, basically, you connect with someone in government. You're an academic. They can just say, yeah, no, we really don't have that data, or we don't have time. Or, like, it's just, it's, um, it's something that we've encountered again and again. OK, so let's suppose we solve that. <clears throat> this is, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, people who know me well 
<clears throat> know that I'm like increasingly ornery about these issues, but you're, but you're, a, I, I'm so happy that you're here. I just want to know, uh, and I could have asked this when I was in working in the federal government. But so, policymakers interested in evidence? <laughs> just trying to shake question. things up. A um, <laughs> uh, often, yes. Um, it, to I think there are some some of us who are, there are some who are very it's a, it's a spectrum some who are extremely interested and it, and there's a range because politics also comes into play and there are times when you know people have you know are, are interested in evidence but then there's you know tough politics I mean the the most extreme example is around vaccination policy where like we know that mass vaccination like works right like thank god we didn't have this anti-vaxxer dynamic when when like the polio vaccine came out um it, so we've but you know i'm worried that polio is going to come back it's it's back and it's still around in certain parts of the world and and it's just a matter of time before it comes back here as people refuse to have their kids vaccinated. But that, that's one where the evidence is so overwhelming, so overwhelming, but it's hard to get vaccine bills through the legislature, not because of the data, or the, but because of the people don't, don't want to deal with the craziness. And so we see it in, ho in housing policy as well, um, where you know, it's very clear what the right policy response is in terms of making it easier to build more housing but people don't want to deal with all the NIMBYs yelling at them, and so they are hesitant to, to support it. But I do think in a lot of areas, data does matter. I find like in, you know, in healthcare, probably more so, um, people are willing to look at, at, at the evidence. I've just sort of, you know, it's still politicized. Um, but, uh, so I, I, think it's, I think generally, yes, but not always. Like, I mean, I don't know. We all have like our biases, so as a researcher, I sometimes embark on a study, and I have, may have a certain result that I want. <clears throat> like I worked on Obamacare for President Obama, and I'd want it to be like the most spectacular success in human history, having worked on it. But you know, it's trying to do evidence. We were talking earlier, <clears throat> before you came, about the one percent surcharge for mental health. So anyway, I don't want to. We're going to stay on housing construction. Anyway, I want to talk about because you said in healthcare, it's especially in, valuable because I want to know what that one percent did. Improve mental health care. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I assume. Did I, I, I'm Darryl, kind of going off the road. Jalu is a bit like, "What are Darryl, you doing up there?" I gave you these questions, and you're, Darryl Steinberg. you're like, "Totally." <laughs> did, uh, Mark, yeah, like Daryl Steinberg talk about it. He was a little bit. The yeah, he was the that. person who authored it. He was um, sad so that the, he had sent it to the counties and not the. Yeah, cities. the yes. Yeah. So the the well, and now that he's the mayor of a city, he right. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah. So that that money was not. It's. Some counties use it really well, some counties don't. Some counties, up until recently, were barely even spending it. LA County had accumulated a massive reserve of that money that it wasn't being uh, spent. Um, and yes, he, he is correct. More of it should be going directly to the cities because if you're, uh, and I'm actually a believer, large cities that are within large counties should be their own counties. Oakland should not be part of Alameda County. Sacramento should not be part of Sacramento County. San Jose should not be part of Santa Clara County. Um, Fresno should not be part of, uh, part of Fresno County because what happens is the suburbs gang up on the cities and they don't care often about what happens in the cities. And the cities are the ones that are dealing with the bulk of, these, of the homeless and, and, so, and social service problems, and yet they're not getting a proportionate share. So in, a, a few years ago, I saw da data in Alameda County. Oakland had, I think, 75% of the homeless population in Alameda County, but only got 50% of the homeless funding. And so um, I agree with him on that front. OK, great. And so a, a quick, OK, so I'm going to ask one or two more questions that I'm going to go to all of you, because we have lots of housing policy and homelessness experts here in the audience. But I just want to get your take on <clears throat> and you sort of alluded to this in your remarks. Uh, are you concerned about the sort of out-migration of California? Um, so I, one thing that I just 
think isn't mentioned enough is there was this 2017 federal tax reform that eliminated the deductibility of state and local taxes up to uh, beyond $10,000. And that overnight made it massively more expensive to be in California than in other states like Texas or Florida. Um, since that time, you know, it's complicated. There's other things happening, obviously. But since that time, there's been an acceleration in movement from California to states like that. Worried about it? Not worried about it. I am worried about it. Um, I also think it's, it's not um, largely wealthy people who are leaving. Um, it's just, it's, I think it's largely middle class, working class people who are leaving. Um, and a lot of them uh, have take the standard deduction um, and, but they, they just struggle to afford yeah. to live here primarily because of, of housing. There are other challenges, but um, I think housing is a huge piece of why people li leave because they either, you know, you, you have, you're trying to raise kids and you have a place that's too small and you want a bigger place and you, you're either going to have to move way far away from where you, where you work or you're, or you're going to you know, have to just pay a huge percentage of your salary and they see that and you know if you move to Colorado or Texas or where else you could just get a lot more for your money of course if you move to Texas it means that you know you're moving into the handmaid's tail at this point and <laughs> and into a you know, place that you know and so you know, do you know you have to eyes wide open in terms of what you're moving moving into um, but people do get pushed out and, and we see it happening now in Idaho also, people moving there. And so, so the, if, we, if we want to continue to be a really vibrant, innovative, creative place where young people and young families, both who are here and want to come here, can keep making California the brilliant, amazing place that it is, you have to have housing uh, for people. I'm not saying that it's the only issue, but I think it is at the heart of the reason why so many people struggle just to be stable and succeed here. And you're kind of optimistic that things will get better over the next few, few several years? I think, I think I am, well, with housing, it, like, it took us 50 years to get here. It's not going to take us three years to get out of it. Um, we, we do see that um, as we've, we have started to increase housing production, I think it's having some benefits, but the hole is so deep, it's going to take time. And we're not going to fix it in a few years, and we have to persevere. And so, for example, right now, um, the, the, one of the most important processes that you may never have heard of is happening, and that's called the housing element process, where every city in California has to create a housing plan for the next eight years to accommodate their required housing allotment. And we fixed the process to a significant extent so that, you know, like the city of Beverly Hills in the last cycle was allotted three, three, one, two, three new homes for an eight-year period. I'm not joking. Um, the city of West Hollywood was like 119. Um, a lot, really low allotments. We fixed that, so there now have you know, Beverly Hills now is 3,000 instead of three. Um, but we're seeing some cities are very diligent. Other cities are trying to scam the system and put together fake plans that are never going to happen. And so we are counting on a combination of state agencies. The, our state housing department, our attorney general, Rob Bonta, who's super pro-housing, um, and uh, activists, um, housing activists, including ones who file lawsuits against cities to enforce the law and make sure that cities like Palo Alto or San Francisco, which is being a little sketchy, um, or um, Los Angeles. Los Angeles is actually doing a very good job and had, is, is almost there. Um, and we have to make sure that cities are doing the right thing and have strong, strong accountability. And Governor Newsom, that's been one of his real pillars, accountability. And he's you know, proposed and we've adopted budget investments um, to make sure we have good enforcement. Okay, so with that, I would like to open it up to people here. We've got a question right here. No, uh, Lisa, microphone, yeah, for him right here. Thank you. Um, I guess one observation I'd make is, is that, you know, it seems like we have no shortage of really excellent housing bills that are introduced into the legislature each year. And we do have something of a shortage of bills that end up passing. And I guess it's felt like the exception to that rule has been maybe 2017. I think that was the year in which you passed SB 35. We strengthened the Housing Accountability Act. It kind of felt like the stars aligned in a way 
between the governor, the legislature, the trade unions, the environmental groups, and things like that, that really created some very powerful tools. And so I would just love to know, like, how do you think about creating the political environment and the coalitions needed to, yeah. to pass legislation So like we did, in 2017, we passed a really strong package of housing bills to streamline housing approvals, to strengthen some of our existing laws around um, in-law units or um, around cities following their own rules. So we did some really great work. Um, so then um, I did something, I, I didn't intend it to be this way, um, but I, for about two, two and a half, almost two and a half year period, pursued this like mega bill. It was originally SB 827, it became SB 50, which would have like rezoned a lot of California for more density. It became this like, it was actually a really, the bill ended up not passing, but it was really healthy because I think it really shifted the conversation and, and it got an enormous number of people engaged. So it was healthy, but one of the things that it did that was less recognized is we blotted out the sun and sucked every ounce of oxygen out of the room. And there were a bunch of other bills that just sort of scurried through that would have been hyper controversial if there hadn't been this mega thing blotting out the sun. And so during the time that this, that this thing was out there blotting out the sun, we passed the, re, the reform to, to housing allocations. That was in 2018. That, that, that's the one that took Beverly Hills from three units to 3,000 units. I think you were telling me Palo Alto now has to add 6,000 new homes, which is much higher than what it had. San Francisco went from 28,000 for an eight-year period new homes to 91,000. So we're seeing that all over the state. That bill got very, very little attention. And in some ways, it, it might be the most impactful bill I've ever authored, even though most people have never heard of it. Um, Nancy Skinner, my amazing colleague from the East Bay, authored in 2018 or 19, I think, something called SB 330, which limits the number of hearings city, cities can have and does a whole bunch of things to just limit cities' ability to delay and obstruct the approval of housing. It's a very successful law. We also uh, passed several laws to, to finally close almost all the loopholes that cities use to stop people from putting in-law units in their homes. Um, that was in 2018 and 19 and 20. And so I agree with you, there are some bills that should have passed that didn't, but we were able to get a bunch through with not a lot of fanfare, which is good. Um, and so we just have to keep going. Can I ask, a, can I, I'm gonna interrupt and then we're gonna ask. Larry, go ahead. Uh, so states used to have no, the state used to have no teeth in ensuring local governments follow stuff. Like you just said Palo Alto is supposedly supposed to build 6,000 new yeah. units. What happens to Palo Alto if they build zero? Yeah, so what happens is they, they Palo Alto will lose um, a bunch of its land use control. So we actually have teeth. Now this is the bill you just mentioned, SP 35, the first bill I introduced. It provides that when a city does not meet its housing goals at different income levels, then it becomes what we call streamlined, which means you lose all discretion. CEQA goes away. Any kind of discretionary hearings, approvals, you have, the city no longer has any discretion. So that them. means if, if this lot is zoned for 30 units with X, Y, and Z requirements, and someone comes forward and says, I want to build 30 units with all your requirements, you have between three and six months to give them a permit, depending on the size. Um, and what that has really done, especially for 100% affordable housing, which causes all these huge fights, like basically almost no city in California meets its below market rate goals. About maybe almost half meet their market rate. So about half or so of the cities, uh, SB 35 streamlines all of their housing, market rate, below market rate. For almost 100% of cities, you have um, for um, hundred for affordable housing for below market rate housing, they're streamlined. So, uh, Bridge Housing, which is the largest builder of 100% affordable housing in the state of California, that builds low income housing, uh, has told us that because of SB 35, their average amount of time to get their permit average has gone from seven years to four months, and so we and that. That's because we went and we said, if you don't meet your goals, you lose the ability to have an opinion about whether it should be approved. Okay, um, that's good. So, that, yeah. that sounds good. That sounds like teeth. Yeah. Okay, Larry had a question. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Wait for Mike. Yeah. 
So there's a lot of conversation about increasing density, and I suppose there's arguments about whether market rate housing availability increases the availability of affordable. But there, with respect to market rate housing, um, for the families you mentioned, a lot of folks don't want to live in a small apartment downtown where most of the effort seems to be. And the intersection of CEQA and increased state mandates on VMTs and GHGs that prevent homes from being built locally and cause them to be built three hours away by commute. Is there any understanding of how the CEQA and GHD and VMT and car regulations are impacting the ability to build homes? Yeah. So let me start with the first comment you made about market rate housing. So we call it market rate housing. Sometimes people will dismiss it as quote unquote luxury housing. There is a, such a thing as luxury housing where you have, you know, your, your gym and your massage, your massage services and whatever. But, but when we, but luxury, when people say luxury housing, they mean it's really expensive. Yeah, it's really expensive because there's not enough of it. The hundred year, you could go and rent, try to rent or buy a hundred year old home and it's also really expensive. And, and I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to actually ask people to raise their hands because I don't want, I don't want to put people on the spot to say what kind of housing they live in. If I were to go around and say, raise your hand, well, not for the students who are, might be living in, but for people who are not living in like university housing, in any given room, say, raise your hand if you live in a home that, that, that is not subsidized, that's not below market rate, 99% of the hands will go up. When we talk about market rate housing, I live in a 1965, 500 square foot condo in San Francisco, 57 years old now. That's a, that's a market rate housing. Any home that's built by a private developer, whether 100 years ago, 50 years ago, or today, is market rate housing. And we can dismiss it as luxury housing because it's really expensive, whether it was built 100 years ago or today. It's expensive because there's not nearly enough of it. And anyone who tells you that we can solve our housing crisis by only building subsidized housing has a bridge to sell you. Because unless we're going to restructure the American economy to basically take over housing and do just Marshall Plan level investment in housing, which could be a really great thing. I don't see it. I mean, we're, we're fighting to make sure that we still have a democracy in this country. And we, we had this, this 2017 tax cut and everything happened. We couldn't even get. The you know the Obamacare is amazing, but you know the whole public, the public option. Remember that they called it like communism. So I don't see that happening in the near future, and so to solve it, we need the subsidized below market rate housing. But we also need a ton of market rate housing. I know it's not what you were suggesting, but a lot of people, a lot of people make the argument: don't build any market rate housing, which means no no private participation, which means we'll have a permanent massive housing shortage. In terms of the um, car rule, so there's a a, a real dispute happening now uh, where the California Air Resources Board has adopted a rule about vehicle miles traveled and that has to be sort of factored in to basically CEQA analysis for if you're um, in terms of building housing to try to, to try to avoid sprawl. It's an anti-sprawl measure. So if you're building housing that's going to cause people to drive a lot more because it is you know, far away from job centers, for example, uh, that's something we want to discourage, and and I agree. We have, you know, I, yes, not everyone wants to live in an apartment building or a condo building, and people, you know, a lot of people want to live in single family homes. We have a geometry problem, right? Because then the only way you can really build those homes is to go out further and further and further into wildfire zones, and you know, and you're and you're increasing vehicle miles traveled, so it increases carbon emissions. And so the, you know, the, the, the question is, do we want to keep doing that, right? And, and what, there are real downsides to, to doing that, and how, how are people going to be living in the future? And in the future, plenty of people are still going to be living in single-family homes, but the reality is it's going to be harder and harder for people to have that life going into the future. Um, because I don't see us continuing to build infinitely into wildfire zones. It's just not sustainable. More questions? Right here. Sorry, was there another? Oh, I'm sorry. Was there another? Sorry. I had one here, but there was there one over here? Or, yeah, over here, I guess. Yeah. And then we'll come to you. Like, 
who's in, I don't know who's, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, they're in charge. <laughs> so, oh, wow, okay. I want to go back to your question mark about data and kind of push a little bit more on that because from my point of view, I'm an economist, it seems like the data is there, but sometimes there's just a ton of inertia and a lack of willingness to kind of look into it. A lot of times policymakers even know the answer, right? So continuum of care reform in 2012, like you go to the state of California and ask, hey, can I get the data to actually look at that? And they say, no, we know it was a shitty policy. Like we don't wanna know how bad it was. And so I just wonder, you know, there's kind of three pieces, right? Policymakers come up with the policies, implement the policies, providers implement it on a micro scale. <clears throat> and I think of economists as being in this like cycle of life in the sense that we can kind of look back and say, what did the policy do? What were the unintended consequences? What can we do better? And then it goes around again. And so sometimes though, when these programs exist, a ton of money's been put, in, put into them, but there's just a lack of willingness. So I'd be curious to hear what you say in terms of like what we can say as economists to really try to pitch what we can do and what we can bring to the table to really impact change. That was for you, I think. Is that for me or for no, you? No, I mean, it's for <laughs> both of you, I guess. You but it's, I mean, it's, like the data you're, exists, really. It's, it's just that there's a lack of willingness, I think. You're a um, boss also. I think, I mean, yeah, the, I mean, data clearly exists somewhere, right? And that's what I sort of was mentioning at the beginning, that there's this like lack of integration. So it's like you have to know, here are the 30 different places I have to go and fight to get the data to get it all together. And so you're right, a lot of times people just don't even bother because it's too because it's too hard. And that's why I think having a more integrated system would be better. But you know, frankly, even in uh, even in um, private healthcare sector, right? I, I just got my doctor referred me to a specialist to, to have a consultation, and I want her to, to see all my medical records but she's in a different system, so she has no access to my medical records. And so I had a message to my doctor's office, what do I do? And I'm like, do I have to go in the system and start printing out stuff? So, I can, so even like in the, the health, healthcare sector, which is presumably more efficient than government, we still have you know, systems that don't talk to each other. And I, I think that, I'm not saying that's the whole problem, but I, I think sometimes that's the pro is part of the problem, that people don't even know where to go. Can I tell you a story about this? So I once collaborated, started to collaborate with a county in California that I won't name, <clears throat> that was interested in evaluating the effect of a pretty intensive intervention for homeless individuals several years ago on their healthcare spending. So I had been working with data for the state of California, the universe of hospital ER visits and the universe of hospital admissions and discharges. And the idea was that it's an expensive program, but their instinct was that the program to a large extent, perhaps fully, paid for itself by keeping people out of the emergency room and keeping people out of, you know, not, let's say, ODing and getting hospitalized. Sound like super interesting, really interesting research topic. We're gonna link up the data with the house homeless intervention with data from the state healthcare agency. And the funny thing was, the county actually didn't want to send the data to the state so they sent the, the, this data, we had to merge the data, because the like, I, it was this bizarre thing of like, a little bit of mistrust between a county government and state government, but in any case, sitting in meetings with people in the county, and they said, uh, one of the people who was spearheading the government team said, so when you show that this thing saved more than $8,800 per participant, that's something that will be helpful to us to sort of go out and say to the world. So, well, yeah, well, I just don't know what I'm going to find. I haven't even like started the pro project yet. I don't really know. And like that moment, the sort of wind went out of the sails. Like it just died. And I, you know, I was doing it for free. Like I'm not. I'm just here. This is a research project. And so I think that is a challenge because people who are on the front lines, they're doing something, and they think they know. And if and so I mean, I'm not saying I think they were incredibly well intentioned. People. And I will also say that to add further sand to the gears of this process were the various lawyers 
We're like, oh, you can't link for this or that reason. So anyway, lawyers are, I, you know, my brother's a lawyer. My best friend's a lawyer. But I'm you guys lawyer. are kind of a, I'm a lawyer. I know you are. That's why I'm looking at you while I say this. <laughs> you guys are oh. very challenging for researchers no. who are trying to put together data to provide evidence so that we make better policy. Mm -hmm. But if we can't, anyway. This is why all lawyers should have to spend part of their career as not lawyers. Because since I have been, I practiced for like 15 years. And then last 12 years, I've been Board of Supervisors in the State Senate. And now I am perpetually fighting with uh, whether it was the city attorney's office or our legislative council. And I, yeah, so I, I yeah. It's, but it's just a challenge, because academics, I think we would like for our, like sometimes we get criticized as your result, your research isn't real world relevant, but I mean, sometimes we lean in to try to make it real world. So I, I don't know, I'm not saying, there's plenty of blame for the academics, so I'm not pointing, trying to point fingers, but it's just, I think it's an illustrative story, and I think it's not isolated. I think that kind of thing is behind a lot of the dynamics between the research community, we're at CEPR, Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and the sort of people on the front lines. Um, okay, we've got maybe time for one more question. Right here. Um, first, I, I, I actually just have a, an interesting, uh, hopefully it's an interesting question for you, Scott. Given the fact that you, in authoring the bill of SB 35, figured out a way to, you know, kind of put teeth in it that, you know, actually has seen results. Um, I mentioned earlier, we've done an analysis um, at the Price Center for Social Innovation where we looked at how many people were paying more than half their income as rent in California. It's around 1.2 billion households. We looked at what if we actually gave them a subsidy while they waited for a housing choice voucher, because all of them, are, almost all of them are eligible. Um, it would cost roughly $6,500 a person on average, some less, some more, about $9 billion. Um, one of the criticisms of an approach where you actually had a fully functioning rental tax credit for, for these folks is that if you didn't actually have more housing built, of course, it would just increase the price of housing. Any thoughts on what might be the right kind of teeth to put in such a bill? I know that there's a bill, and currently I can't remember if it's Senate or Assembly, to say, well, let's increase the interest tax credit to 1,000. But that's nowhere close to where it needs to be. But you know, it, it's moving in that direction. How, what kind of teeth might be possible to make sure that localities even you know, streamline housing more or met their housing element goals more rapidly, those kinds of yeah, things. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that, that's part, part of the issue because people advocate for certain kinds of interventions and I support re rental supports of different, but it, it needs to be accompanied with the other. And that's why I think there, there, are, there are some uh, tenant advocates who are very oppositional to building new housing because they think any kind of new housing is going to potentially, you know, destabilize existing tenants. And I've always said, you know, we can we can have protections for renters so that they're not getting pushed out when new development comes in. You can have those protections; they can be strong. But the idea that you would protect the people living there, which I support, but not solve the underlying problem. For why is it that if someone in a, in a you know in many in many parts of the universe, if you happen to lose you know get get evicted or people leave their housing for a million reasons, not just because of eviction, right? You could have a divorce or you have falling out with your roommate or you need to move out because you've got a job and it's no longer convenient, and and in in, a, in sort of more normal world, you you just find a new place. And it might, be, it might be challenging, but you can find a new place. And this whole notion, this whole existence that we have now where losing your apartment means that there's nowhere else for you to go, that's not normal. And so we, ha we need the subsidies to stabilize people. And we have, we, we have to do what we've been doing, passing state laws to ensure that there is accountability. Uh, and then enforcing the heck out of them, um, because we have strong laws. But there's more. There's definitely more to do. Um, but if we if we just start really meticulously enforcing the laws we have, w that would go a long way. Okay, so I think we should wrap here. So please join me in thanking uh, Senator Weiner for spending time with us today. Thank you. Hopefully Take those care. were good. I would love to connect again. Okay, next session.
uh, is, uh, it is going to be quite interesting, I believe. <clears throat> Challenges to public safety in our cities. And the moderator was supposed to be Marissa Lagos from KQED, but it turns out she is unable to be with us today. So our very nimble and versatile uh, Jalou is gonna step in to be the moderator. I've already introduced Jalou, and, but I'll just say again, she's spectacular, great uh, organizer for today. So who better to fill in than Jalou Streeter? So take it away, Jalou. Okay, as you can see, I'm not Marisa. Um, and I had to prepare for the moderation, uh, this, this moderating session starting this morning, so I only had a few hours to prepare. Uh, you have to bear with me. Um, so we have a great panel. Jeff Kosicki, where is it? Jeff. Um, he has worked in social services for over 25 years, focusing on homelessness, affordable housing, and economic development. He served in leadership positions at nonprofit organizations in the United States and Latin America. In 2016, Jeff was appointed to serve as the founding director of the San Francisco Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing. Um, during its first four years, the department helped end homelessness for over 7,000 households and prevented homelessness for approximately 5,000 adults and families. In March of 2020, Mayor London Breed uh, uh, appointed Jeff to run the Healthy Streets Operations Center, HSOC, an initiative to better serve unsheltered people in San Francisco. HSOC reduced encampment by over 85%, placing nearly 2,500 people into shelter programs. Jeff currently serves as the Sorry, Jeff currently uh, is part of the Urban uh, Alchemy, leading the organization's national expansion efforts. Um, next up is Tom, Thomas Wolf, uh, who I already introduced earlier. Uh, he is a real character, one of the real characters in Michael Schellenberger's book, if you had read the book. Um, he is now an advocate for addiction recovery. In 2018, Tom spent six months homeless on the streets of the Tenderloin neighborhood, struggling with heroin and fentanyl addiction. He was arrested six times um, and eventually went to jail for three months before going to a six-month inpatient treatment program where he found recovery. Um, Tom has become a strong voice for a new approach to the homeless home and the drug crisis in San Francisco. His story and solutions have been featured in local, national, and international news, including CNN, Fox News, New York Times, LA Times, and the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, Tom is a co-founder of the California Peace Coalition and is the founder of the Recovery Education Coalition. Um, next up is Vern Pearson. Uh, Vern Pearson, Vern is the district attorney in the El Dorado County. Where's Vern? Right here. Um, he created a highly successful code homicide task force. He was the former president of California District Attorneys Association. Vern was instrumental in the passage of several pieces of legislation, including drafting AB 141, which expands the use of propensity, propensity evidence in child abuse and domestic violence cases. During his career, Vern has personally prosecuted approximately 100 cases through jury um, trial and has been assigned as a vertical prosecutor for domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, Vern went to serve in the US Army after high school. His experience in the military and his strong work ethic were instrumental in his successfully earning his way through college and then law school. Um, last but not least, Laron Armstrong is the chief of the Oakland Police Department. Um, under Chief Armstrong's leadership, the Oakland Police Department developed a new stop data collection project, which has been recognized nationally for its implementation of strategies. 
the project has reduced the number of police traffic stops by 60% since 2016, and the stops of African Americans by over 65%. He served as the department's liaison to Stanford University Spark program. Um, he born and raised in West, uh, Western, sorry, West Oakland. Chief Armstrong has been the subject of multiple news articles regarding um, black officers policing in America, and he is one of the f featured officers in the award-winning documentary, The Force. He was the former president of the Oakland Black Officers Association. Um, so I will, as usual, I will ask, I will invite each one of our panelists to come up here and give their short summary of what they think the main problems are. Um, so Chief Armstrong is sort of delayed and then he's on his way here. So he will join, he, he will join us when he gets here, okay? Um, so the first up is Jeff. Thank you all for uh, sticking around for uh, what's been a long and but really interesting day. It's a little bit um, unusual, I guess, to talk about public safety at a conference around homelessness, but there's certainly uh, interaction between uh, the two issues because um, it's such a complicated topic. I think my slides maybe don't make a ton of sense or they may feel a little bit disconnected from one another, but I'll, I'll do my best, so bear with me. I think. I feel compelled as somebody who's worked on this issue for actually 30 years now to say before I start talking about public safety that homelessness is a housing problem. There's tons of data around it. I'm not gonna get into that because that's not what I'm supposed to talk about, but it's called homelessness. So the solution to homelessness is to provide somebody a home and to conflate it with public safety and substance use and mental health issues uh, is frankly you know, wrong and, and part of the problem. Uh, that I think we're, we're facing. And, and Housing First uh, is not perfect and it does not work for everybody, but that does not mean it does not work. Um, and I think it's important to just acknowledge this uh, as somebody who's worked in this field but has been asked to talk about um, a slightly different topic. However, I also want to acknowledge that there's issues adjacent to homelessness that are really, really problematic and are causing serious deteriorations, especially in our urban uh, communities, mental health, substance use, and other public safety issues have been talked about a little bit, uh, but to acknowledge that those don't exist and that homelessness has nothing to do with mental health or substance abuse is just as wrong as saying it has nothing to do with housing. Um, it's, it's all of the above. And uh, I was told not to show up here without having data uh, with my slides, so there's a little data there that shows that homelessness um, gets worse when housing is more expensive. And this shows that the more homeless people we had in San Francisco, the more people felt that there were, the more complaints there were. And there's a ton of data, 911 data, crime data, all kinds of data that show increases in complaints and actual problems being caused as the number of homeless people uh, increase in a community. And, and we can't ignore that, especially, you know, I've worked most of my career in the nonprofit sector, but when you work for the government, everybody is your constituent. You have to respond to everybody's needs. The person whose door is being blocked and they can't open up their business, you know, we need to think about him as well as the person who's sleeping in front of uh, that person's door. You just can't ignore these problems, but you also can't conflate them. They're, di they're, they're different issues, they have different solutions, but the good news is there are solutions. There's solutions to our housing problems. Roseanne Haggerty talked about uh, some great work that's being done all over the country, um, and there's solutions to how do you address kind of the nexus of homelessness and, and other issues. Um, and you'll see the numbers start to go down, uh, the number of complaints that we got in San Francisco, and that's a, you'll see that that tracks with some of the solutions that you'll see here. Uh, in 2017 in San Francisco, we had about uh, 1,100 tents uh, in the city, and you'll see that number dropped. It went up again dramatically during the pandemic and then went back down dramatically. And that's uh, because the, the initial success was due to something called HSOC, uh, that I helped form and then ended up running, which was a multidisciplinary team of mental health uh, clinicians, peer, uh, peer, social, peer, uh, peer workers, outreach workers who had been homeless themselves, uh, San Francisco Police Department, uh, as well as our public health department our, and our um, parking and traffic, like everybody, public works, and we would go out to encampments and we would use a services first approach but a multidisciplinary team. We didn't tell people to leave without offering them treatment, without offering them a shelter bed and a place to go. Um, but we also like, but you can't stay here. 
Like, we're going to offer you all these things, but this neighborhood has gotten out of control. We can't have 60 tents uh, on two blocks in the Tenderloin. It's not fair to the people who live in that neighborhood. This is not cool, but we also know you're, you need help or you wouldn't be out here. So let's, let's do that. And, and it's proven extremely successful. It's been replicated uh, in many cities now uh, around the country, most recently uh, in Austin, uh, Texas. Um, another thing that we should be thinking about, because there's a lot of uh, discussion that I, I think is really important around finding alternatives to policing. I think the police play an incredibly important role in all of this, but I think there's times when, and, I, and, and I've worked with uh, many police officers, and they're some of the best outreach workers I've ever met, but I think sometimes uh, they're not the appropriate response. So the organization uh, that I work for, Urban Alchemy, provides alternatives to policing. Essentially, we are trying to encourage people to engage in pro-social behavior, like to not block the door or to use the restroom around the corner as opposed to using the sidewalk. Um, and all of our staff, or 96% of our staff, uh, are uh, former, um, have been uh, incarcerated. 80% uh, of them had, were LTOs or long-term offenders, meaning they're on parole from a life sentence. And they do absolutely magical work um, and, and really just creating dialogue in a community and letting people know like, hey, you know, we all got to live here together. Um, and that way a cop doesn't have to come out to ask somebody to move from a doorway. You can have a community member uh, do that work. And this is proven, this isn't, we didn't invent it. This movement has been around since the 90s. Um, some of you may have heard the name um, Akila Shareels, who helped negotiate the, the truce between the Crips and the Bloods in LA. He was one of the early proponents of this and is now kind of building a national movement as an alternative to police. Um, however, uh, a lot of this stuff doesn't work, not because not because it doesn't work, but because of like politics, really, and because of silly infighting and, th and statements like homelessness is only a substance abuse problem or housing first doesn't work, and these extreme views that are thrown around really distract us from just following like proven, um, just all these proven interventions. And we gotta be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We have to be able to solve our housing crisis and deal with chaos on our streets at the same time. And frankly, we can, there's tons of evidence. We need more housing. Uh, okay, I agree. I've been spending most of my career trying to get more housing. I've built, helped build thousands of units of permanent supportive housing, but we can fight for that at the same time that we can fight for better mental health, um, addressing substance, uh, you know, un unfettered like drug dealing in our streets. Um, people, we can set expectations on what's an okay behavior and we can promote these solutions at the same time. But the problem is we turn it into these fights where everybody's on like one, well, not everybody, most of us are probably right in the middle and, and can hear both sides, but it's these loud voices on either side that say if you try to tell somebody to move out of that doorway, you're a damn fascist. Um, and you should be fired from your job. That's what they said about me. Um, even though I've probably built more housing, and i like trying to toot my own horn, but I probably have l developed more housing for homeless people and shelter beds in San Francisco than anybody else in the city. I've been doing this crap for a long time there. Um, but but none nonetheless, I'm a fascist because I think the guy who runs you know, the Vietnamese restaurant in San Francisco and can't get into his restaurant um, has a right to get into his restaurant and start his day doing his business. That, that doesn't help. Um, and, and also saying housing first doesn't work. I'm sorry, Michael Schellenberger, I do like Michael quite a bit, but to say housing first doesn't work is also bull. I mean, I'm sorry, but like making statements like that is not helpful, and it also doesn't understand housing first. Housing first is everything from a bus ticket back home, which is a great way for somebody to end their homelessness for 500 bucks if there's a family member willing to take them in, to really expensive permanent supportive housing. It's not just permanent supportive housing. I agree, hard to scale permanent supportive housing as a singular solution to homelessness. There's a lot of stuff that needs to happen, but please don't say it doesn't work, and please don't call me a fascist. I mean, none of that helps any of us, and it certainly does not help homeless people. So I guess the one thing I'd like to leave you with is there are data-driven best practices. Roseanne talked about them. There's tons of them. I showed you a little bit of data about them. We just have to like stop fighting with each other, and we have to listen to each other. Like, you know, and I, I shouldn't, actually I shouldn't be so snarky about Michael. Um, because at the end of the day, I listened to Michael, a lot of what he said is totally true. Like we have to hear each other and we have to compromise. I can't get everything I want. Michael can't get everything he wants. So we have to find a common ground to solve both of these problems, not just one of the problems. But I also will tell you the 
constant like BS that, and, and again, I'm, I feel like I'm being like poor me because uh, I'm housed, man. I don't have like too many problems in my life and I'm a white man too. So I got even fewer problems. But the bottom line is I just took so much crap trying to find a middle ground for this stuff that I just could not stay in my job and maintain my own mental health. Um, and I, I love Mayor Breed and I feel bad that I, I just left, but my wife would have, um, I, I, I just had to go. Uh, it was just too much because just the constant abuse and all of my colleagues who have run big homeless departments in the United States, none of them have lasted more than five years. Most don't last three years. So, and it's because of all this. Like, we know what to do. Uh, the police chief, who's not here yet, he knows what to do. I know what to do. Many of you in the room know what to do. Tom Wolf knows what to do. Um, but we have to stop, like, just being assholes to each other, part of my French. So that's it. I think I went over my five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a lawyer, um, and so I'm not an asshole. I, I'm, I, I, uh, uh, it's an honor to be here, um, uh, despite that fact. And uh, it, about 20 years of being, a, I've been a prosecutor for more than 30 years. About 20 years into it, I uh, had the great idea to go back uh, to graduate school. I went to the Naval Post Graduate School in Monterey. Um, and one of the most significant, I didn't learn a lot of things. No, I did. I, 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 one of the most significant things that I learned there was they, they talked about this concept of a wicked problem. A wicked problem is a, com most of you know what this is. The, it's a complex problem that doesn't have a uh, an easy solution. Um, uh, the, if someone walks up to you at a function, and uh, they say, well, the way you solve homelessness is by this. Almost certain, with certainty, they know virtually nothing about the problem that they're offering a solution to. And it is really a privilege with uh, J. Lou and the rest of the people here that when the first time I spoke with her, she said, We're, we want to talk about it from all the different perspectives. We want to talk about it from a data standpoint. And um, unfortunately, this is here in the state of California. And you asked the question of what, why is it getting worse here in California? And it's like, unfortunately, in, in being involved with working with the legislature on a number of different things over many years, um, we don't, the way this has gone today is not the way Sacramento addresses public policy problems. And I'll talk a little bit about that and the mistakes that we have made where somebody had a really good idea, it was a very well-intentioned idea, and it was poorly implemented, it was poor, not well thought out, and we are all suffering the consequences. And we've done this multiple times. We'll go back to uh, the early 1960s when President Kennedy signed a, an act which was supposed to create community treatment centers for uh, the mental, uh, mentally ill. Uh, it was a great, well-intentioned idea. I think he probably was pursuing that idea out of the knowledge that, uh, one, how bad mental health facilities had become at that time, and that people, a family member of his, was locked up in a facility and never should have been in that facility in the first place. Um, fast forward to here in California when President Reagan, or pre became President Reagan, then Governor, President, or Governor Reagan, uh, have you ever heard the expression, he closed the, Reagan closed the mental hospitals. I've heard that for many years. And it's true, he did close the mental hospitals because that was the directive that was happening. Here in the United States and here in California, we pretend like uh, we do things and it's novel. Someone else hasn't already done it. The deinstitutionalization uh, movement was a international movement that really started more so in Europe and then spread to the United States. What happened here was well-intentioned, but failed execution and failed thought out. Uh, here, we were supposed to build community treatment facilities uh, that would actually take care of people that were coming out of the mental hospitals, that you, to use that term from back then. Uh, Europe, they did that. Here, we didn't. Uh, uh, we spent the money on other things, and we failed to build them. So what you had, uh, you mentioned it earlier, you have uh, uh, a, a slide, and it's in your, the program, the, J. Lou had the uh, uh, chart where it shows the, the number of beds going down like this. But then if you look at that, at the same time, you have uh, uh, jail and prison incarceration going up 
uh, proportionate to how much it was going down. In other words, we let people out of mental hospitals, and then the, those same people became, and I'm going to use the term low-level offenders. Uh, it, it, what I learned 30 years ago was the expression was people doing life on the installment plan in terms of people who had, they had uh, uh, some type of substance abuse issue, mental health issues combined together very often, and they would commit low-level felonies throughout their life, uh, come in and out of custody. And what happens when you go into custody if you've been living on the streets and you're having problems? You sleep normal hours, you eat normal food. For the most part, you don't have access to alcohol and drugs, and suddenly you seem a lot better. Um, and they feel a lot better. They don't want to continue taking their medications. The doctor referred to that anogesia, if I'm not pronouncing it right. The phenomena where someone is in that type of environment and they're better. So we, like I said, we closed the mental facilities and we had our jails become the de facto mental facilities, which was not the right way to deal with it, but it was better than people living on the streets. And let's put it that way, all right? But then fast forward, that was deinstitutionalization number one. Deinstitutionalization uh, 2.0, if you will. Uh, uh, Jerry Brown is governor. He has a real problem because of all of this stuff. We, are, we have a, a population, an, an in-custody population with the California Department of Corrections went from, when this, this movement started, 25,000 people in uh, uh, in custody, up to 170,000 people about 10 year, eight to 10 years ago uh, in custody in CDCR and many thousands more in jails uh, uh, throughout every county. Um, it was costing too much money, so Jerry Brown said, we're going to do what's called uh, realignment. Realignment was sending uh, these low-level offenders back to the counties and having them housed at the counties. While they're housed at the counties, what ends up happening is because of the population that's there, we're letting more and more people out. Then Prop 47 happens if, uh, three years later. Prop 47 took these, these classes, of, and I'm calling them low-level uh, uh, low felonies. These are not rapists, not murderers, uh, uh, not the most aggravated types of cases, but they are people, as I said, coming in and out, doing life on the installment plan, and suddenly those felonies became misdemeanors. And in California, unlike Texas and other places, misdemeanors are little or no consequence. So what ended up happening is that they, these people on, in 2.0 over the last 10 years, they're not living in jail, or they're not coming in back and forth in jail, uh, and seemingly getting better during that period of time. Instead, they're decompensating more and more. They get worse and worse, and then uh, uh, they commit much more aggravated, much more serious crimes, uh, or they just live, and they're living homelessness on our streets. Um, that is a, a one part of the problem, and I appreciate it, and I'm not talking about, you know, this morning they talked about the uh, housing. Anybody who tries to tell you that this problem has nothing to do with the cost of housing is, is, I mean, I don't know what the strongest enough expression. Of course, the cost of housing, the nimbyism, all of this stuff, it's a major component of it. But a major component, the reason why we have approximately 50% of the people who are living homelessness right now have some level of uh, a significant mental illness and or uh, combined with drug addiction is also a significant part of the problem. And I'll leave it with that for now. Hi there, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tom Wolf, and uh, I'll just say to my friend Jeff over there, I'm definitely in the middle on this, okay? Um, so uh, it's true, yes, I am a formerly homeless uh, recovering addict, that's what I call myself. Four years ago this very day, I was homeless on the streets of the Tenderloin, sleeping in a doorway on Golden Gate between Hyde and Larkin, severely addicted to heroin and fentanyl and crack and benzos and alcohol and whatever else I could get my hands on because that's what we... Those of us that were out there using, we are all polysubstance users. It's not just heroin. It's everything. Um, <clears throat> I'm here today to get really specific, to talk about the role of policing as it, in our cities as it pertains to homelessness. So I'm just going to leave it there because I pretty much agree with a lot of what Jeff says about housing. I think we all kind of do. We know that California is in a big crisis right now. 
around housing and how we're going to solve it, but I want to stay specific about policing. So there's a whole movement in this country, and it's still out there, to defund the police and to remove the police from responses regarding people that are living unhoused on the street, especially people that are sleeping rough directly on the street. There are two things I want to point out about that. So I was arrested six times in a three-month period between April 29, 2018 and June 23, 2018 in San Francisco. First time I got arrested, I was holding four and a half ounces of heroin as a mule for the drug dealers that are out on the street. Okay? Um, I thought I was going to go to prison. I got booked. I went to county jail. I spent 16 hours in jail, and I was released on my own recognizance back into homelessness. I want to stress that. Okay? So it's not like they sent me to San Quentin, like they paint the picture on TV and all that. No, I was released on my own recognizance, no bail, 16 hours flat. And what did I do? I went right back to my drugs on the street. Okay? Then that got it caught in that cycle because I kept doing it over and over and over, violating my stay away order, shoplifting, holding more drugs. And I kept getting caught and kept getting arrested, kept getting booked. And then pretty soon after the third, fourth time, I started realizing it's the same cop that's arresting me all those times. I'll never forget, Rob Gilson, Officer Rob Gilson, he's not a cop anymore. He, he quit SFED because things were not, you know, it was hard. Um, and I'm really sad about that because he was a good cop. I have to say it, just honestly, he was a good cop. He cared, about, he cared enough about me. He gave an F enough about a homeless guy that all of you, with all due respect, would have stepped over and walked right by. He cared enough about me, okay? So when we talk about defunding the police, I have to go with our president on this, man. It's like, no, we need to have smart policing, but we need to fund our police to have them out there because they do play a critical role in addressing the street crisis that's on the street, period. I'm here today because of that cop's intervention. And so I'm going to show you a second, uh, a short video, because now in my recovery, I'm a big, I don't know, big, I'm a recovery advocate. I advocate for, for sensible drug policy, uh, drug policies directly related to homeless policy. I think we need to acknowledge that and recognize that and pay close attention to that, because drug policy in this country right now is going off the cliff, and that's super dangerous. I think we also need to acknowledge the drug crisis that's out there on the street. I think to do so would be irresponsible, to be quite frank. Last year in the Tenderloin in San Francisco, SFPD pulled 26.6 kilos of illicit fentanyl off the street just in that one neighborhood. And that's also where all the homeless people hang out. You do the math. You, you, it, it's hard. It's like I could cite data all day long, 650 overdose deaths last year. 40% of them were actually unsheltered on the street that died, right? But the bottom, but the bottom line is that all you have to do is walk down the street and you know that the issue of addiction and drug use has severely complicated the issue of housing the homeless in this state, and it must be addressed in a sensible manner. And that means that police must be involved whether we like it or not. And here's the other reason why. Um, let me see if I can make this work here. So. <clears throat> I don't want to lose all your attention. Stay tuned. <laughs> promise. I promise this will be worth it. That right there. <clears throat> so when you say when you say you know how to be homeless, what exactly do you mean? I know in Los Angeles, I've been homeless in San Francisco. I, I know, first of all, I know where to go. I know where you're not going to get trouble. I know where you're allowed to be homeless. Second of all, I know how to make money. I know how to make more money than I do now with a professional job. I can make four to five hundred dollars a day being homeless, and that is through theft. It's a very, it's a very precise system of you find people. You know, there's fences. There's people that buy stolen goods, and they tell you what they want, and you go into stores and you take those goods, and it's. It can be very lucrative if you're good at it. I know how to be a criminal. I mean, re really, I mean, that's just, and I learned that I didn't, you know, I wasn't homeless the first day and knew what, what I was doing, but I ran with other people and like people took me under their wing and, and I learned how to do that. And I know how to, 
you know, sacrifice my dignity and just kind of, I can sleep outside. I know where, I know the public restrooms that I can go in and do drugs in and take bird baths. And I, I just, it's a whole system. When you have to get good at it, you get good at it. Okay, thank you. So I just wanted to share that with you and then put it in context for you, okay? I'm not out here to bash the homeless. I was homeless too, okay? But you have to understand the context. This guy was homeless for 10 years in, on Skid Row in San Francisco, in Miami, and in New York. And all that time, the way that he survived and supported his addiction was through these means, right? So we now, as a community, as a society, have to make a decision. Do, are we going to allow that in the interim while we wait for housing to be scaled up and get this guy off the street or get him into treatment? Or are we going to ask police to intervene in his situation? Now, he's in recovery right now. He's almost, he got sober almost the same time I did. He's almost four years clean and sober like me. Last time I used was June 24th, 2018, and I think his was in August of 2018. And we both got clean because we were held accountable. And you can ask anybody that's in recovery, and I'm sure there are some people in this room that are in recovery like me, and you can ask them, what's one of the most important cornerstones for your recovery? And they will all tell you the same thing, accountability. So it's really important that we, that we figure out a way for policing, smart policing, to work to mitigate this situation while all of you that are making the policy are figuring out how we can get these people off the street permanently. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
so sorry that was a long answer to your question, but it's kind of a, that's a loaded question that brings up a lot of emotions. Um, but I would say it's, it's, we don't know for sure, but I would say it's well over half. Most of my um, colleagues on the San Francisco Police Department will tell you it's about 70%. I think that's a little high. So I kind of go in the middle and say 50. Tom, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, so look, if we, I, first I agree with Jeff that we shouldn't have to ask that question. If we had regional parity, amongst all the Bay Area, nine Bay Area counties and then extended across all 58 counties with services, you wouldn't have to ask this question. You know, Yolo County has zero treatment beds, okay, zero. San Francisco has, you know, maybe 1,000 when you factor in all the abstinence-based, faith-based programs and all that, maybe it's 1,000 beds. Why does, so that means if someone's seeking out help and is in their addiction, they're motivated to come to San Francisco because of the 24-7 access to fentanyl and drugs on the street. San Francisco does have an organized cartel-fueled drug, uh, drug dealing happening. It's highly organized, okay, and it's entrenched in our city. There's, it's unquestionable that that's what's happening. Um, and at the same time, <clears throat> even if they wanted help, they couldn't get any help in Yolo County. So they got to come to where they can get help, and that help is San Francisco. If we had regional parity, we wouldn't have to ask that question. But yeah, I, yeah, it's it. Look, the people that live in Baby Hunters Point, they're homeless. They're from here. They're from San Francisco. But the people that live in the Tenderloin, I think they're more transient. They're probably like eighty percent not. So when you put them all together, it's probably fifty, fifty-five percent that aren't from there. Uh, so you can see uh, Chief Armstrong just got here. Thank you so much for coming all the way here for us. Thank oh, you. no problem. Thank you. So um, next up, I would want to ask something about um, shelter spaces. So we know in San Francisco, there is a huge shortage of shelter spaces. Uh, but at the same time, sometimes when the shelter space is available, homeless, unsheltered homeless persons, not all, but some, they turn it down. So why, why would that happen? Um, I guess that's a Jeff yeah. question. Um, well, you're asking all the, like, all the really hard questions, which I appreciate. Because uh, this is another loaded issue, this idea of service resistance um, that comes up a lot. And I would say there's absolutely some people who don't want to go into our shelter systems, but they don't want to for very good reasons. I would say I, I have fortunately, thank goodness, have never had to experience homelessness, but I would never go into a shelter um, if I were. I, I just my own I, I can't tolerate being around that many people in an enclosed space. It would just freak me out. I'd rather sleep in the rain, frankly. And I think a lot of people that's the case. I think for other people, they're not allowed to bring their partners with them. You know, and who's going to leave their girlfriend or boyfriend or, or you know, partner out on the street because they get a shelter bed and you, you don't or you can't be together? And people also, like, there's no privacy. I mean, you have to remember, like, sometimes we think of homeless people like they're things. I mean, it's, it, it's you know, really um, sad, but we, like, they're, or they're a statistic. They're, they're human beings. They want to do all the things we want to do. They want to have sex. They want to maybe have a cocktail. They want to maybe read a book in private. And if you don't offer them that and a tent's a better option, then they're going to go to a tent. So part of it is we're just not offering um, a full range of services. And San Francisco's gotten way better at that. So we now have sanctioned tent encampments in addition to congregate shelters. And now we have hotel-based shelters and we have tiny home villages. I think that's kind of the right way to do it. So when I was leading the outreach team, yeah, some people would say no, but when we went out with a, if I said, oh, all I have is MSC South, which is our worst shelter in the city, people would be like, no. <laughs> I'm like, don't blame you. Um, let's you know, move on. I ain't gonna like punish you or penalize you or make you move because you don't want to go to a place that I won't want to go to. But when we go out with a menu, which is what we normally did, we'd of course start with the, who's going to take MSC South first because that's what we would offer. And then, well, oh, you don't want to go there? Well, how about one of our navigation centers? Um, I can't go to that neighborhood because of gang affiliations. Well, let me see if I can get you into another one. Like that's, you have to like understand that like these are human beings with agency and most of them have common sense, even people who are, who are mentally ill and even people who are using drugs, like doesn't mean they don't have common sense and they can't think about what they want. So yeah, there's some people who don't want to go inside, but I wouldn't call them service resistant. I would say the system isn't serving them. Um, and there's things that we're doing in San Francisco, at least in a lot of other places to, to deal with that. That doesn't mean I think it's okay for somebody to set up a tent wherever they want. 
because it is against the law, and I agree with Michael that you know we should be enforcing laws, but I think we gotta kind of find some, some balance and not just say, well, I'm gonna offer you a crappy shelter bed for two nights and then you need to do this. That's, we, gotta, we gotta find some kind of balance between the need to keep our sidewalks safe and clean and to not have crazy encampments with 70 people in a neighborhood creating all kinds of chaos, mostly amongst themselves, um, with having a system that, that makes sense and is humane and um, treats people uh, like humans. Um, speaking of uh, enforcing the law, so just now uh, Verum said something about Proposition 47, right? Um, so I just have some questions about that, and per perhaps um, Chief Armstrong can also address that as well. So suppose now I went to Safeway right now and steal something, say $900. What would happen to me? Or say I um, held a heroin or, uh, I don't know, meth or some other hard drugs. I don't know, even know the names. Like, what would happen to me right now? Well, I hope you wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think Prop 47 has really changed the way we police our city. Uh, the idea that for an auto burglary, for instance, where someone obviously busts somebody's car window and remove their belongings. These are, in Oakland, uh, what we consider to be misdemeanor cases, or even what we consider the thefts that you mentioned, going into Walgreens and stealing $900 worth of items would also be a misdemeanor cited into misdemeanor court. And then due to the COVID pandemic, our misdemeanor courts are actually not even hearing cases. So essentially, there's zero consequences as a result of that theft. And that's challenging for business owners, as you see in Oakland, it has forced uh, companies like Walgreens to have to actually hire police officers to provide security. A huge expense for any corporation, very difficult to keep businesses in a city like Oakland when you have uh, crimes that they know won't be charged. And so it is really challenging for us when we think about the idea that someone in possession of heroin or being under the influence of narcotics, not that it should ever have been uh, something that we arrested people for, but now we are sending them to diversion court. Um, and in diversion court, the question is, is what is the consequence for not actually continuing to go through the program, continuing to complete the requirements of the court? Uh, and so we tend to see, obviously, people have multiple interactions with us and be engaged in multiple things. The question is, is someone who obviously have a substance abuse addiction the question is, is, if they don't agree to go into treatment, you know, how do they continue to feed that addiction? Uh, and in most cases, they tend to be involved in a lot of low-level crime in Oakland. Um, and so some would say, in Oakland, been not much different in San Francisco, at least a year ago, it's hard for you to park your car in Jack London Square and not expect for it to come out with a, a new window. Um, and so that is the challenge of how do we manage this with these laws that don't allow us to take very much enforcement action how do we demonstrate to the public that we're actually trying to protect you uh, and protect your property when we really can't do anything uh, when these things happen? I was you know, working with our encampment management team is what we have in Oakland that manages all of our encampments. And we, we have a, an individual that's unsheltered who has over 400 bicycles. Uh, 400 bicycles taking up a complete lane of traffic. And we are trying to wrap our heads around, we continue to try to provide service and support that he's refusing, but then the question is, is where does all these bikes come from? And how do we, <laughs> how do we get them back to, the, to, to their rightful owners as well, right? I mean, there is a lot of bikes missing in Oakland. <laughs> and, 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 not, and while we laugh, these are the things that our community members oftentimes complain about, right? The idea that I can't walk in my house and leave my bike on the side of the house because It'll be gone immediately, and the police department is not going to do anything uh, to help me retrieve that bike. People lose confidence in law enforcement because we're unable to enforce laws. So then people become cynical and go, why even call? Um, and then we see 400 bikes, right? Because now 400 people haven't actually called police or reported those crimes. And so I think it is sort of that trickle effect that continues to have a huge impact on overall crime and safety in communities where people begin to lose confidence in our structure, our ability to respond and keep them safe. Uh, and so I think that's the challenge that we see in Oakland. Um, I guess I have a question for Vern related to Prop 47. Um, so we know that 
in California, the threshold is $950, right? If you're still under that, you're, as uh, Chief Armstrong just said, uh, very little will happen to me. Um, but in Texas, the threshold is actually much higher. I think it's about like 2,400 uh, or so. But why we don't see the same problem in Texas? Well, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, it, the, the practical reality is, is uh, culture, uh, in terms of the way our, we do law enforcement here, the way our jails are, uh, and prisons are overcrowded, and the, the reaction of how we deal with them. So uh, I spoke at a conference a few years ago in Texas, uh, a law enforcement um, conference, and they refer to people who commit crimes in Texas as criminals. That's openly. They're referred to as criminals. In California, they're not referred to as criminals. They're referred to as justice-involved individuals. Um, and so there's very different cultural differences. And so when, when we talk about Prop 47, we say, well, if it's a misdemeanor, that basically means nothing. And the chief did an excellent job of describing that whole inner relationship of what happened. So, so when you, uh, uh, you commit a, a misdemeanor, that type, we call it a misdemeanor, $950 today, you can do it over and over and over again. And even if you are prosecuted, um, the, the, the governor, this is, just shows you, it's not, that Prop 47 was very deceptive in the way that it was written, and it's very complicated. In California laws, I hate lawyers as much as anybody, <laughs> uh, is very, the way it was written, the governor of the state of California, who's a smart guy, uh, did an interview, and he was mad. I was the president of CDAA at the time, and this was about a little over a year ago, and he was mad at me about something I had said about, it's called petty theft with a prior. It used to be in California, if you committed theft multiple times, it would be, regardless of our ability to prove, because it's not just that it had to be more than $950, we have to prove that it was $950 and that you were the one that did it. So the, you, the smash and grabs that take place, five people co go in, uh, three of them get arrested outside, they all have $945 worth of property on them. One of them has $8,000 worth of property. That one's going to get charged with a felony. The other ones are going to get charged with misdemeanors, if at all. That's the reality of what the law is. The governor was uh, uh, questioned about it by an editorial board, and he said, you can do petty theft with a prior. Those damn Republican DAs are not telling the truth about it. And it's like, it looks like, that's what the law looks like it says, but there have been three or four prosecutions since Prop 47 uh, passed for petty theft with a prior because it's so complicated without going into to why. Um, uh, it, it, what ends up happening here in the state of California, if it's a misdemeanor, it typically does not even get reported. So, so understand it this way. If you look at it, the, uh, Marissa, who's supposed to be the, the moderator, um, she, and the first time I talked to her about it, she said, how is it that in San Francisco, uh, car burglaries and car thefts are going up significantly, but every other type of property crime is going down? And I said, well, it's, very, it's actually very simple. This is one of the simple ones. Uh, insurance companies require, if you get your car broken into, if you make a claim, you have to make a report. Uh, if your car gets stolen, you have to make a report. Typically what happens is it's just a phone report or you go online and do the report, but there is an, a report, so it's recorded, and that actual, there's a record and a, 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 that the data is collected on that. On most property crimes here in the state of California, and in particular in San Francisco, there is not going to be a record of it because it's ne either never going to be reported by the person who's the victim of the crime or the way law enforcement handles it. it will, there will not be a record, so it gives this deceptive thing that it seems like property crimes have not gone up as much as they have. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Tom. So uh, probably it's like a two-layer question. Since you were um, on the street using drugs, and now later you became a case manager at a permanent supportive housing. Mm -hmm. So you've seen both sides. Mm -hmm. um, so first question is, when you were on the street uh, using drugs, did anyone come up to you and say, hey, Tom, do you want to go to uh, rehab? And the second question is, when you were a case manager in the permanent, permanent supportive housing, where, which is supposed to provide the wraparound services, did you provide those services to your clients? Okay. Well, th so the 
The answer to the first question is yes, the police. The only time I was ever approached on the street for anything um, other than did I want to buy dope or did I want to buy some stolen goods, just being honest, was the cops. And it was usually because I was doing something wrong. Okay? I didn't have anybody come up to me doing outreach. And you know maybe that's changing with Urban Alchemy out there. There's more people out there walking the streets, street ambassadors. I think that's good. Um, but I don't think that you can discount the importance of the outreach that police do on the street. We were both just talking to a guy that's a cop in Richmond, Richmond, California here, that was here at this conference that left early, and he, he does street outreach. They've been doing it for years. <clears throat> I think that that, uh, <clears throat> that goes unnoticed, or it doesn't get talked about in the whole role of policing enough. We talk about just the, 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 the guns and this whole thing and you know all of that stuff, okay. You know, it's not 1987, okay? The war on drugs is over, okay? I, I'm just telling you now, in San Francisco, the war on drugs is over. They arrest 40 drug dealers every single month in the Tenderloin, and they don't arrest anybody for drug possession. And it's been that way for years. When I was on the street, and I, was, I remember one day I was hitting a crack pipe standing on Hyde Street in, Sacramento, on, on, in San Francisco, and I, turn, and I take a big drag off my crack pipe, and I turn around, and a cop had ridden up right behind me on a bicycle. And he was just looking at me, and I'm looking at him, and I freaked out, and I panicked, and I exhaled the crack smoke right in his face. Hmm. Right? You know what happened to me? He told me to step on my pipe and walk away. Okay? That, wasn't, that was four years ago. So there's no drug war in San Francisco. What's going on now is, is not the drug war, and it's something else that's completely twisted where we've allowed it to be a free-for-all. Now, um, and I explain that with the statistics of the amount of drugs we're pulling off the street in San Francisco, and that's just a small, tiny fraction of what's actually out there. Um, now, as far as offering services in case man as a case manager, I tried. I mean, we all tried. We all, if, you're, if you're working in case management or social work, you're not there for the money. Okay? <laughs> you're there because you actually care. You want to, like in my case, I wanted to give back in recovery. I wanted to give back to the people that are hardest to serve. I was working two blocks away from where I used to sleep on the street. That was hard, walking through the TL every day from BART up to my job, walking past where I used to sleep, seeing the same drug dealers on the street, seeing some of my friends out there. You know, this was just a year and a half after I had um, gotten off the street, not even that, like 15 months later. And uh, we tried, but you know, there were three case managers to serve 103 people inside. So you know they talk about housing first, and I'm not bagging on housing first, okay? But in, they always cite Finland as an example of how housing first works great. Well, did you know that in Finland, they average seven staff per every 21 residents in their buildings? Seven for every 21 residents. I, there were three case managers, and we were getting paid under 25 bucks an hour okay, to serve 103 people that had a variety of issues from addiction to severe mental illness to hoarding to uh, they were aged out foster youth. They didn't know anything concept about cleaning their room, let alone making a resume and getting a job. Okay? That has to change. If we want housing first to work as it's intended, that's where we need to invest our money. We need to pay these workers. Uh, we need to give them a adequate training, staff them, and then give them a real incentive to stay so they can really create a recovery-oriented type of system of care inside this permanent supportive housing. That's how you bring people back. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I guess another question is related to defund the police. Um, so um, could you tell us, um, Chief Armstrong, could you tell us the challenges that you, you and your colleagues have encountered um, during this whole movement? Yeah, um, probably one of the biggest challenges I've dealt with over the last two years is this defund the police sort of idea. And, and I really believe that it's rooted in people wanting to see better policing, uh, more quality professional policing. Um, and I think people believe that uh, that can occur. And so they believe that there should be potentially uh, an alternative uh, to police. Uh, now, I, you know, for me, I, I just, in the city of Oakland, and we were some, I want to be correct when I say not necessarily defunded, funds were reallocated uh, from the department uh, for an alternative response. 
Um, I, and it's challenging because, you know, my overall responsibility is public safety for the entire city of Oakland. And the idea for me was, does the reallocation of funds from the, from the police department to another program, is that going to lead to a safer city? Um, and, and that was the question that was left unanswered. To just satisfy philosophical beliefs that I want to see something other than policing, when you have a, um, an enormous violence problem, it, it just didn't seem to, to, to actually make very, very much sense. Now, I'm, I'm completely open to alternative responses to police, but I didn't think it needed to be at the expense of resources within the police department. Not in a city where, uh, over the last two years, we've seen 124 homicides and 130 homicides, back-to-back uh, -back years. Uh, we, uh, nightly, we experience call counts that reach 250 standing calls, which essentially means there's nobody to respond to those calls. Uh, they are waiting for hours, and in some cases, even days. That, to me, suggests that there is a resource problem. We don't have uh, the adequate number of officers to respond to the level of to the call volume that we're taking in in Oakland. And so I thought, you know, although I support the new program that we uh, help support uh, fund, which is our macro program, uh, which is a non-police response, uh, an alternative response, I look forward to what they can do in the community. I think it's important that community play a role in public safety. No doubt about it, but I do think we have to have the question of, when I came into the police department over close to 25 years ago, the city of Oakland was about 365,000 people. Now the city is close to 450,000 people. When I came in, we had nearly 800 officers. Today we sit at 667. So while the city has almost grown 100,000 people, we have nearly 133 less officers. Uh, and the call volume is much higher. And I think when some people may not even understand the dynamic of, if you've ever called 911 from your car, from your cell phone, You've always been forwarded, in most cases, to the California Highway Patrol as the dispatch center. And then they would triage those calls and send them to the local jurisdiction. Well, uh, Highway Patrol has begun uh, to move all of those calls back to the original jurisdiction. What does that mean for Oakland? That means we took in, for this year, we'll take in an additional 350,000 calls. So we will reach a million calls this year, and we just don't have the resources to meet that demand. So. We can have a conversation about improving policing, but I think those are two different conversations about what level of resources you need to deal with the challenges that you have in your particular city. Thank you. Uh, I have two more questions, now. then I'll open up to the floor. Um, one for Jeff and one for Vern. So Jeff, um, you are now working at Urban Alchemy, um, which provide community support uh, for the local community and people who live there and also the homeless persons. So what are some of the top challenges, briefly telling us? Some of the top? The top challenges. Of doing that work? Oh, uh, well, I think the top challenge is, well, I should just also say, I mean, Urban Alchemy, um, most of our staff uh, have been incarcerated. Most of them uh, were um, LTOs or long-term offenders. We provide a variety of services, street cleaning, bathrooms and showers for unsheltered folks. We run shelters. We provide community ambassador services in LA. We run uh, the circle program. We respond when a 911 call comes in about a homeless person in certain neighborhoods where we respond. Um, but we don't like to, even though I may have said it once, and my apologies, Chief, we don't like to say alternatives to the police. We like to say complementary strategies to policing because we don't think that, because we, do, we don't want to give the impression that we don't support the police and that we don't think that the policing is incredibly important, like Tom and the Chief were talking about. So we're, we're a complementary strategy to policing. That's most of what we do. I mean, honestly, the biggest challenge I could think of is in the past four months, two of my colleagues were shot by drug dealers. Um, on the streets, you know, we don't, we don't, because we're not out there to force people to do anything. Um, we're not out there to tell drug dealers to go away. It's not our job. We're not there. To, we're we're just there to like engage with people and get them to, you know, to get them to not engage in antisocial behavior. But unfortunately, that seemed like it was a threat. Um, and I'll, I'll just say, I mean, it was both in both cases. Or it was um, no, that's not true. Only w one case was a Honduran drug dealer because they're kind of running the streets of the Tenderloin. The other situation was a little bit different, but both were involved uh, drugs. So it's really, and but man, 
bless my coworkers, I feel so honored to be there. I mean, they did not miss a beat, nobody. Everybody was back to work the next day. Thank goodness both of my colleagues were fine. Uh, it wasn't serious because these, these uh, women and men are so committed to making the conditions in what was their, you know, in many cases, their neighborhoods better. That, and, and because of they've been through some pretty hard times, they just were able to roll with it. Um, and, uh, and they all would joke with me and be like, don't worry, it's okay to still wear your shirt, Jeff. We'll, we'll keep an eye on you. Because um, a lot of them feel like the Urban Alchemy logo um, is like a target. So that's a huge challenge. But I'd say more germane to this conversation, I'd, I'd say the biggest challenge is you know, we don't have enough access to services uh, for our clients. Tom and I were just lamenting, like trying to get somebody in a treatment in San Francisco, even if they want it, it's like, you know, I mean, I can't figure it out. It's just so complicated. So if we have somebody who wants to go to treatment, we can't just, we would, we would just hold their hand and take them to treatment um, and come back and check on them every day to see how it's going. But we have to take them to another place where they get screened and they may or may not get treatment then and they may have to go back the next day and then they gotta go somewhere. I mean, it's crazy. So the lack of access to services makes it hard because a lot of people see us as like, you know, we're telling them to not be in the doorway and we're trying to offer assistance, but we can't always offer what, what they need. And, um, and just one more thing and I'll, I just, and I'll shut up. Um, but like my staff, I mean, we pay our, our folks well. We, we refuse to pay less than a living wage um, with benefits to all of our employees, but they don't make a ton of money. So because they don't have stuff to give, they often just go into their own pockets and like buy food. Um, or buy coffee or take somebody to the, like they can't get them the treatment, so they'll take them you know, to, the, to the Burger King on the corner there and, and get, them a, get them a meal. Um, but that's uh, kind of heartbreaking to not, to not have that. So I'd say getting shot at and not having enough services um, are our are, are two biggest challenges. Thank you. Um, my last question is for Vern. So um, can you talk a little bit about drug court? Is it effective and why are we not um, using them now? Well, the, the, the consequence of the stuff that I was talking about before with uh, realignment and Prop 47 is that, uh, and it was talked about earlier today in, in one of the earlier panels, is that there has to be some type of an incentive for those types of a drug court to work. There has to be a consequence and an incentive. And it can't be, as uh, somebody said earlier, that, well, maybe a year from now or two years from now, you will there might be a consequence. It needs to be right now there's a consequence. Drug courts, uh, to the extent that they were working and beginning to be effective, I believe, in California eight to 10 years ago, uh, they were uh, judges like uh, Larry Brown in Sacramento, and there's, there's one in Santa Clara, dealing with behavioral health as well as drug courts. Those types of things work because they had judges who uh, would impose a sanction if they said they're going to do something, if they said, if you don't do this, if you get a positive test, you're going in for seven days, and they actually meant it, and they followed up on it. Those types of things would work. What we have now is the, and I'm not blaming any lawyers that might be here, uh, uh, the, the, the public defenders, the attorneys that represent them uh, are, tell, the, tell the individual, there's no consequence if you just say, I don't want to do it, nothing will happen. And guess what? Nothing happens. And so why would you do it? Why do you do it? And that's, that's kind of the, the trade-off with it. Um, it wasn't a perfect, drug courts were not perfect. I think they were, there was a lot of room for improvement. But it's like that in everything. It, you know, I, I, I'm sitting up here and you're asking about the, the uh, defund the police, um, the housing first, uh, all of these things. I, I hate slogans. When you, slogans like that, they, uh, they try to make it so as people oversimplify something so they can get behind it, and they oftentimes don't understand what it is that they're actually advocating. Uh, the people, I had a, a, a legislator try to tell me that when he was talking about uh, defund the, the police, he didn't mean to actually get rid of the police and defund them. What he, what he meant was that we needed to have more professional law enforcement. And I said, well, here's the problem with that. And it's like with all these slogans. <laughs> if you demonize law enforcement, and then, like the chief, you, I don't know if you have kids, but if, you have a, if you've been in law enforcement, if you've been in this business for 25 or 30 years, and you have a son or daughter who uh, has options, and they say to you, uh, you know what, I think I want to go in law enforcement. I think I want to be a... Uh, Highway Patrol officer, I want to be a police officer in Oakland. 
I won't speak for you, but I suspect that's going to be a really serious conversation about maybe you want to think about those options. And so what ends up happening with that is that we lo we're losing uh, uh, really qualified, motivated people who are no, no, no longer coming into law enforcement now because of this type of demonization of them and that they'll say, eh, I'm going to do something different. Yeah. Um, and that's happened. It's making recruiting much tougher. It's making officers have to work overtime. And what we're getting, instead of getting more professional officers, we're getting overstressed officers that can't respond to stuff. Look at this thing, this, this, the media attention in San Francisco over the, the officers that responded to a, a, a pot house, a pot a dispensary. And that they pulled up outside and they sat up the road and they didn't immediately go into that. I don't know if you've seen that. There's been quite a bit of media in San Francisco. But why didn't they immediately, the first officers on scene, why didn't they go in and stop that burglary? That's what they're asking. I know why they didn't do it. And it's the, the era of what we're living in right now, the consequences. They don't know if the person's armed inside. They haven't had a supervisor tell them to specifically go in. They know anything they do is going to be judged and second-guessed. Um, and it is a very tough thing for law enforcement now. Thank you so much. Um, so now I'll open up to the floor. Any questions from the audience? Um, David, right there, David. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I, I've advocated for just repealing Prop 47 uh, in total and starting over. Um, I testified in front of the legislature on that, and uh, this, the response I, from a legislator uh, was, uh, so you're in favor of mass incarceration. And I said, because we don't, you don't have real policy discussions at the legislature, for any of you who have not been there recently. They're, that is not what happens there. Um, but I spoke with him separately, and I said, you do understand that Prop 47 is not mass incarceration. These are low-level felons that people that don't typically go to prison. They're in and out of jail and spending time in jail. That's the net. Is what your, your response has nothing to do with what it is that I'm talking about. The, the, the way to fix it, the, what we need to do, I, I'm, I support what the governor is advocating with the care courts. I think the devil is in the details, to use that expression. People should not go to jail or prison because they have a drug problem. They should not go to jail or, in and of itself. They should not go to jail or prison, certainly because they're mentally ill and they're schizophrenics, that they've decided not to take their medication. I don't want them. I saw it. It bothered me from my career seeing this thing of what I call the life on the installment plan, where you see it's like this person is in and out of custody because they're committing low-level offenses because we let them. And so I, I, I don't know what the perfect solution is, starting with Prop 47. That, that video that you played, uh, I, I'll give you, uh, leave you with this, and then sh I'll shut up. That I could, that video you could watch, the district attorney of Yolo County, who is a very good friend of mine, his nephew, that is like watching him. He is an affluent kid, grew up a, a very well-educated family, had every opportunity for him. He lives in West Sac. He laughs at law enforcement when he's been arrested multiple times. I don't know how many, but it's a big number, a number of times. He's like, I get sex when I want sex. I get drugs when I want stuff. I don't need or want anything. You guys have told us there is no consequence for anything that I do and the lifestyle that I've chosen to live. That is the problem, and repealing Prop 47 is a big part of that. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Lisa? Sorry, Lisa, be right there. And if others have questions, you could stand up so I can see you. Yeah, I have a question about criminalization, and by which I mean, like, over time, we've gotten to the point as a society where law enforcement has the primary responsibility for dealing with mental health calls and dealing with uh, mental health as, like, frontline first responders. My question is, how do we push it back away out of law enforcement's court and put it back in the lap of, uh, you know, our medical providers and our social services? How do police officers who are not really in a position to say no to a call 
and how, how do we as policymakers kind of try to undo that damage? Well, I think what we're doing in Oakland is uh, partnership, partnered with the Alameda County Mental Health Department, really relying on uh, the psychologist to partner with the department, be actually in the car with the officer. Right? So we have a program where an officer and a clinician are partnered together and they're responding to calls together and allowing the clinician to actually evaluate the person, uh, be able to provide them the support that they need. I, I think the delicate balance, though, I've seen is that the reality is that people don't call 911 on family members or loved ones unless there's violence. And, and so I, I think that the misnomer is that people sometimes think the mere fact that law enforcement responds to mental health calls uh, is you know, not the right response. But I would say, as we've looked at our overall calls with the new program that we've implemented in Oakland, 90% of those calls we would still have to go to because there's some violence related to that call. I often say a mother doesn't call the police on her child unless she has lost complete control of him, uh, or, uh, he or she. Uh, and you need law enforcement to intervene to make sure that they get the services that they need. Um, and so I don't expect that our call volume, particularly when it comes to mental health calls, will go down very much with an alternative response because in most cases, if the person was willing to voluntarily be evaluated or go with an ambulance, you actually don't need police, right? You can simply call an ambulance and they can transport that person and get them the support that they need. So I do think, again, as to what he just spoke of, right? It's like everybody has used these words that, that, that they believe, you know, uh, have meaning when you say, oh, let's have, you know, law enforcement not respond to mental health calls, right? That, believe me, every police officer in America would love to not go to a mental health call, right? Uh, I do believe that law enforcement has been asked to do too many things over many years, things that we probably shouldn't be doing, probably weren't well trained to do. Um, and so I do think uh, these alternative responses allow us to actually dial back to your point, the things that we probably don't need to do. Other uh, systems that are better equipped to do that, better response, and I think in some ways provide the person actually uh, a better outcome than if we were to come, right? Um, and so uh, we are trying to sort of deal with that issue uh, around what is the right approach. Is it the approach where law enforcement and clinicians are coming together, or is it an approach without law enforcement at all? Thank you. Let's take one last question. Not so much a question as um, complicating the narrative of what you just raised, Chief. Uh, of course, many of the calls that come in now to police officers, to 911, are for things that involve violence because yeah. of the responses from police who are to respond to violence. So if there were a um, complementary alternative, I think the idea is that there'd be some preventative calls. So there would be someone to step in earlier uh, and hopefully reduce some of the calls you get in the end. Maybe it wouldn't change the call volume. Maybe it would just get other people care earlier. But I want to name that as we're thinking about what complementary services mean, um, because it, there's more to the reasons people call police at this point. This, it's, I guess what I want to say is it's, it's a bit of a chicken egg problem. If there were different services coming when people called 911, they might not all be violence calls. How does that sit with you? Does that seem right? No, uh, yeah, I'm fine with that. One of, one of the mm -hmm. things I think is going to be a dramatic shift in Oakland is that our macro program will have its own number. Mm -hmm. And so uh, less reliance on the 911 system might help. Mm -hmm. And so I totally agree with you. I think once uh, communities like Oakland can, can uh, be introduced to a new system that might be able to send alternative services, uh, I, I think that might have an impact on our overall call volume, particularly even mental health calls, mm -hmm. uh, because they will be able to provide additional resources that law enforcement is not equipped to provide. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I, we'll see, but, I, but we are eagerly uh, anticipating a full citywide deployment of this program to evaluate it. So uh, from the Oakland Police Department standpoint, we look forward to working with them. Uh, it will definitely help us be more responsive to our community. I appreciate that. I wanted to simply underscore that in the spirit of the slogan comment, that there are some of the ways that we speak about these opportunities and these different strategies that can really turn people off. Um, and limit our thinking about what possibilities are available. So thanks for responding to that. I see Bern have... Just the last two questions. That it's the point of what you said is if you can move back the timeline a little bit, because as the chief was saying is when law enforcement gets called 
things are really bad. You're calling on a family member. You're, you, things are really bad. If we can move back the time, and you, you made the point earlier today, is the statutes that we currently have put us in, put the law enforcement when they come out, is this person 5150? Are they such a, a danger to themselves or others that I have to do something right now? That is a mistake. That we, the person, we need to intervene before the person is decompensated to that point. And if we can do that, then, then we have fewer calls and fewer of those types of uh, things to deal with. And that it requires a change in the statutes. All right, thank you. Please join me in thanking this great panel. Thank you. Thanks, Shalu, for mo expertly moderating the session on, uh, unexpectedly, too. Just want to tell everyone what the game plan is here. They're going to flip the room, so we have a reception outside. There is beer and wine, but for my undergrad students who are in here, Patricio, Victoria, no, 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 cranberry juice, apple juice, water. In any case, we'll come, be there you are, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, we'll be able to come back in at 6.30 for the dinner and the keynote uh, dinner address by uh, Mayor uh, Kevin Falconer with uh, Olivia Martin, who's a student here. Uh, great, so we'll see you out there.
let me make sure this is the old one. Okay, this is from the previous one. A right. different one? Yeah. All right, so maybe, let me see. Okay, let me talk with the AV guy. Um, Schellenberger. No, it says here. Kevin Faulkner. I think that one doesn't open, but you can try. Yeah, that's the problem. But okay. Hello there. I'm Kevin. I'm trying to figure out my slice. One of my team members sent them. ones that were here this year.
One video is the best one. So we went through the slides, the slides, slides, and then the video. Okay, so that was the way. Okay, so we'll take the slides. Can you get the uh, fourth visual up here? Can you show the top one video that they showed us? You don't need that one. Yeah, that's the Kobe. Kobe. Where did you grow up in Kobe? Um, living, living on the streets, got comfortable after a while. You know, you had the Christian folks feeding us. Every day, here and there, places to go, and then you just got satisfied with living on the streets and showering in trash cans and, um, you know, roughing it. And for some reason, I got satisfied with that. And I got my jaw, jaw shattered. Someone from behind took a pole across my head. Drugs have always been a big, sad part of my life, you know. And um, I was on the street, and I was, I was, I just couldn't get myself out of it. And you know, um, living, living on the streets got comfortable after a while. You know, you had the Christian folks feeding us every day here and there, places to go. And then you just got satisfied with living on the streets and showering in trash cans, and um, you know. Roughing it, and for some reason I got satisfied with that. And I got my jaw, jaw shattered. Someone from behind.
Okay, hello everyone. I've been given instructions to ask everyone to start eating because the program isn't going to start until the entrees are delivered. And the entrees aren't going to be delivered. You don't have to eat your salad if you don't want, but like it looks pretty healthy. Uh, so you probably should. Uh, so eat your salads and then we'll, I mean, don't like wolf, you don't have to wolf it down. Like just, anyway, and then we'll have introduce our program. And I think it's going to be a very good program. It's going to be fun. Okay.
Hello. Uh, I'm glad to see everyone's enjoying dinner, and I hope you had fun at the reception too. Uh, we uh, last, but most definitely not least, we have we're going to have a session with uh, Mayor, well, recent Mayor Kevin Falconer from San Diego, and he's going to share with us, as you can see, homelessness solutions for California. Uh, our dinner keynote. And I, my job now is to introduce the moderator of the session. And I am very happy to introduce the moderator. Her name is Olivia Martin. She's actually a graduate student here at Stanford. And getting, because getting an economics PhD wasn't enough, she decided to also get a law degree, a JD. She was, she's a JD PhD student here at Stanford. She is not coincidentally from San Diego, California. And she, is, uh, she graduated from Stanford with a bachelor's degree in economics. I've known Olivia for a long time. Olivia was a student in my class that I taught with Steve Ballmer. She was later a TA for the class with Steve Ballmer. I think I advised your thesis. Yes, I was her econ major advisor, so, and we have uh, stayed in good touch. She uh, actually, if you look, if you were to look at a policy forum that we had three and a half years ago, where the keynote was Governor Jerry Brown, you'll notice that Olivia was the moderator of that session as well. So Olivia's got a lot of fans here at CEPR. Uh, she aspires to help governments better collect and use data to design and implement sustainable, equitable, and evidence-based policy. Olivia led the research and analysis, ef analysis efforts at USA Facts, a not-for-profit, non nonpartisan civic initiative dedicated to increasing the availability of government data to drive fact-based discussion. This is, was started by Steve Ballmer. And I would just like all of you to know, Steve Ballmer is the owner of the LA Clippers. <laughs> and I'm gonna be, I am fr uh, from the Boston area, so I'm gonna be mentioning to him tonight that he said to me three months ago that the Celtics were doing horribly. <laughs> and they are right now up in game two against the Miami Heat. So tonight, I'm gonna text Steve Ballmer. And I'm going to say, remember that thing where you were saying the Celtics were so terrible? Yeah, not true anymore. Uh, so anyway, uh, sorry for that little digression. Uh, Olivia also helped the Balmer Group Philanthropy develop a new portfolio of talent-related investment. At Stanford, she served as the chair of Stanford and Government, one of the university's largest student groups. And her research has been published in a peer-reviewed journal, and she was a recipient of the Anna Laura Myers Prize for Outstanding Honors Thesis in Economics. So please join me in welcoming our last moderator of the day, Olivia Martin. Thank you, Mark, for as always a very nice, if not maybe over the top introduction. <laughs> Um, I've known Mark for, for a long time, and I, I know he'll get great joy from sending that text to, to, to Steve. <laughs> um, but it's my pleasure to now introduce mayor, former Mayor Kevin Faulkner, who served as the 36th mayor of San Diego, California, my hometown where I was born, from 2014 to 2020. Prior to that, he served as a member of the San Diego City Council from 2006 to 2014, he was actually born not too far from here in San Jose, California, and grew up in Oxnard, where his father served as an assistant city manager. Um, mayor Faulkner achieved a number of things during his time as mayor, but one of his no most notable accomplishments was his commitment to and success in decreasing homelessness in the city. It's my pleasure to introduce him to tell us more about his work in San Diego. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think this is yours. Uh, well, good evening. Thank you for uh, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Stanford. Thank you, Seeper. It's uh, uh, and I, I had a chance uh, to sit in as part of the um, the last session as well. What a great group of speakers that uh, that you've had. Um, it, you know, not just you know all day long. So uh, congratulations to yourself. And somehow I made the cut, and I'm happy to uh, happy to be here to tell you. A little bit about some of the things that uh, we were able to do in San Diego, really some hard lessons learned. Um, 
And I'm glad you gave my a bio and an introduction because I, was, uh, I served a couple of terms on the San Diego City Council and then two terms as mayor. And I remember when I ran for mayor, all of the issues that we were talking about during the campaign, and certainly homelessness was one of them, but it was a lot lower on the issue when I remember that campaign when I, when I first ran. Uh, I will also tell you, my last three years in office, I spent more time on homelessness than any other issue, than any other topic uh, is mayor. Um, and as we look at what's happening right now in our state, I don't care what city you're in, homelessness isn't just an issue, it's usually the issue. It's usually the issue. So the fact that um, you had such a great group of, of folks uh, from all over uh, the state today, I think speaks uh, highly of what uh, everybody is doing. Uh, but I think also the sense of urgency, and it's like, what, what do we need to do to, to help people? Um, and, and ultimately, you know, that's something that I think it's incredibly important to remember, all the different topics. We're talking about people, right? We're talking about human beings. We're talking about somebody's mom, dad, sister, brother that's on the street. What are we going to do uh, to help make that better? And so that's the approach that um, I took. Uh, but again, it was one that I, I came to um, as I look back at myself when I first got elected. That was probably maybe what a, typ a lot of typical elected officials were, which is didn't know a whole lot about the ecosystem and homelessness was somebody else's problem. Maybe it was the counties, maybe it was the states. We were doing some stuff in, in San Diego. Um, but that really all changed for me. Uh, it changed for me in uh, 2017 when we had a hepatitis A outbreak in San Diego County that hit us particularly hard in the city of San Diego uh, and the urban part of, of San Diego, uh, the downtown. And all leading up to that, as we look at you know, homelessness, as we look at was it the county's responsibility, was it the city's responsibility, like a lot of finger pointing. I know you talked about some of that a little bit earlier today. I said, you know what? I'm mayor. Uh, this is my city. These are my streets. Uh, I'm going to held accountable for it, even if I'm not technically, quote, responsible. And we can argue who's responsible and whose job it is from the state to the county to the city. But we needed to do something. Uh, and so we took some pretty dramatic action. And what I might do is, uh, well, I am going to do is I'll share maybe just for 15 or 20 minutes some of the things we did and then spend most of my time uh, answering your, uh, uh, your questions. But Hep A was an emergency. We had people dying. So what are we going to do? Are we going to have a, uh, a seminar? Are we going to talk about it for months? Are we going to have somebody go out and do a study and a plan and come back to me in a year? That, that's not going to work. Again, people were on the street, and we needed to do something um, right away. And so I said, OK, we're going we're gonna to change the system. There was a lot of great ideas. And I said, we're going to say yes. We're going to say yes to them all. And if there's anything I can leave you with tonight, it's about taking action, guys. It's about not letting perfect be the enemy of the good. <laughs> it's about taking action. Uh, and so we took some dramatic action. Um, and we learned some hard lessons. Uh, along the way. One of the very first things that we did is I set up a, uh, a campground site um, in San Diego to say, we're going to have a place for you to come right now. And you know, get rid of, there was tents on the sidewalk. Come in, we're going to have tents, we're going to have services, we're going to, you know, we're going to help solve this right away. But it was very clear to me that as we looked at shelter and shelter providers and others, and it was again a lot of nonprofit and private sector stuff, I said, there has to be a role for the city. Because the size and scale of what we're dealing with is not working. So let's change that. Uh, and so if you look at what we've spent in terms of what most cities spend at the time and what cities and counties are spending now, right, it's, it's, it's going up. Because it has to. <laughs> because it has to. You have to invest and you have to put the resources and you have to have the political will, as we were just talking at the dinner table, to actually do things and, and make a difference. Um, so when we, when we saw the fact that you know, we didn't have a health and human services department in the city, that was the county, I'm not going to let that stop me from doing something to help people and to get them off the street. Um, and so I knew that we controlled land use. I know that we controlled a lot of different things, and I could do that as mayor, so I did it. I declared a state of emergency, and we moved, we moved pretty aggressively. Um, one of the things we did, uh, this is a photograph. Uh, I established a series of bridge shelters. These are sprung structures, uh, sprung structure tents with, um, you can see some of the, the housing and the, the, uh, the cots there. But it was not just a bed. 
It was the wraparound services that give people a clean, safe, sanitary place to go outside of the streets. Um, and I picked the locations myself for them. Where are we going to put these bridge shelters in San Diego? A lot of people want more homeless services. They just don't want them right here. Or they just don't want them right there. So I went to the community and I said, we need to help folks. Um, this is what we have to do. And I went to our private sector. I don't know if Drew Mosier is still here from the Lucky Duck Foundation. Uh, I involved the private sector as well. I said, I'm going to need your help to fund some of these. These are not inexpensive. Uh, we set up a series of three bridge shelters that could house 1,000 people, 1,000 people that we wanted to get off the street, again, to have a place to go. Um, and I made a deal with the community. I said, it's going to be cleaner and safer in this neighborhood with this bridge shelter than before it was there. And I said, if that doesn't work, you know who to blame, because I'm the guy picking the sites. <laughs> and the city council at the time was very happy to allow me to pick the sites. <laughs> Trust me, because all of them thought it was going to work. We had some great providers. Uh, I was just uh, this morning, actually, at Alpha Project, one of our main providers in, in San Diego with Bob McElroy and his team. They had a group from Vancouver and looking at what we were doing. I would just say, as an aside, before COVID hit, we had 21 different cities from across the country to come look at the ecosystem that we set up in San Diego, with the bridge shelters being a big part of that. Um, so we set up those uh, bridge shelters. And as I said before, we knew that we had to act, and we had to act uh, right away. In these shelters, by the way, it's not just a bed. It's wraparound service. We have housing navigators, match people with resources, what, you know, with vouchers or HUD or you know, whatever it is. We had a uh, you know, place for personal belongings, storage, showers, food, all of that. Uh, we also had, we got our friends at the county to agree that, yeah, this is actually a good thing to put in mental health services here. <laughs> and so we brought mental health services in on site. Um, and to see... The, the sense of individuals that they know that they had a place, right? The dignity that is involved in that. Um, it's incredibly important. Um, also helped, I did a little picture there of clean San Diego uh, because it's something that's, I think, incredibly important uh, when it comes to uh, what we're going to be doing uh, in terms of your city and surrounding areas. A lot of talk in our last session about uh, law enforcement and what is the role of law enforcement. There is a role. Um, and I felt so strongly about backing up that commitment to the community on cleaner and safer that I created a new division in the San Diego Police Department called the Neighborhood Policing Division, whose sole focus was on homelessness and quality of life. And this became a division that men and women in the department wanted to be a part of. They wanted to be a part of because they knew that they had the political support of a mayor, and they also knew that they have the ability to make a difference right away that they can let folks know, hey, we have a place for you to go, and we're serious uh, about that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a second. Uh, I also, we, I think we, one of the discussions I heard earlier was on safe parking lots. Uh, we created several safe parking lots in our city. I picked the locations. We also had uh, lots for RVs. But again, not just a, a place for you to park your car, but a place that has rules, that has uh, wraparound services, housing navigators, and others that worked extremely well and was very effective. Also had storage centers. This is a picture of one of them in San Diego, uh, downtown. You get, to, you get a sense of the scale and size that I'm talking about. Eighth largest city in the country uh, in San Diego. And again, a place where individuals can put their personal belongings, where you can check them in and check them out in a clean, safe, sanitary environment. Uh, I would go there uh, frequently as mayor. And to see somebody, you know, again, who was, you know, has their belongings, know that they were safe. And I remember the gentleman that um, I just came across who was uh, checking on some personal belongings because he was off to go uh, get a, uh, an interview as a, to be a security guard. Uh, but that was his spot, and he had some stuff there. And it was worked very, very well. We also worked with a lot of our uh, nonprofit providers, uh, and particularly our interfaith community. I think that's a shot of me doing something at some point. Um, <laughs> not just about government only, right? I mean, we have some great providers in San Diego, uh, particularly our faith community, and I brought them in from the very beginning because I said, you're going to have a partner now and somebody who's going to invest the time, effort, and energy um, to be successful. Um, I know one of your panels earlier talked a lot about housing. Do we need more housing? Yes. Yes, yes, and yes. 
and we better darn well make it easier to construct housing. I don't know if you got into the CEQA reforms or anything like that. Um, okay, so we need CEQA reform. <laughs> um, but I can't, I can't do that as mayor. But what I did do, um, I took the CEQA as flawed as, as it is, and you can tell where I've come down on this. Um, I did a citywide uh, CEQA, we called it Complete Communities. It says you can come in and we can build the housing by right with a permit. We did a CEQA thing that took us about a year and a half, two years to do, and you can come in and actually make that housing close to our transit corridors, where we want it to happen, extra density, a lot of other things, providing that incentives. That Complete Communities program in San Diego is working dramatically well. We need to do that exactly, by the way, statewide uh, California, because CEQA is used as a weapon to stop good quality projects that they need to be done. That's not the topic, but I care strongly about that. Housing alone isn't just uh, it. I mean, as, as I said before, you need to do um, so many other things as well. Um, and we did, you know, we did a lot of training, uh, a lot of work on job training and counseling, and part of those job training services, again, at our bridge shelters because they were so important. So back to what is the one solution? There isn't one. It's all of the above. Our safe parking lots we opened. Never had those before. These shelters, the bridge shelters, that we put up, uh, again, at public expense and private dollars, we started that. Uh, our storage centers got those up and running. Our cleanup crews um, and our homeless housing navigators, all about action. If you wait to get a committee to do something about where you, should we do a shelter? Should we do tiny homes? What should we do? You're going to talk about it forever, and nothing's going to happen. That political will becomes very, very important. As I said, not letting perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, and I certainly, that was something that I felt very, very strongly about, and it was from those lessons of, of HEPE. Um, and because we care about people enough not to let you die on our sidewalks. That's what it comes down to. And I believe that every human being has a right to shelter. I also believe that when we provide that shelter, you have an obligation to use it. And I enforced that obligation as mayor uh, in San Diego, and it worked. Um, and I'm going to show you the little video and a, and a story on, on something uh, about that. Uh, but again, you have to take action. Um, little point in time count, we were the only big city in California where we reduced homelessness by double digits. Um, the unfortunate reality is that it is skyrocketing across our state right now. Um, the unfortunate reality is uh, some of the things I've talked about have changed in San Diego. Our own city is starting to creep back up, unfortunately. Uh, but you can see there, I think we put Seattle, San Francisco, and San Diego on that one. Uh, Los Angeles is not on that because the graph wouldn't make it. It's too big, unfortunately. That's the reality. Um, but back to, that, um, back to the fact that um, you have to have a plan. You have to connect with people on the street. You have to give them the support. You have to give them those consequences for not following that support. And I did that. You can't shy away from that. And you've got to make sure that your, your focus is always on housing. It's always about how do we get people off the street into the shelter. We call them bridge shelters because it's a bridge. It's a bridge from the street to that apartment of your own. Um, and I don't like to get sucked into is it housing first, you know, slogans and all that. It's about how do you get people off the street now. How do you get people off the street now? Because folks are in the water, right? The, the analogy uh, some folks have used, I think it's, it's great. Someone's in the water, they're about to drown. Do you go up to them and say, hey, wait right there, I'm going to go build you a boat, and I'll come back? No, you throw them a life preserver. You get them out of the water. That's what we need to do in California and every city. We've got to get people off the streets now. You can't wait. That's why I believe that the bridge shelter network was so important in San Diego and why it allowed us to do um, some of the things that, that we needed to do there. Um, let me go back here. So we spent a lot of time, as I said, connecting, supporting, uh, and housing. And there was a, I'm really glad I saw part of the last session, because that outreach is incredibly important. Um, you have to connect from people on the, and should it be, case workers? Should it be social workers? Should it be our police department? Yes. Yes. Um, as part of our neighborhood policing division, 
every time that our men and women officers went out, and by the way, it was, you know, we're out with the khaki pants and polo shirts, right? Because impressions are important. We're here, it's like, hey, we're here to help you and do, and do good things. Um, but every time that, you know, our folks went out there, there's like, I have a bed for you. Nobody ever got enforced on or anything else who didn't say no to a clean, safe shelter bed. That, I believe, was incredibly important in why we did uh, what we did and why that carrot, if you will, and the stick is so important because you have to have standards and, again, you want to you wanna have help people. And for some folks to say, you know, it's just not okay. It's not okay to let somebody kill themselves doing heroin and meth in front of your house, in front of your business, underneath the freeway underpasses or overpasses. We change that. Again, why? Because we care about you. And so back to that, uh, you know, we have the obligation, I believe, as public officials and leaders to provide that shelter. We do. It's not inexpensive. But again, if we want to do, if we want to help people, um, it's absolutely essential. I'm going to show a quick uh, video here of uh, uh, one of the uh, success stories, just a, a great individual. Um, his name was Brian. Drugs have always been a big, sad part of my life, you know. And uh, I was on the street, and I was... I, was, I just couldn't get myself out of it, and you know, um, living living on the streets got comfortable after a while. You know, you had the Christian folks feeding us every day here and there, places to go, and then you just got satisfied with living on the streets and showering in trash cans and uh, you know, roughing it. And for some reason, I got satisfied with that. And, I got my shot, jaw shattered. Someone from behind took a pole across my head, and I was like, "You're gonna, you're gonna end up getting killed. You're not gonna be, you're not gonna be around in a year or two. It wasn't until the city did the kind of outreach to certain people that were always in trouble, and finally they found me, and, and uh, they found me easier because I went, I chose to go into the bridge shelter. Now, and then eventually, I, I got chosen for this great apartment uh, here at Zephyr, and that's been a, just a dream to me. Very cool. Home sweet home. And thank God, uh, my servant in the Navy has gotten me this place. So happy here. This is my kitchen. I kind of did a uh, color thing. Just got a lot of the books out of this impacted color, so you can see. Very nice. Just a different. Uh, I, like, I like all the stuff you put up. Because it's all out. It's, uh, it was a... I cannot believe every day I wake up, you know, and I have my own place, cooking my eggs and hamburger this morning, um, showering, and, you know, actually took a bath of depth and salt this morning. A person of character lives with integrity is honest and reliable and loyal. Thank the city of San Diego for not uh, putting up with me on those years on the street. And, for all the homeless uh, outreaches that help, helped us while I was on the street and path and the bridge shelters were what they did for me, getting me uh, to the next level where I'm at now. Now I'm ready to, to take the next step, maybe uh, to, to go into peer counseling or, or help other people. Whatever God's got for me, I'm, I'm ready for it. Uh, such a great guy uh, and powerful emotion. You saw uh, the, the place that Zephyr, and I'll, I'll never forget the, the day that it, uh, I met Brian, I was because I was going out to the opening of Zephyr, and it was a, uh, it was a Motel 6 that we converted from uh, Motel 6 to uh, studio apartments for formerly homeless veterans. We have one of the largest veterans population in the country in San Diego. Darn proud of that. Um, and, I, and I vividly remember I'm waiting there, uh, start the you know, opening ceremony, all the type of things that mayors do. Um, and, he, uh, and I see him walking out before we start. And he make, he's making a beeline towards me. And he, and he comes up to me and he points at me and he says, he says, hey, you're the mayor, aren't you? I said, yeah, I am. He said, I just wanted to say thank you. 
I said, I appreciate that. Uh, I think this is going to be a great place. You know, we got a chance to tour it. It looks. He stops me. He says, No. He says, I want to say thank you for cleaning up the tents underneath the freeway. He said, I was one of the people living in those tents. Um, and as you can see there, um, you know, he got addicted to you know, substance abuse, methamphetamine, lost his job as a construction worker. But because we intervened, because we said it's not okay, we care about you, brother. You need to go to the bridge shelter. We're not going to let you sleep in a tent underneath our freeway underpasses in San Diego. Um, he did. He went to the veteran's shelter that we had set up, got himself clean and sober, and you can see that he's a peer counselor and really um, just phenomenal, great guy. But letting people like Brian stay in tents, doing heroin, meth, fentanyl, all of the other things, the associated violence that goes on, domestic abuse, that's not who we are. It's not who we are as Californians. It's not who we are as folks that really care. And that's why I think that that became so important to set up that bridge shelter network that says we have a place for you to go. And we're not going to let you kill yourself out here on the sidewalks. Um, and I felt very strongly about that, very passionately about that. And when people saw that that was beginning to work, when people saw that not only were people in the shelters, but they're getting the help and they're transitioning out to that apartment, that's why you saw those numbers go down. Um, still a lot of work to do. Do we still have homeless issues in San Diego while I was mayor? Of course we did. But we set up a system that says, here's what we're going to do um, to help you. And that's why it was so important to make that change, and that's why we did everything. Back to neighborhood uh, policing. Um, I was so proud of our uh, men and women officers because they get to know people on a first-name basis. And no, they don't have to be on the, the, the first stop. But I, I vividly remember what one of our uh, captains told me, he said, Mr. Mary says, he says, neighborhood policing doesn't have to be on the front lines, but we need to have a bottom line. And that's incredibly important when you come to the safety of your city and when you come to what you're going to accept and what you're not going to accept in terms of drug use and other things that are happening out on the streets. Um, it's not the thing that I believe that we should accept. Uh, and we took a stand against that. And it worked. Um, and the shelters and the network that had that um, really, again, we're at that beacon that said, hey, we have a place for you to go. Um, didn't allow tents on the sidewalk my last three years as mayor. That's how serious it was. Didn't do it. Said, because there's a place for you to go. You have to provide that place, right? Can't do that if you don't provide it. And so other cities are arguing about should we have a shelter or not. If you don't provide it, then you, can't, you shouldn't be doing anything. So back to that right to shelter obligation to use it, which I think is so uh, incredibly important. Just a few stats, and I'll pause here in a second. We'll do some uh, questions. Um, but again, everything that we tried to do was to say, treat people with dignity and respect. Give people options. Have standards and enforce those standards in your city. But all of the things that you saw from our parking, uh, safe parking lots, our storage centers, all the other things, that took a lot of investment. We spent money that was never on any line item budget <laughs> before, and it certainly wasn't there when I first started running for mayor. And we were up in Sacramento a lot. I know we had some, some of our legislators here trying to get the uh, then uh, Governor Brown, who you interviewed, uh, more involved. And I think we did a pretty decent job as mayors starting to set that tone that says the state of California has to be involved, has to do this. The problem is that big. There's a lot more that we need to do. Um, we had 3,000 people that we connected through apartments uh, during those uh, bridge shelters. Um, during the Clean San Diego efforts, I will, I will I'll kind of skip over that, but uh, it was a sustained effort in terms of the, how your city looks, how your city is uh, clean, how your neighborhoods and pride in that. I uh, spent a lot of that. It was 7,000 tons of trash were collected by the end of 2020. Um, and the fact that we had um, 3,000 people uh, during that time and then during Hep A, when we brought, excuse me, during COVID, when we opened up our convention center, uh, transferred folks into permanent supportive housing. That's what I'm talking about when we're talking about a, um, a system that says, I challenged all of our folks that said, when I walk into a bridge shelter, I want to be able to know that our providers know who every person is and what is preventing that one person from getting that apartment. What do we need to do? Why, why isn't that person in an apartment now? And when you look at it from that perspective, then you break it down because every, everybody's different, right? Nobody has the same needs. Everybody has a different story. But back to if you, if you don't talk about it in terms of numbers, you talk about it 
in terms of an individual, then you can connect people to the help and the support um, that they need that I think it makes it uh, very, very successful. Um, so let me just, uh, I'll shoot to the end here. Um, I don't know that we had all of the right solutions, but these are some of us, some of them that worked for us uh, in San Diego. Um, again, really set the tone that living on a sidewalk is not an acceptable option, and we need to provide help and support that gives you the ability not to do that. Um, you got to take pretty dramatic steps to build more housing. You cannot just say, no, I don't want it. NIMBYs are all over. I don't care what city you're in, right? Again, just like homeless services, everybody wants more housing. Just not right here. Right here. So you have to have those policies that actually do it to make it successful. Uh, and we passed that, by the way. We passed that, I think it was a unanimous vote on the city council. Um, and again, you treat people with dignity and respect because it's everybody's son and daughter. Um, you know, that everybody has a story just like, like Brian, right? Um, but at the same time, I think if you have that political will that says business as usual isn't getting it done, um, then you will get the public support to try some of the things that we try. You will get the support of individuals that are out there on the street who knows that there is help and support from them. Uh, then you will get the support from your community members, your small business owners, your neighborhood folks that say, hey, if this is an approach that you're taking and isn't working, I'll actually support it. I'll support another bridge shelter if I know you're serious about what the character of the community is going to look like and you're actually helping people. Um, so to me, that becomes really the, the ecosystem that you want, but most importantly, it provides results. Uh, and if you have that political will, if you're not afraid to let perfect be the enemy of the good, if you're not afraid to invest dollars, if you treat people, as I said, with dignity and respect, you're going to be able, the state is going to be able to make inroads uh, and actually make a difference. Uh, and at the end of the day, I think it's going to save people's lives. And that's what we're all here for. So thank you. I appreciate that. So it is now question time. Yeah, you can okay. and take a seat. Thank you. All right, I know that we have some, some folks in the audience who are, who are eager to ask questions. So I'll, right. I'll keep my questions short. Um, but I wanted to touch first on something you, you touched upon in your report about, you know, in your speech about, about Sacramento and having to have connections there. And in preparing for this, I was, um, you know, talking with Jalu, and there was a report from the California State Auditor's Office in 2020 detailing how disjointed the, the state's approach has been both to funding and coordinating efforts to reduce homelessness. For example, there are at least nine California agencies administering 41 programs targeting homelessness, which spent over $13 million between 2018 and 2020. So from your perspective and your time as mayor, like how, how do you think the state of California could better coordinate efforts and support cities in battling homelessness? Yeah, um, first and foremost, to say that there, the state has to fully admit that there's a proper role for the state to get involved, that it's not just the responsibility of the counties, or it's not just the responsibility of the cities, and it's not just from funding. Uh, there's so many things when it comes to, uh, you know, not just legislation or others, but the, the, the scope of the problem is so large, an individual city is not going to be able to, to handle I mean, we were fortunate. We had some of the resources because we're a large city in San Diego, right? Um, but in, if you, we have to change that ecosystem. And again, when we started, this is when we went and we were talking about when we went up as uh, mayors to Sacramento and Governor Brown at the time, it was the first time cities had even talked about requesting direct money to help with this. So the state needs to take a role. The state needs to put up shelters. The state needs to encourage housing. The state needs to change CEQA. The state needs to do all the things we talked about, about mental health, substance abuse, and others, and to say that it's real, it's a problem, they need to act like it. Amazing. Thank you for that. Um, another thing you touched on just then and before in your speech is this, this interconnected nature of you know, mental health, public health, and homelessness. This was obviously an issue when you were you know, battling the hepatitis A outbreak. Um, and you, you've mentioned some of your uh, work with mental health in the, in the transitional shelters. But I would love to hear f um, how you thought as mayor uh, about balancing you know, addressing multiple issues at the same time, getting people into the shelters while also getting them yeah. you know, the, the health care they need to address underlying issues, how you approach that. It is. And, and look, I think you hit the nail on the head. And, and if I looked, you know, I looked at the topics that you were talking about all day today. Um, 
it's, there's not, you know, there's not just one issue that we're dealing with when we're talking about homelessness. We're talking about economic issues. We're talking about mental health issues. Yes, we're talking about housing issues. We're talking about substance abuse issues. But what I do know, back to that crisis that is happening on the streets, if you allow folks to stay there, you're not going to resolve them. Not going to happen. You've got to get folks into a, a, a place where, they, where it's, like I said, it's clean, safe, sanitary, and an opportunity where you can provide that help and the support. That, and that people understand that it's going to be there. And when we first started with, uh, when we saw particularly on the, on the bridge shelters, we knew right away that we were going to have to have wraparound services. But I don't think I fully appreciated when we first started it how much the mental health factor was absolutely essential to being what we were going to be able to do. And when the county you know, came in and, and brought, not they started with just uh, some individuals on site, we eventually had uh, trailers for mental health for folks to come in uh, while they were there, so avoid some of the stigmas of you know what's happening because when somebody would see a mental health worker talking to somebody, um, it's it's not. I mean, it's all interconnected. Um, you have to have housing navigators on site. It's so hard to have a housing, uh, you know, to connect somebody to that apartment or their voucher if they're out on the street. They may be somewhere else. Two days later, a week later, how do you find folks? That was part of the problem. Everybody's, you know, Otter talks about using data. Crappy data. There's no, no data out there. We had to recreate it all when we got people into the, the bridge shelters. And then I insisted that all of our providers use the same database. Wow, crazy thought, right? Let's all talk to each other. Um, but, but again, back to how are we tracking when folks come in, how are we tracking how many folks we helped? Because i got to know if I'm spending all this money that it's actually working, right? I could be able to justify it because there's some folks that were like, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. There's too much money. I'm like, brother, we're trying to help people. And yeah, it's going to cost some money. But then I'd be able to, I better be able to say how we're helping people. Um, and so that's why, again, I'm a big, huge believer in you have to have all of those services on site. Amazing. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to ask one last question, and then we'll open it up to audience questions to make sure we get those in. Um, but I, we just came you know, before this from this, this fascinating session on policing. Yeah. I know in your efforts in San Diego that partnering with law enforcement was a critical part of, of making your strategy work. Um, and you know, training police, and the, you mentioned that the police were really excited to be part of this. So I'd love to just ask you about how, how do you think that other cities can, can learn from how San Diego partnered with law enforcement um, in their policies, and, and what do you see for the future of police in general? Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of cities have similar types of things, right? We had a homeless outreach team that had officers. As I said, we made a whole division out of neighborhood policing, and I think you know, every city probably has something to that effect. Um, but again, you have to be able to say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to be able to say, you have to have the shelter and the support but then you also have to be able to say, and it's not acceptable, we're not going to let you die out here on a tent, on our sidewalks. But if you don't have the shelter to begin with, you have no business doing the other part of it. Uh, I think that's just that's part of legal, right? That's part of the Boise decision and others. I don't know if you got into that today. But it's morally right. It's morally right, which is to say, we need a place for folks to go. Um, and it's got to be, again, something that is going to be, that's going to help folks. It's not the be-all, end-all. It's a bridge. But we need bridges. We need bridges to get you off the street uh, and into a place. And law enforcement, and to say, once folks know that, hey, no, we're, we're not going to allow uh, tents on sidewalks. We're not going to allow tents in the uh, canyons. A lot of canyons in San Diego, by the way. And um, I can't tell you how many fires and other things that were a part of that. And that's just, and, but, but again, back to who were some of the most victims of crime? Homeless individuals that were in these tent encampments. Domestic violence, all the other things, you know, drug abuse, others. So that's not, I think, something that anybody wants to see. Um, but again, if you if you approach it from a standpoint that says we're here to help, um, and we're and we mean it, uh, then I think you you see the uh, you see community support and you see public support. And by the way, this is not a partisan issue, right? This is not Republican or Democrat or independent. This is, in my view, what is the right thing that we should be doing to help people. What is the human thing that we should be doing to help people? But also, but, but get results. And if you don't have standards, if you don't have consequences, 
you're not going to get the results. And you're going to spend a whole bunch of money on stuff, and it ain't going to change. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, I guess now we have some time for some audience questions. I don't know if I'm supposed to be the one uh, picking these. All right. All right, start. you're the first hand I saw up. Oh, no, so sorry, you can oh, go okay. first. <laughs> Is this hot? Okay. Uh, proud Torero, first and foremost, USD grad, oh, San Diego. Nice. I'm an, I'm an, I'm an um, working, working in homelessness <laughs> up here in the Bay Area now for yeah. quite a long time. Um, the question I always come up um, when I'm having conversations with folks is we can pretty much figure out what it's costing us per person to work on this issue over some set period of time. We can calculate that. We yep. can make an investment. We can calculate that. Uh, what I find is very compelling is being able to also articulate what is the cost of leaving someone unsheltered. Yeah. So for, per community, per municipality. Having that calculation, I know it's probably not a standard thing that communities can calculate, but were you able to calculate that and make a compelling argument? We did. Um, we saw how many uh, calls officers are having to use over and over to uh, individuals that unfortunately require calls constantly. Um, again, part of the reason why um, you, know, you, you need to have all of those services at, at the shelter uh, and have a place for folks to go. If you don't have that, you're going to send your paramedics out over and over again. You're going to send your officers out over and over again. Uh, that's not efficient. You're going to be wasting money. Uh, you're not going to be able to do uh, you know, crime that you should be doing uh, as opposed to, again, that, that front line of response. So yeah, it, and not to mention, um, if you don't have a place and you don't have shelter, people are going to die on your sidewalks. Was over, it was over $85,000 a year for the most chronically homeless person to be left yeah. unsheltered. Sounds about right, unfortunately. Thanks. Um, thank you so much for meeting with us today, sir. And um, <clears throat> uh, sorry to ask, I want to ask like two difficult questions. Uh, the first one is, when you started implementing this, what was a big obstacle? Apart from like the not in my backyard and, and all of that, yeah. something of implementation. And also, what's one thing you regret with the program? What's one thing you wish you would have done differently or better? I would have moved faster. I was, you know, I tried to say at the beginning, you know, we had 10 encampments, we had other stuff, and we were in this, who's, you know, whose responsibility is, you know, the county should be doing mental health, everybody should, you know, who's, you know, who's, who's the homeless department? Who would I go see about that? It's no homeless department, man. <laughs> it wasn't in the city, it wasn't in the county, it wasn't in the state. It wasn't. So you got to make some of the stuff, you know, as you go. Um, and then, so that was the first part of your question. The, what, was the, what was the second part? I'm sorry. I'm getting old. Um, yeah, the obstacles. Uh, NIMBYs was a big one. Um, and it was uh, unproven. I don't know that this is going to work, right? Um, and this doesn't seem like the right thing to do. I'm like, it may not work, but we're going to do something. It may not work. Uh, and and I, I remember talking to a group. I said, if it doesn't work, we'll take the bridge shelter down, right? Uh, it worked. Uh, was I sure? Was, was I certain it was going to work to the extent that it did? No. Uh, you have to have great providers helping in there. You have to have, you know, again, back to political will that says this is, this is how it is. I think one of the things that, um, because we went through what we were doing at San Diego County at the time, the public bought into, we need to do something different. But I also think that, I don't care what city you're in right now in California, and it's all relative, right, the size of your homeless population, but whether you're in Bakersfield, Fresno, Sacramento, you know, uh, Menlo Park, uh, you know, you name it, San Francisco, LA, people know we gotta do something. And again, back to it's the issue, why we're here, uh, this afternoon and all day because people know the status quo isn't working. All right, I think we have uh, time for one more question, I've been told. And put your hand up in the back. Hi, hi Kevin. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I know um, you were pretty successful at implementing a lot of pro-housing policies in San Diego during yep. your time, um, like you hinted at, com complete communities. And I know like there's an ADU bonus and um, the, there is. the parking um, 
by transit, I'm pretty sure y'all have eliminated parking minimums. Um, You've and, done your homework, very good. And, yes. and, and now we have SB9 by Tony Atkins, also from San Diego. So I'm just wondering what's next for the San Diego region when it comes to uh, supply side housing. Um, I, uh, I know you hinted at CEQA, and I also was wondering if you could maybe speak a little on Sandag's role. Um, I watch KUS KUSI news a lot, and I know there's kind of a kerfuffle, a regional um, conversation happening about Sandag and You're its government. You're going deep today. So. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, guys, that's this it. guy's Thanks. in the weeds in one minute before 8 o'clock. Uh, that's what you got to do. I like your style, brother. Um, I will just say on the housing policies, yeah, and again, back to doing things differently. Um, if you would have told me that when I ran for mayor that I was going to eliminate parking requirements for new apartments, and be like, what? Let the market decide. You can take off the $80,000 of the cost of a unit. You don't allow parking. Now, it's not going to work everywhere, but if we're in a big city, it could work close to your transit zone. Let, them, let the market decide. And so, again, putting that, trying to think differently, and again, back to density, uh, what we did on complete communities is allow you to come and build a project because we've already did the sequel, we already did the environmental impact report citywide, right? So let's have that argument about where we want density and where we don't. But when we decide where we want it, let's make it easy so you can actually come in and build it, man. So you can come in and build it and actually get people housed. And so the problem that you see on CEQA, we had to do a citywide EIR, and that took us a year and a half, two years. You shouldn't have to wait two years to do something like that. You should be able to say, if this is a project, we need to do something, and particularly in our urban cities, it's a little bit different on environmental issues than you're talking about in other parts of the state. So I think we have to recognize that. I think a lot of people do recognize that, but folks in the legislature haven't had the political will to change that yet. Um, and so that's a in the 30 seconds that I have left. <laughs> um, it, 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 again, it's about trying to, we did the ADUs, the accessory dwelling units, allowed you to build that. Um, and so again, it's trying to be like smart about, yeah, we need more supply in California. We need more supply. But I don't, I don't the government doesn't build housing, right? The private sector does. But we better ought to have those policies and those rules and the regulations that allows you to actually come in and do it. Uh, and then when we do that, I think you'll see that it's, it's already working in San Diego. And so, you know, it's only been in place now for, you know, a year and a half. So, you know, ask, ask me that question in another five years, and hopefully we're going to really be able to point to kind of the before uh, and, and some of the after. So thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Mayor Falconer, to Olivia Martin uh, for a great conclusion to our day. Um, and I encourage all of you to stick around. We're going to have coffee. You can hang out. But I just also encourage all of you to think about, like, how can today be more than, like, going to the movies? <laughs> you know, we, like, enjoyed. We learned something. It was interesting. But if you have ideas for how anything, any connection you made today, something that we can move the needle on this challenging issue, we're all ears at CEPR. So we welcome your suggestions, your, like, connections, anything because I think it's an important social problem, and I think we at CEPR are eager to help in any way we can. We are incredibly grateful to all of the people who spoke and moderated today for sharing their time and their expertise, um, and to all of you for engaging with us. So just any time, just feel free to reach out to us. We're here, we're not going anywhere. Um, and I also just want to do a few quick thank yous. First, I would like to once again thank Jalu for building to the stage today. Great work. I would like to thank the phenomenal events team at CEPR, Tiffany, uh, I, like so many people. I, I'm gonna, if I try to name everyone, I'm going to forget someone. So just thank you to all the events and everyone who pitched in today to make this a great day. Thanks to the sound team, the video team, the food, the people who have served us food all day for just everything was spectacular. And for us, I mean, this... This was our first in-person event in a heck of a long time, and I just, I'm so glad that we did it, and so, uh, and I hope to see every one of you again really, really soon. So with that, have a good evening, and feel free to stick around for a while. Thank you, guys. I gotta run, pick up my daughter. <laughs> see, it's so great. Yeah, I'm picking her up.